the story behind the headlines, presented by the American Historical Association in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company, with Caesar Searchinger. Each week, Mr. Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and author, discusses a dominant news event and sketches the historical background leading up to it. You'll be interested to learn that printed copies of these talks are available in bulletin form issued by the Columbia University Press at 10 cents each. One dollar for the first 13 issues, two dollars for the first 26. Simply address the story behind the headlines, NBC Radio City, New York. This evening's subject is Appeasement Marches On. We present Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. The British government has decided to recognize Franco in Spain. A French mission to negotiate terms of recognition also arrived in Burgos today. Other significant moves in Paris and Madrid foreshadow an early negotiated peace. Such a peace would mean more than the end of the Spanish Civil War. It would mean an important step in the policy of appeasement started by Premier Chamberlain a year ago. Milestones of that policy thus far are the Anglo-Italian Agreement, the Munich Pact, the Franco-German Good Neighbor Pact. A further objective is Franco-Italian Accord, and a preliminary to that is peace in Spain. The road thus far has not been smooth. The journey has been punctuated by raucous cries and violent acts. Alongside it, we see an, ar an armaments race, more menacing than anything the world has ever seen. What then, you may ask, is the good of appeasement, and what's behind it all? The root of much of Europe's trouble lay in the late unification of two great nations, Germany and Italy. England and France, the other two great Western countries, achieved unity back in the Middle Ages. Their strongly centralized governments fostered discovery, adventure, overseas conquest, while Germany and Italy, consisting of a litter of petty dynasties, were still torn by internal strife. Thus, England and France were collecting colonial empires while the German and Italian states were preying on each other, right down to the 19th century. England acquired North America, India, Australia. France, too, occupied parts of America, the West Indies, Indochina, and many island possessions. And when they lost their most valuable American colonies, both of these countries recouped themselves in the newly explored dark continent, Africa. So the colonization of Africa in the 19th century became, to a large extent, a race between Britain and France. France, starting from the northwest, England, starting from Egypt in the northeast, eventually met in the Sudan. When they faced each other at Fashoda in 1898, history for a moment hung in the balance. But war was avoided. By this time, almost all of northern Africa was in the hands of those two countries. Only Morocco in the north and Abyssinia in the east were still independent. Italy had been given two narrow slices of coastland bordering on Abyssinia, Eritrea and Somaliland. Now, Germany and Italy became unified nations in 1870 and 71. The force that united them was nationalism. But once united, they, like the other nations, had to expand. There was a new excuse for expansion, for imperialism, in the 19th century. Europe's populations multiplied as never before. The industrial system created a mass demand for raw materials and expanding markets for manufactured goods. But there were no good colonies left for Germany and Italy when they were ready to expand. It didn't worry Germany much, at least not her chancellor, Bismarck, who had recently taken Alsace-Lorraine from France. Bismarck didn't really believe in overseas colonies for Germany, and if he did take some pretty large but not very rich slices of Central Africa, it was with the idea of trading them in rather than establishing an African empire. Bismarck's Germany was a satisfied country, but sooner or later it was bound to burst its confines by dint of sheer energy. It was the pan-Germans of Bismarck's time, you know, who revived the idea of the historic push to the east. Italy had historic aspirations, too, but hers lay in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean coast had been the heart of the Roman Empire, and the Mediterranean Sea was the Mara Nostrum, our sea, to nationalistic Italians from the start. From the very start, United Italy coveted Tunisia, which lay just opposite her southern coast. 
but she was balked by the French, already in safe possession of neighboring Algeria, who had their own eyes on the old Muslim pirate states to the east. Finally, in fact, wherever Italy turned in Africa, she was balked by France. Finally, in 1881, France took Tunisia from under Italy's very nose, establishing a protectorate with the previous connivance of Britain and Germany. Yes, Germany. For Bismarck thought he would appease France after her loss of Alsace-Lorraine and so stop her thinking about getting it back. I'm using the word appease in the Chamberlainian sense. France's action drove Italy into the triple alliance with Germany and Austria, which is just what Bismarck wanted. Her greatest humiliation came in 1896, when she first tried to conquer Abyssinia and was defeated at Adowa thanks to France's secret help to the Abyssinians. To appease Italy, Britain and France permitted her to take Libya from the Turks. Libya is a large piece of desert between Tunisia and the west on the west and Egypt on the east. And it hasn't been much use to Italy except the place to keep some troops. Nevertheless, Italy was eventually weaned from the Triple Alliance and being promised additional territory, she joined the Allies in the World War. When these promises were not fulfilled at Versailles, Italy returned to her anti-French policy, which Mussolini has been pursuing with such gusto to this day. When finally she did conquer Abyssinia, it was in despite of Britain and France, and with the friendly, though passive, aid of Nazi Germany, as Hitler was careful to remind the Duce in his speech the other day. For the second time, Italy had been driven into the arms of Germany, over Africa again, and appeasement was overdue when Mr. Chamberlain came along. Now let's examine the case of Germany. Bismarck's continental policy had given way to the Kaiser's Weltpolitik, which meant colonial expansion and a big navy, which eventually drove Britain into the Entente with France. Wilhelm was out not only for a place in the sun, but raw materials and world markets for Germany's prodigious industries. Good additional colonies could only be had at the expense of Britain and France. The only place in Africa not yet taken was Morocco, just to the west of Algeria. France, in possession of Algeria, wasn't any more eager to see Germany in Morocco than she was to see Italy in Tunisia. But Germany claimed to have interests, and suddenly the Kaiser made a dramatic personal appearance there. There followed much saber rattling and years of bickering. In 1911, Germany and France were on the verge of war, but Britain supported her Entente partner, and France eventually got Morocco, with a small bit going to Spain. So Britain and France had balked Germany in her colonial aims, just as France had balked Italy in hers. Blocked in the colonial sphere, blocked by Russia in the east, blocked by Britain and Russia in her great Berlin to Baghdad scheme to the southeast, Germany had no place to go. Britain found no way to appease her, and that, in the last analysis, is the reason why the Kaiser went to war. Now let's see what happened after the war. After 14 years of helplessness, when she was ringed about by France's system of alliances, Germany revived with Hitler's rise to power, as Italy had already done under Mussolini. Italy once again voiced her old aspirations. Germany rudely demanded her rights. This time, Britain was determined not to repeat the pre-war mistake, as she thought. To avoid war, the dictators had to be appeased, that is, satisfied at someone else's expense. Now, having temporarily appeased Mussolini by blessing his Ethiopian conquest, Chamberlain secured his guarantee of the Mediterranean status quo. And, having appeased Hitler at the expense of Czechoslovakia, he secured at least temporary peace in the West. If Hitler should be in earnest about one of the colonies, too, well, he could probably be appeased again with bits of Romania, Hungary, Poland, or what have you. Hasn't he said that uh, Germany would expand to the east? That's where England and France have given him a free hand. The important thing was to keep him off colonies, for most of Germany's colonies are now in Britain's hands. The real difficulty, however, is how to appease Mussolini, that is, permanently. When Hitler, with Hitler, you don't know whom the lightning might strike next, but with Mussolini, it's always France. He can't be appeased by proxy, but only at the expense of France. And France has no more intention of yielding Tunisia than England has of yielding Kenya. 
of all the things in the Italian theme song, the one only thing worth fighting for is Tunisia. Actually, they have been fighting for it in Spain. That's where the importance of this Spanish peace comes in. Unless Mussolini can get the kind of peace he wants, his chance of getting anything out of France are slim. Mussolini has been remarkably silent of late. Might this silence be due to the recent backstage moves in Spain? It's a little early to prophesy, but it does seem now that the new Spain is not going to be an Italian Spain. In order to secure British and French recognition, General Franco has already had to do two things. He has had to permit French officers to examine the Pyrenees on the Spanish side of the frontier to see that there are no fortifications or military establishments from which Franco's allies might threaten France. And he has had to promise that the fortified island of Minorca, held till last week by the Loyalists, would not be occupied by anybody but genuine Spaniards. To make sure of this, the British cruiser Devonshire took Franco's representatives to the island, negotiated a peaceful transfer, and took the Loyalist commanders away to safety. The only shots fired in this encounter were fired by Italian airmen from the neighboring island of Mallorca, evidently to express the Duchess's disagreement with this surprising move. Minorca, you'll remember, is that very important island, the only fortified point in the Balearics, which lies dead on the route over which France transports its colonial troops and merchandise. France, then, seems not to be threatened either from land or sea, and the much-feared squeeze play of the dictators against the next prospect for a shakedown appears to be off for the time. Not Mussolini, but Franco, it seems, is being appeased, and the methods of appeasement are already drawing the fire of the Italian press. Meantime, Italian troops and German engineers are still in Spain, a problem which may remain to plague both Franco and his newfound friends. On the other hand, large numbers of Italian troops are pouring into Libya and massing close to the border of Tunisia. The meaning of that maneuver seems clear enough, but can Mussolini expect it to succeed? There are indeed vague rumors of something much bigger in the wind, something involving action by all the Axis powers, Italy, Germany, and Japan, another late arrival on the scene of history. Italy mobilizing in the Mediterranean, Germany again assembling its mammoth army as it did last fall, and Japan massing vast numbers of troops on the Siberian border, 600,000 to date, according to one report. Japan, moreover, has occupied the very important Chinese island of Hainan, close to French Indochina. Are all these things part of a vast aggressive project of which the Spanish-French sector is but a detail? Are the Axis powers really getting ready to force a showdown, to challenge the democracies now before the armament race has gone too far? In other words, has appeasement really been a failure? Well, we shall soon see. Unless unexpected events intervene, I shall try, next Friday, to explain some aspects of the situation which directly concern ourselves. Now, I'd like you to write to me sometimes about these talks, as many of you do. But if you do write, don't send any money to me. The money for the copies is sent somewhere else, as you will be told presently. Good night, everybody. Printed copies of this and last week's talk on American foreign policy are available at 10 cents each. Each week, these bulletins contain as well a list of books on the subject of the talk. Caesar Searchinger will be with you again next Friday at this time when he expects to discuss our interests in the Pacific. The program presented by the American Historical Association is an NBC public service feature. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company presents a special bulletin from the Press Radio Bureau. Washington. President Roosevelt appealed to the people of America tonight to support their community chests and other local charities. He pointed out that government assistance to the needy has not removed or even diminished the need for private charity. The address opens the 1938 mobilization for human needs. Mr. Roosevelt told the American people that they have always been generous. That generosity has never failed, he said, and please God, it never will. 
He declared that private generosity is not contradictory in principle to government efforts toward relief. This bulletin is from the Press Radio Bureau. Further details will be found in your newspaper. The story behind the headline, presented by the American Historical Association in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company with Cesar Sechinger. Each week, Mr. Sechinger, noted foreign correspondent, radio commentator, and author, discusses dominant news events either in our own country or abroad and sketches the historical background leading up to it. This evening, Mr. Sechinger's subject is minorities and the threat to world peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Cesar Sechinger brings you the story behind the headlines. Good evening, everybody. Germans occupy Fifth Sudeten Zone. Poles rush troops to Czech city. Hungarians mobilize against Czechs. To read the headlines of the past week that have to do with the aftermath of the world crisis, you would think that the so-called Peace of Munich had become a central European free-for-all, with troops rushing in on Czechoslovakia from all sides, tearing the body of the last mid-European republic limb from limb. Well, it isn't quite as bad as that for the Rump Republic is going to be allowed to live. But what is happening to Czechoslovakia has shocked our consciences as no other event in living memory. Considering that, after all, almost no blood has been shed, while sanguinary struggles are going on in other parts of the world, we may well stop to ask what it is that puts the crisis of Czechoslovakia above all the other current crises in our minds. The difference is that these other human tragedies are due to mass violence, to the lawlessness and mechanized barbarism that we have come to accept as the inevitable consequence of war. This European tragedy is due to acts committed in the name of justice, legalized and sanctioned by the great powers, accepted by the world as the only alternative to a holocaust such as civilized mankind might not survive. At the same time, we must not forget that there was a basis of justice in the complaints of the Sudeten Germans. But the realization that the Sudetans are, or were, only one of a number of so-called national minorities in Europe may well make us shudder at the prospect of further readjustments under the slogan of national or racial self-determination. Most of us, I am sure, had not even heard of the Sudeten Germans until last spring although they and their ancestors have been settled in their valleys for four or five hundred years. And most of us still don't know about the Germans in Hungary, the Transylvanian Germans in Romania, the Silesian Germans in Poland, the Baltic Germans in Lithuania, the Tyrolean Germans in Italy, and the odd patches of Germans in Yugoslavia, and even Soviet Russia, where over half a million of them constitute the German Volga Republic. Nor did many of us know about the four million Ruthenians in Poland, the million and a half Hungarians in Romania, the half a million Yugoslavians in Italy, and the Macedonians in Bulgaria, all good sizable minorities. And those of us who did know about them were only too willing to let sleeping dogs lie until this Czech crisis pulled us all up sharp. The plain fact is that while there were some 60 million people in the various minority groups of pre-war Europe, the peace settlement took care of only about half of them, so that after 1919, there were 30 millions left. This isn't strictly accurate, of course, for some of the post-war minorities were created by the Peace of Paris, having been detached from their own countries in the process of eliminating other minorities. For instance, take the Sudeten Germans. They were just German Bohemians in the old Austrian Empire and part of the ruling German group. The Czechs and Slovaks, on the other hand, were minorities and were treated as such. So after being bottom dog for centuries, they became top dog after the war, and the Germans living inside the historic frontiers of Bohemia became the bottom dog. So you see, these attempts at adjustment are apt to reverse the problem instead of solving it. In way, one way or another, then, we had roughly 30 million minority population in Europe at the end of the war. The carving up of Czechoslovakia will dispose of, let's say, four and a quarter million. But from that, you must deduct the three-quarter million or so Czechs and Slovaks living in the ceded districts. So the total minorities population in Europe is reduced by three and a half million net, leaving some 26 and a half million still living under what they consider foreign domination. 
Now, it is true that most of these minorities have not been shouting for help, at least not very loudly. But you see how once somebody begins to shout, the desire becomes contagious. The real reason why we haven't heard any but the Sudetans lately is that they aren't all so lucky as to have a big brother nearby. Or if they have, the big brother isn't usually as big and powerful as the bad uncle under whose roof they live. For instance, there are nearly a million Poles left in post-war Germany. But however badly they might be treated, we are not likely to hear Marshal Snigley Ridge of Poland clamoring for their release. On the other hand, Poland itself harbors the largest single minority in Europe, namely the Ruthenians. Most of these live in the Ukraine, a country formerly belonging to Russia, and now divided between Soviet Russia and Poland. What is to stop Mr. Stalin from one day espousing the cause of these little Russians and of the one and a half million white Russians in Poland, if and when he feels himself strong enough to do so? Here then, is a potential threat to the European peace, all the more so since Mr. Hitler has been credited with having an eye on the Russian part of the Ukraine further south. But more recently, Mr. Hitler has assured Mr. Chamberlain that the Sudeten conquest satisfies all his territorial ambitions in Europe. That would mean that the 500,000 Germans in Hungary, the 750,000 Germans in Romania, the 500,000 Germans in Yugoslavia, the 250,000 Tyrolians in Italy, not to mention the million Germans in Poland, have just got to accept their fate. Three million Germans resigned to being ruled by Slavs, Magyars, Italians, and Romanians? Well, maybe. But is it likely that the million and a half Hungarians in Romania, most of them living in a fairly solid block adjacent to a fairly solid block of Germans, will be satisfied to stay outside Hungary now that most of their compatriots in Czechoslovakia are to be reunited with the motherland? And is it entirely out of the range of possibilities that in a future drive for frontier revision, Hungary will be supported by Germany? Now, whatever the economic plums that go with the recapture of national minorities, and however insincere some governments may be in exploiting the woes of minorities in weaker neighboring states, we have to admit that the existence of these minorities is the immediate cause of the conflict. It is well, therefore, for us to be familiar with the whys and wherefores of these minorities in order that we may know how to judge the merits of the case before the crisis is upon us. Fifteen hundred years ago, Europe was inhabited by semi-barbaric tribes looking for habitable, fertile lands. The great movement was from east to west, and each tribe or racial group, as it settled in Europe, felt the pressure of new hordes coming out of Asia in its rear. Celts, Teutons, Slavs moved across the continent in great waves, pressing upon each other and upon the vestiges of Roman civilization in the west and south. Out of the impact of these forces came the continuous struggles between nations. Struggles about land, minerals, necessities of life, struggles about differences of religion, struggles about channels of trade, and about the dynastic ambitions of princes. In the west of Europe, it happened that power soon became centralized resulting in fairly large national units like France and Spain. But Central Europe was divided into many smaller units, constantly changing their allegiance and constantly engaged in warfare. The so-called Holy Roman Empire of the German nation was for centuries only a loose federation with divided loyalties between the church and the temporal princes. Yet it was successful in pushing back the Slavic, Magyar and Muslim tithes from the east. It not only warded off attacks, but absorbed some of the foreign elements. And so, the Slavic Kingdom of Bohemia and the Magyar Kingdom of Hungary, for instance, finally became dynastic possessions of the Habsburgs. In this constant struggle, races overlapped. Frontiers took little account of race or speech. The concept of nationality was less important in a feudal Europe than the claims of kings and dukes and lesser warlords. Not till the close of the 18th century or near the close of the 18th century, did the fortunes of peoples as such play any role. Map-making was merely the expression of dynastic interests. But the French Revolution brought the rights of nations to the fore. The idea that populations and peoples could be bartered back and forth by rulers went out of fashion. Even Napoleon claimed to make his conquests as a liberator. 
So in the 19th century, there was a transition from dynastic to nationalistic conflict. Nationalism, fostered by general education and the spread of democracy, grew in intensity and reached its climax before the outbreak of the World War. It was then that the word minorities became an important political term. Austro-Hungary was the classic minority state, a mosaic of nationalities. The immediate cause of the World War was nationalistic agitation, culminating, as you remember, in the murder of the Austrian crown prince. The World War, ostensibly at any rate, was fought on the issue of national liberty, and in the Peace of Paris, the statesmen did undertake to remedy the minority situation. But it was obvious that absolute self-determination would result in confusion. No territorial adjustment could untangle the intricate skein created by centuries of racial drifts. So while some injustices were eliminated, new ones were inevitably created. And the racial map of Central Europe is still pockmarked with hundreds of multicolored spots. Nothing is more likely, said Woodrow Wilson at the Peace Conference, to disturb the peace of the world than the treatment which might in certain circumstances be meted out to minorities. To forestall such treatment, the Allies and the League came to special minorities treaties or agreements with all the newly created or aggrandized countries and charged the League of Nations with the job of seeing that the provisions were carried out. They comprise equality before the law, of civil and political rights, in business and education, and freedom of worship. There have been frequent complaints of the violations of these guarantees, but the League has generally only sought to point the way to conciliation. There is reason to believe that, to, that this procedure would have worked in the case of Czechoslovakia had Germany been a member of the League and concerned only about the Sudeten Germans and not the territory they occupy. As for the small and scattered minorities, excepting the Jews, of course, whose problem is the most tragically difficult of all, most of them are probably quite happy where they are. The example of Switzerland, with three distinct racial and linguistic groups, proves that with equal rights, contrasting races can live together in harmony. The enforcement of equal rights everywhere would therefore seem to be a major task of European statesmanship. Trouble over a single three million minority brought Europe to the brink of war. Wherever there are grievances, real or fancied, they had better be dealt with before it is too late. Good night. Copies of these talks, the story behind the headlines by Caesar Searchinger, are available in printed form. They are issued by the Columbia University Press in the form of a bulletin which includes additional material and bibliography. They may be had for 10 cents apiece or one dollar for the first 13 issues by addressing the story behind the headlines, NBC, Radio City. This program presented by the American Historical Association is an NBC educational feature. Next, the story behind the headlines, presented by the American Historical Association in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company with Caesar Searchinger. Each week, Mr. Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent, radio commentator and author, discusses dominant news events either in our own country or abroad and sketches the historical background leading up to them. This evening, Mr. Searchinger's subject is Great Britain and the Four Power Pact. Ladies and gentlemen, Caesar Searchinger brings you the story behind the headlines. Good evening, everybody. Last March, in the first talk of this series, I had occasion to speak of British foreign policy. The big headline during that week was Anthony Eden resigns as foreign secretary. And when we reflect that that was less than eight months ago, we see how fast and how furiously history is being made today. Britain girds for future crises is a typical headline these days. The resignation of Eden marked the end of the League of Nations system of collective security in Europe and the beginning of what may be called the Chamberlain system of direct negotiation, which was to mean sitting down to talk Turkey to the dictators instead of making faces at them from behind a barrage of high principles. This system eventually led, quite logically, to the conferences of Berchtesgaden, Godesberg, and Munich. I try to point out in this earlier talk that Chamberlain, while breaking with recent practice, was not breaking with British tradition or long-range policy chiefly concerned with the security of Great Britain and the Empire, that policy was to keep the peace in Europe 
by means of a balance of power, seeing to it that the Low Countries, Holland and Belgium, never fell into dangerous hands, and naval supremacy assuring the command of the seas. Now, when I come to look back at recent happenings, I must say that he hasn't really departed from that policy during the critical weeks. Before we talk about the present, about the new Europe arising out of the four-power pact, let's trace that policy to its source. Let's consider Britain in its essential historical aspects, as the center of world empire, as the center of a system of world trade, and, incidentally, as the champion of democratic government. It's the story of a small island people living on the edge of, and happily detached from, a large continent which has been the storm center of most of the great world conflicts for over a thousand years. Facing the sea, looking out upon the wide world in its search for wealth, it has managed to keep that cockpit in its rear from interfering, while it united the sixth of the globe under one flag and seized the lion's share of the world's trade. Yet, in the 19th century, Britain's trade, though secured by her navy, was free, open to all who would take advantage of it. That was one of the important things about the so-called Pax Britannica, the peace which brought prosperity both to Europe and the Anglo-Saxon world. And the other was the famous balance of power, which goes back to the days of Cardinal Wolsey, the butcher's son who became Henry VIII's chief minister. England was a weak country then, of little importance to Europe. Wolsey's idea was to prevent any power in Europe from becoming overwhelmingly strong by creating two roughly even groups and to throw England's weight from one to the other, never allowing either of them to count on her constant support. During the next 200 years, three European powers, one after the other, seemed to be aiming at what the English called universal dominion, or world mastery. The Spanish, the Dutch, and the French. When Spain, united with the Habsburg Empire, mastered the continent, Wolsey gravitated towards France, hitherto the traditional enemy. And you all know what happened to the Spanish Armada in 1588. When Spain had been conquered and the East Indian trade opened to Englishmen, England fought the Dutch three times in the course of the 17th century. And when the Dutch ceased to seem great rivals and the colossal power of France threatened English security and English markets, England fought France in seven separate wars from 1689 to 1815. From the 17th century on, England joined one coalition after another for that purpose, such as the Triple Alliance and the Grand Alliance, to curb the aggression of Louis XIV, whose scheme to combine France and Spain under one royal house would have directly threatened an invasion of England from the Spanish Netherlands. John Churchill, by the way, Duke of Marlborough, was the hero of that fight to curb Louis, and it's a descendant of his, Winston Churchill, who is now saying that Hitler is just another Louis XIV aiming at world dominion, and that just as England had then to get rid of a pro-French king, James II, so she must now get rid of her pro-German ministers. Throughout the whole 18th century, except a few years after the Peace of Utrecht, England and France were deadly rivals. Towards the end of the century, French revolutionary armies went on the rampage, supported by an ideology as repugnant to Englishmen then as Adolf Hitler's is today. Pretty soon, that great totalitarian Napoleon Bonaparte swept like a hurricane over Europe, completely destroying the balance of power, breaking international treaties, and directly challenging England's safety. Of the four coalitions against Napoleon, England was the chief instigator and always his most feared enemy. When Napoleon was broken by Nelson's victories at Trafalgar and elsewhere, and by the last great continental coalition against him, England emerged with Holland and Belgium, a single independent nation, and with additional colonial gains. For though she had lost America, her second empire was already being built up, thanks to the audacity of British traders and trading companies in India and Africa. Her Mediterranean domination, begun with the acquisition of Gibraltar and Minorca in 1713, became complete with Disraeli's purchase of the Suez shares in 1875 and the lifeline of the empire. By now, Great Britain had become an industrial nation. She was now dependent on her overseas trade, not only for her wealth, but for her subsistence. From a small farming nation of six million people at the beginning of the 18th century, she'd grown to be a country of some 25 millions, largely urbanized, when Queen Victoria's Prime Minister brought back peace with honor 
from the Congress of Berlin. A peace that kept affairs quiet in Europe's trouble house, the Balkans, for just 20 years. Whether Mr. Chamberlain's peace with honor, with its implications for the future of the Balkans, will serve equally well is for posterity to decide. Throughout the 19th century, Britain did not intervene by force of arms on the continent, except for the Crimean War, whipped up by British jingoes against the supposedly threatening power of Russia. Most historians would admit nowadays that it was a mistake to keep Russia from having an outlet to the sea. Would it be a similar mistake, perhaps, to keep Germany from expanding now? But there were two other powerful forces working in 19th century Europe. The English people's sympathies were deeply engaged, and these in them, and these were the rising forces of nationalism and democracy. Whatever their material interests, Englishmen could always be enlisted to support nationalist aspirations of peoples and struggles for a more liberal form of government. England's imperial policy might call for the maintenance of Turkey, but Gladstone could arouse the indignation of the whole nation by his exposure of the despotic atrocities of the unspeakable Turk. And by the way, a recent echo of Gladstone's eloquence was Austin Chamberlain's phrase about the unspeakable Nazi dictatorship. But just as Disraeli went to talk things over with Bismarck and the Turks in Berlin, so Chamberlain's brother Neville decided to talk things over at Munich rather than fight. Failure at Berlin would have meant a European war against Russia and her allies. Failure at Munich might have meant a world war against Germany and her allies. Failure in either place would have meant a deflection of policy from Britain's principal aims, as a trading nation, the maintenance of peace, as an imperial nation, the, nation, the safety of her empire. In fulfilling these two necessities, Mr. Chamberlain may be said to have subordinated England's traditional championship of democracy and the small nations. Many people in England, as elsewhere, are saying that the present situation resembles that which faced England in the times of Louis XIV and Napoleon, and that he should have fought rather than make terms. Who is right? Controversy is rife, too, on the question of who betrayed Czechoslovakia, England or France, or both. All we can say by consulting history is that war, in the circumstances, would not have been in the line of British policy. Britain doesn't fight on the continent for political principles alone. She has fought when the dominant power in Europe became too strong for safety, and she has fought for the aggrandizement and safety of her empire overseas. The first question, then, is, has Hitler become too strong? The second, how would the empire have fared in case of war? Let's compare the present with the situation in 1914. The ideal cause, then, was the saving of little Belgium, just as the ideal cause at this time would have been the saving of little Czechoslovakia. But in 1914, besides saving Belgium, Britain was destroying a dangerous competitor in the capital markets of the world. Today, Germany is financially weak. In 1914, Britain was despoiling a colonial power. Today, Germany has nothing worth taking. In 1914, Britain was fighting her only serious rival at sea, a rival who refused to sign a naval pact. Today, Britain has her Anglo-German naval pact. By giving way to Hitler in Czechoslovakia, Chamberlain was giving him free access to the Balkans, a free hand in building up his economic empire in the southeast. Well, England has long been in favor of a single strong power in the Balkans, and this will help to satisfy Hitler's need for raw materials and his quest for new markets, thus easing his competition with the Western countries overseas. Why, even this week, Mr. Walter Funk, Hitler's Minister of Economy, outlined a plan for developing these resources in accordance with German requirements in exchange for the manufactured goods with which the 60 million inhabitants of the Balkans can be made to absorb. Germany will give them capital goods, things like railways and equipment for the army, etc. True, this all will make Germany commercially strong, but not at Britain's expense. Now, as regards the empire, Britain has everything to lose, even by a victorious war. Never has her far-flung empire been so vulnerable as it is today. Germany and Italy are both astride the Mediterranean lifeline. Italy, in case of war, would go for Palestine, with the help of the Arabs, and for Egypt. And Japan would threaten her Far Eastern possessions. And the crux of the whole matter is that the British Navy, which has for two and a half centuries kept the empire together, may be reduced to an impotent and useless force when attacked by the new weapon of the 20th century, the armadas of the air. 
This is the terrible problem to which some Englishmen find no answer. England herself has never been seriously invaded since the Middle Ages, until the last war when bombs fell on London. Now all Englishmen know how vulnerable it to air attack is their ancient capital, and they cannot be sure that the Dominions would come to their assistance as readily as in 1914. But what do you will ask about this balance of power? Well, as in 1815 by the Concert of Europe, so in 1938 by the Four Power Pact, the balance is assured for a time. For within this pact, Italy is responsible, is a possible counter counterweight to Germany, thanks to her treaties with Yugoslavia and Hungary. In the long run, one may speculate, Russia is more likely to be matched against Greater Germany, with Britain, France, and possibly Italy holding the balance between the two. But whatever may happen in that line, the alliance between France and Britain has become indispensable to both. And, as Lord Baldwin has said, Britain's frontier is now definitely on the Rhine. Another thing seems certain. France's system of Eastern alliances is in tatters. And the Franco-Russian pact, for practical purposes, a thing of the past. Britain's distaste for these commitments has been obvious ever since they were made. And it was a decisive factor in the late crisis. The plain truth is that despite her democratic ideals, Britain has never fought and will not now fight a purely ideological war. Her course now under Chamberlain's leadership is the one she has always followed before, to come to terms with the first power on the continent, to meet around a table and compromise, to persuade Hitler that he will get more in the end by keeping his promises. And meanwhile, of course, to strengthen her own defenses and improve her relations with the United States. It was not surprising to see Anthony Eden and Winston Churchill just now making overtures to America for a world democratic front. And it is interesting to learn, too, that King George and Queen Elizabeth are to visit President Roosevelt next year. Good night to you. Copies of these talks, the story behind the headlines, by Caesar Sechinger, are available in printed form. They are issued by the Columbia University Press in the form of a bulletin which includes additional material and bibliography. They may be had for ten cents apiece or one dollar for the first 13 issues by addressing the story behind the headlines, NBC, Radio City. This program presented by the American Historical Association is an NBC educational feature. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Story behind the headlines. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, takes pleasure in introducing to you for the third successive season, Caesar Searchinger. Mr. Searchinger, former foreign news correspondent, author and close observer for many years of the European scene, makes it his job to give you a fuller understanding of the real significance of the news. He places at your disposal not only the latest bulletins, but a summary of the historical background explaining their earliest causes. Last year, the story behind the headlines was given a first award for educational programs on any network at the Ninth Institute of Education by radio. Now, here is your speaker, Mr. Caesar Searchinger. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be back with you. The all-overshadowing news event that's happened since I last spoke to you is the outbreak of the European War. It'll be my task, therefore, to speak to you about the background of that event, and that means Poland, first of all. Although Poland is by no means the only factor in the present war, it certainly was its immediate cause. And, one might add, it was the inevitable cause. It's almost right to say that there would have been no war if there had been no Poland. A Poland, like the seven other succession states, was created at the Peace Conference of Paris in 1919. This satisfied the nationalistic aspirations of the Polish people, but it failed to assure their economic welfare and their military security. Of course, it's easy enough to blame the treaty makers of Versailles for all the mistakes they made. But it would be wrong to say that they didn't try to make a new Europe that would work. In trying to give Poland not only territory predominantly inhabited by Poles, but also an economic outlet to the sea, they created the Polish Corridor, which cut off East Prussia from the rest of Germany. Then, when the Allied statesmen approved handing over the coal region of Upper Silesia, to help Polish industry, many thousands of German people were forced to go along, too. Germany never forgot the corridor and Upper Silesia. Then, Poland antagonized Russia by pushing east, annexing several millions of Ukrainians and white Russians in 1921. Thus, she had made enemies of both her potentially powerful neighbors, 
which for a young, weak state was almost bound to create trouble in the end. History should have warned Poland and the Allies that this would happen. For the Polish question, so-called, has been a source of European unrest for two centuries and a half, ever since the time when Poland was ceasing to be an empire in her own right, and no longer able to hold the neighboring Slavic peoples in subjection by force of arms. At one time, you know, the Polish kings had ruled over an area reaching from the Baltic to the Black Sea. As late as 1683, one of these kings, John Sobieski, defeated the mighty Turks at the gates of Vienna. But Poland had not only been powerful. In the 15th and 16th century, she was one of the most enlightened and progressive states in Europe. Her universities flourished, and her religious as well as intellectual freedom was a freedom that was not found elsewhere. Yet by the middle of the 18th century, she had become politically so decadent that she was an easy prey to the ambitions of powerful neighbors. Now, how did all this happen? It's an interesting point, because the basic reason political and social disunion, disunion, has haunted that unfortunate country right down to the present day. From ancient times, the assertion of autonomous rights and individual freedom on the part of the land-holding nobility has stood in the way of unity and of any practical system of government. There was a diet, a parliament, in which the nobles, the church, and even the cities were represented. But, after about 1650, all decisions had to be unanimous. If a single deputy objected to a proposed law, it was not only defeated, but all the previous acts of the Diet were nullified, and the assembly was dissolved. The Diet was then said, then said to be exploded. Now, of the 55 Diets between 1652 and 1764, 48 were exploded, and nearly one-third of them by the vote of a single member. Well, government virtually ceased to exist. In these circumstances, when those two ambitious sovereigns, Frederick the Great of Prussia and Catherine of Russia, wanted to build up their power, Poland became easy meat. In 1772, Russia and Prussia took large frontier slices, and another chunk was thrown to Austria. In this way, Prussia, the nucleus of the present Germany, first got what has now become known as the Corridor. This linked up her territory of East Prussia with the rest of the kingdom, and eventually with the free city of Danzig the greatest East Baltic port. Now, if there's any excuse for this first partition of Poland, there was none for the second, 21 years later, in 1793. The Poles had made strenuous efforts at political reform, and Frederick William, the new Prussian king, had guaranteed the independence and constitution of the country in 1791. But Catherine, that insatiable lady, marched in with 100,000 Russians, and Frederick William of Prussia, when the Poles asked him for help, just came along to get his share of the spoils. Poland was now one-third her original size and had no seacoast, and two years later, her three great neighbor, neighbors swallowed the rest. This third and complete partition stirred up the liberal world. Kosciuszko, the Polish general who fought in our revolution in America, tried unsuccessfully to rally the French to save Poland. Heading a Polish revolt, Kosciuszko actually drove the Russians out of Warsaw and Vilna, only to fail in the end. But the revolt did something. It kindled a new kind of patriotism among the Polish gentry, and eventually inspired that national spirit among all Poles, Poles of all classes, not just the nobles, which has kept the idea of Polish independence alive for 150 years. The Polish patriots, agitating for their country's restoration, caught the European movement for national unity and independence at flood tide. French Democrats and English liberals were both sympathetic to the aspirations of oppressed peoples. Even in Germany, the cause of liberty was held high. Polish refugees became a romantic adjunct to polite society in Vienna, Paris, and Berlin. Sympathy with the oppressed Poles vibrated to the melancholy strains of Chopin's music, in European concert halls and salons. Famous for their passionate bravery even then, the Poles revolted in the Russian section of their country in 1830 and 1863, and in the Prussian part in 1848. Each revolt was mercilessly crushed, but the Polish language and Polish culture survived, and most important, the Polish people increased at a tremendous rate from 8 million in the 18th century to 20 million by 1910. The Polish question, in fact, was a ghost that refused to be laid, 
and was a major headache to the Western statesmen in the World War. But Tsarist Russia, their ally, continued to hold the biggest part of Poland and showed no signs of giving it up, though it promised some sort of home rule. So in one respect at least, the Bolshevik Revolution was a godsend to the treaty makers of Versailles. For the Bolsheviks, you see, had been forced to give up Russian Poland and more at the Treaty of brest litovsk And with Russia out of the way, the Allies were able to dispose of the Polish question once and for all, as they thought. President Wilson, in his 14 points, had laid down the formula for the resurrection of the Polish state. It was to consist of all territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations and was to have a free and secure access to the sea. So the Polish Republic was born in 1919 and the Polish corridor was resurrected from the murky past. Also, the Germanic free city of Danzig was made free once more and the Poles were given control of its customs. But the enthusiastic Poles wanted much more, as we've seen. They wanted Vilna and they took it, just like that. And the new Polish army pushed on into White Russia and the Ukraine with the help of the French. The British, however, wanted the eastern frontier of Poland to be somewhere near the line now occupied by Soviet Russia, knowing that east of that line there were more Russians than Poles. And it was interesting to read last week that the Polish government has now agreed not to demand the return of that region after the war. At least that's the report. Now, French policy after the war was aimed at keeping Germany down and Russia out of Europe. This required a strong self-governing Poland, but the Poles had no tradition of self-government. During the 150 years of their subjection, Western Europe had developed a democracy based on the growing power of the commercial middle class. Poland had no such unifying middle class. It still had the land-holding nobility and a peasantry that was desperately poor. As recently as 1929, before the Depression, mind you, 93% of its population had an average monthly income of four dollars and a half per head. Nevertheless, in 1921, the Poles had democracy thrust upon them, with universal suffrage, proportional representation, and a modern parliament. Well, it didn't work. Old dissensions were revived and new ones added. Between 1921 and 26, no less than 80 political parties appeared though not all at one time, and 14 cabinets struggled for power. It seemed that the Poles, after generations of opposition against alien government, had become hostile to government of any kind. Now, after Marshal Przewitski made himself master of Poland by a coup d'etat in 1926, the parliamentary system began to decay. He was a dictator whose strong character was enough to hold the government together. When he died in 1935, there was no real leader and the government was ruled by a clique of his followers known as the Colonels. The political parties now lost their power altogether. The leader of the largest, the Peasant Party, was imprisoned and then exiled. Civil liberties disappeared. Democracy was practically dead. The Colonels became the spiritual heirs of the ancient gentry who said, we are Poland. In fact, the new constitution of 1935 is frankly based on what they call the solidarity of the elite. Now, Polish foreign policy, ever since the restoration, has been dominated by two fears, Germany and Russia, plus communism. It relied upon French help in holding her own against both. But when Hitler came to power and declared himself the deadly enemy of communism, Dilwitzki made a pact with Germany, and Poland began to play power politics on her own. Thinking that Hitler's interest in Danzig and the corridor had been deflected towards richer pickings further south, Poland, in the person of Colonel Beck, played along. When Hitler partitioned Czechoslovakia, Poland immediately recaptured a peace for herself. But Mr. Hitler, having finished off Czechoslovakia, now turned to the Polish corridor after all. He didn't even wait for the French pact to expire. What could Poland do? She was in a very tight spot. She had played Germany off against Russia, and she could obviously not ask Russia to come to her aid, for first Russia would demand back the eastern part of Poland, in which there are millions of Russians and almost no Poles. So Colonel Beck asked Britain and France to come to Poland's aid. Well, Britain and France guaranteed Poland's independence. The Germans attacked, made a deal with Soviet Russia, and in three weeks, the fourth partition of Poland was a fact. Now, that doesn't mean that Poland is partitioned for good. 
history shows that no peace could be a lasting peace that did not attempt an equitable solution of the Polish question. That question has haunted Europe for centuries, and it demands an answer once again. But it seems unlikely that the answer will be as simple as it was before. This time it can be neither a Poland designed to insulate communism, nor to be a link in an encirclement chain. Poor as it was, Poland had to spend one half her entire revenue on defense. The Polish question today is no longer one of national independence alone. There is also the problem of political security for a small state, of providing a more effective government, and enabling 25 or 30 million hard-working people to benefit from economic cooperation with the rest of the world. I bid you good night. Thank you, Mr. Suchinger. Ladies and gentlemen, type copies of this and succeeding talks in the story behind the headlines, together with reading lists, may be obtained by writing to the Columbia University Press, New York, or to the station to which you are now listening. Please enclose ten cents in coin or stamps to cover the cost of handling and mailing of each, or one dollar for copies of the first series of 13 talks. Caesar Searchinger will be with you again next Friday at the same hour. This program, presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association, is a public service feature of the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. The story behind the headlines. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Cesar Searchinger, foreign correspondent and author, in another informal analysis of the news. Mr. Searchinger retraces the line of cause and effect to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of national and international affairs. Copies of these talks can be had by writing to the Columbia University Press, New York, or to the station to which you are listening, enclosing ten cents in coin or stamps. Each series of thirteen talks covering the contemporary history of three months may be had for one dollar. Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is the third invasion of France. Mr. Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. One of the two most sensational news stories of the week was Premier Paul Reynaud's grave but co courageous explanation of the French disaster at the River Meuse. It came at the end of eight of the most terrible days in all history, during which Hitler's blitzkrieg on France swept on with apparently irresistible force. We are too close to these world-shaking events and too deeply engaged with our feelings to comprehend their full significance. But what may help us to understand is to refresh our memories of the recent past, for this is the third German invasion of France within 70 years. Viewing one aspect of these 70 years, namely the sensational shift of power on the European continent, it is possible to rationalize, if not fully explain, what has happened and is happening now. Before 1870, France, then a dictatorship under Napoleon III, was the leading military power in Europe. Its position had been left unchallenged, despite Leipzig and Waterloo, for over half a century. The reputation of French military science and of France as a military force was unimpaired. What had happened by 1870 to change all that in a few short months, or weeks? What made it possible for France to be invaded three times and to suffer disasters on the field of battle that are unparalleled in their magnitude? Here is a guiding fact. The interval between the defeat of Napoleon in 1815 and the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 roughly marks the spread of the Industrial Revolution on the continent of Europe, after having changed the life of England and given her a long start in world trade. For various reasons, too long to enumerate here, industry, after starting late in Germany, developed faster there and to greater magnitude than in France. Again, for various reasons, the population of Germany grew by leaps and bounds, while that of France increased very slowly. At the same time, the militant nationalism which had made France so powerful after the French Revolution had spread to Germany, largely as the result of Napoleon's campaigns. And this led to the greatest political phenomenon of the 19th century, the unification of the 38 German states into the German Reich. It was this rising power which eventually challenged the continental supremacy of France. 
Now, there's a widespread belief that some traditional hatred existed between the Germans and the French. History does not bear this out. From the beginning of French ascendancy on the continent, about the middle of the 17th century, France's most frequent adversary was not Germany, but England. England was a member of virtually every coalition against France, from the League of Augsburg in 1688 to the Grand Alliance which defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. Hatred between France and Germany, or rather Prussia, did not develop until the days of another Napoleon, Napoleon III, who recognized the menace of a unified Germany but lacked the genius to deal with it. In 1864 and 1866, Bismarck, Prussia's Iron Chancellor, who was determined to create a powerful Germany under Prussia's leadership, fought two successful wars, one against Denmark and one against Austria. After the Battle of Sadoa, in which the Austrians were disastrously defeated, the leadership of the German states passed from the decadent Austrian Empire to the militant Prussian Kingdom. This enabled Bismarck to organize the North German Confederation, consisting of the 22 German states north of the river Main. Napoleon III, who fatally underestimated the strength of the new Prussia, tried to block Germany's road to complete unity by demanding that the southern states, Bavaria, Baden, Wittenberg, etc., be left out of the Confederation. Bismarck yielded, biding his time, but the cry of revenge for Sadoa went up in France, and the flame of hatred was fanned by newspapers on both sides of the Rhine. The Franco-Prussian War, which finally broke out, was engineered by Bismarck, who felt that it would rouse the patriotism of all Germans and complete the process of German unification which he had begun. He exploited the incompetence and the blustering arrogance of Napoleon III, sometimes called Napoleon the Little, and trapped him into declaring war. It was the most senseless of modern wars, and most tragic in its consequences down to the present day. When the war began on Bastille Day, July 14, 1870, the French people were confident that the troublesome upstart nation across the Rhine would soon have to recognize the European mastery of France. But the French armies were unprepared. Although the Minister of War assured the Emperor that everything was in readiness, quote, down to the last button, on the last gator of the last man. Prussia, however, was ready, and its army was commanded by one of the greatest soldiers of modern times, General Helmut von Moltke. Using rail transport for mobilization, Moltke has three huge armies along the west bank of the Rhine within 22 days. The French, caught half mobilized in Lorraine, were thrown back in confusion and a large part of their forces was trapped in the fortress of Metz. Thirteen days later, the rest of the French field armies besieged in Sedan, an important town in the present war, you know, surrendered to the Prussians who took 104 prisoners, including the emperor himself. After a breathless four weeks of fighting, real French resistance was at an end. The humiliation of France was complete. Defeat was followed by internal revolt, and after a bitter struggle, France became a republic for the third time, and this time not only a republic, but a real democracy. Her quick recovery and national regeneration was the wonder of the world. She imitated Prussia by instituting universal education and universal military service. She created a great colonial empire, second only to Britain's. She became commercially prosperous as she had never been before. But the loss of Alsace-Lorraine to Germany created a gulf between the two countries which could not be bridged. Chauvinists kept the hatred alive on both sides of the Rhine, so much so that the peace-minded French Republican government was sometimes in danger. A would-be dictator arose in the person of handsome General Boulanger, the man on horseback. And as the result of various incidents on both sides of the Rhine, Germany and France were again close to war in 1888. Well, war was averted, partly by the injection of a new factor, an England edging away from Germany, the rising sea power and economic rival, towards the side of France. France, which was isolated in 1870, was now looking for allies. And what was originally expected to be a war of revenge became, in 1914, a world war to prevent German domination in Europe 
and commercial supremacy in the world. Strategically, the War of 1914 was based on the rejuvenated military power of France. The defeat of 1870 had so weakened the confidence of French militarists in themselves that at first they planned to meet the future German attack behind the line of the River Loire. This defensive plan involved the abandonment of half of France to the Germans, including Paris. Only after 1895, when the French felt more secure as the result of the Russian alliance, was the plan of troop concentration moved further northeastward and nearer the German border, to the Seine and then to the Marne. And not until 1908, four years after the Entente with Great Britain, did the French military authorities return wholeheartedly to the doctrine of the offensive. Then, in February 1914, came the so-called Plan 17, of which more presently. The Germans, in the meantime, had developed a series of offensive plans based on the Moltke strategy of fast movement and concentration. It wasn't new with Moltke, by the way. Uh, General Forrest of the American Confederate Army explained it in a very homely way by saying, I gets their first with the mostest men. And these German plans were worked out by the famous general, Count von Schlieffen, who retired in 1906, and they were modified from time to time to suit the changing international situation. Schlieffen's plan envisaged the war on two fronts, for Russia had become an ally of France. It also provided for the violation of Belgian territory in order to outflank the fortified Franco-German frontier along the Vosges. In any case, that mountainous terrain made a blitzkrieg on this front impossible. Schlieffen therefore planned an advance through part of Belgium using the broad level corridor of the Meuse Valley, so familiar from recent news. The German forces along the Franco-German border were to have a purely defensive role, which, by the way, they have filled to the present day. All the available striking power was to be put into a great right wing hinged near the northern end of the fortified region of Metz. This right wing was to sweep like a great sickle through Belgium and France hooking Paris at the end of its swing and eventually catching the French forces in its arc. If that plan had worked completely in 1914, the war would have ended disastrously for France. But Schlieffen was succeeded by another and lesser Moltke, nephew of the Great One, who was an irresolute man and a sick one when the war broke out. He wanted to play safe by strengthening the defensive forces along the French border between Luxembourg and Switzerland and... Thereby, he weakened his right wing, the sickle's blade. It was this that made General von Kluck swing left too early, northeast of Paris, in order to close a gap on his left, a maneuver which made possible the so-called miracle of the Marne. Paris was saved by a French flank attack, and the Blitzkrieg of 1914 was at an end. A four years trench war followed, and in the end, Germany was defeated chiefly by the effects of the British blockade. Now, as against the Schlieffen plan, there was the aforesaid French plan number 17. This plan, conceived by a group of officers known as the Young Turks, ordered the concentration of the French armies along the German border between Mezières and Belfort, facing east. It disregarded the German plan for a sweep through Belgium, although it was an open secret. The French did not think the German armies would extend beyond the river Meuse and would be held up by the forts of Liège and Namur. They also believed that the heavier the Germans blow through Belgium, the more they would have to weaken their lines on the French frontier, and the easier it would be for the French to drive into Germany further south. The carrying out of this plan caused a major tragedy in 1914. In the often forgotten Battle of the Frontiers, August 21 to 24, the French lost a vast number of men including most of their irreplaceable young officers. Finally, they were forced to abandon their attack and rush westward to meet the German advance on Paris. The Germans, meantime, had battered their way past the Meuse forts, past Liège and Namur, using their 42-centimeter howitzers on wheels, the surprise weapon of 1914. And they had entered France near the very spot where they entered it again only ten days ago. Today, in Hitler's War of Revenge, though like 1914 it has a far wider meaning than revenge, the French army is again the mainstay of defense. And tragically enough, it has repeated some of the mistakes of 1914. Premier Renault, in his speech to the Senate, which I quoted before, 
said that the nerve had been mistakenly considered as a serious obstacle to the enemy, and only inferior troops, thinly spread, were there to meet the German thrust. And again the Germans had their surprise weapons, Stukas, or dive bombers, and armored tanks of enormous size. Says Monsieur Renault, the truth is that our classic conception of warfare has run counter to a new conception. Well, after 1914, France managed to adapt herself. She is making a superhuman effort to do so today. In 1914, she was saved by the miracle of the Marne. She is praying for another miracle to save her today. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Searchinger. Next Friday evening, Caesar Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. This program has been a public service feature of the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company and its associated stations and came to you from the RCA building, Radio City, New York. Story behind the headlines. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, again presents Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer, in an informal analysis of the news. Nothing that happens is without its relation to the past. Somewhere in history are recorded the forerunners of the events which overshadow our lives today. With the assistance of a research panel of eminent historians, Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past, to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. Copies of these talks may be obtained through the Columbia University Press. Simply send 10 cents in coin or stamps to the Columbia University Press or the National Broadcasting Company, New York City. Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is the war in Greece. Good evening, everybody. This is the 13th day of Italy's war against Greece. According to fascist estimates, it was to have taken two or three weeks to win this war. Today, after more than half of that time, the Italians are nowhere more than a few miles inside Greek territory. And at one point, the Greeks have actually pushed beyond their own frontier. At last accounts, they were stoutly resisting the Italian drive into Epirus, where, by the way, the great poet Homer located hell. And their tough mountain troops, the kilted Evzonis, may be expected to defend every inch of the passes that lead across the Pindus Mountains into the plain of Thessaly. Of course, it would be wrong to be too optimistic about the Greeks' ability to resist the Italians for long. The Italians have at least a quarter of a million on the Greek front, a strong mechanized force and airplanes galore. The Greeks have barely 150,000 men under arms altogether, and their air force is very small. Moreover, the Italians have just started their real offensive now that it is clear that the Greeks won't capitulate, won't coordinate themselves with the Axis new order in the Balkans and the Near East. But the very fact that the Greeks, weakest of the Balkan peoples, have alone taken up the challenge is a measure of their courage and their stamina. It is also an indication of their faith in the effectiveness of British support in which sea power is the important factor. There is a historical reason for their belief. When this war broke out, crowds in Athens marched to the British legation waving Greek flags and the Union Jack. They were, of course, thinking of Britain's pledge to come to their aid. But some certainly were also thinking of their country's revolutionary war over a century ago. Then, too, they were the only Balkan people to rise successfully against the superior power. Then, too, support came from the great seafaring nation in the West. Here is the situation as it was 120 years ago. For centuries, ever since the Turkish inundation of the Balkans, there had been no independent Greece. The ancient Greeks, the people of ancient Hellas, whose bright and gleaming spirit had kindled the lights of civilization all over the Western world, the race of Homer and Aristotle and Sophocles had disappeared. The glory that was Greece had vanished as completely as the grandeur that was Rome. The Greek city-states had been destroyed after the Romans burned Corinth. Athenian culture was wiped out by centuries of violence and decay. The whole country was degraded by oppression and partly depopulated by poverty under four centuries of Turkish rule. But the memory of the golden age of Hellas was not dead. 
thanks to the scholars and educators of the West, the Greek tradition of learning and the worship of truth and beauty had become a living force. And Greece itself had become a mecca for poets and artists who mourned its fate. Fair Greece, sang Byron, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. And it was the force of this tradition, living still in the ruins of the Parthenon and the lovely Greek statues in our museums, that roused the sympathies of the entire world to the support of Greece and so gave the Greek Revolution a unique appeal. The revolt was launched in southern Greece by the Archbishop Germanos, who raised the Christian cross as a revolutionary symbol in 1821. At once the idea of a reborn Greece, inspired by French revolutionary ideals, enlisted the intellectual hotheads of the time. The Greeks fought bravely in their mountains and on the sea and for a time they seemed to be winning out. They had one great advantage over the Turks in that they were a seafaring people by nature. In fact, the Turks had always depended on their Greek subjects to man the Turkish fleet. So now the Sultan had to call on the Egyptian fleet to help him out and restore his mastery on the sea. And pretty soon the tide turned against the rebels, who incidentally were also fighting against each other the Greeks would have lost their fight for independence altogether if they had not secured outside aid. And here is where England comes in. Among those intellectual hotheads I just mentioned was Lord Byron, the great English poet, then about 36 years old and, as it happened, very rich. Byron had always had an incurable itch to play a great role as a statesman or soldier and he was inclined to blame his lame leg for having condemned him to fight only with his pen. Some other English enthusiasts finally induced him to fit out a ship, sail to Greece and organize a new center of resistance with the help of English technicians, modern weapons and ammunition. That episode is the most fantastic even in Byron's fantastic life, and it ended after three months with the poet's death from malarial fever in what one of his companions called the land of fleas, flies, and thieves. But Byron didn't die in vain. The prestige of his name did much to rally the liberals of Europe to the aid of the Greeks. It brought about the collaboration of England with Russia and France, which resulted in the destruction of the Turkish fleet in Navarino Bay. That was in 1827, two and a half years after Byron's death. And two and a half years after that, the independence of Greece was recognized. A Bavarian prince was placed on the throne in 1932 with the title of King of the Hellenes. Greece was the first country to emerge from the Turkish inundation, a poverty-stricken nation of 651,000 people, not much over half a million. It has about seven million today. Now, although Greek independence was largely due to the intervention of a Russian army in the north and a French one in the south, the Greeks are grateful mainly to England, symbolized in the person of her romantic poet, Byron. And England has been able to capitalize on that gratitude ever since by taking Greece under her tutelage and helping her to grow relatively strong. Greece was given the Ionian Islands, hitherto British, including Corfu in 1864. She was allowed to take Thessaly from the Turks, and after the Balkan Wars, her boundaries included Salonika and the island of Crete. No wonder that Britain expected cooperation from Greece in the World War of 1914. But this is what happened in the World War. The king of Greece, Constantine, nicknamed Tino, was the Kaiser's brother-in-law and he was suspected of being pro-German, though his liberal premier, Venizelos, was definitely pro-ally. Venizelos invited the Allies to land 150,000 troops in Saloniki, whereupon he had to resign. But the Allied, the Allies landed troops all the same. Only there were too few, so few that they were condemned to inactivity. The Romanians expected these troops under the French General Sarai to attack the Kaiser's Bulgarian allies but they didn't. So the Romanian soldiers marched alone to the chant of 
O Sarai, 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 noi ne batem si tu stai, which means, O Sarai, O Sarai, we are fighting while you stand still. So nothing happened, except that the Allies shelled Athens and later forced the king to abdicate, while uh, Venizelos brought Greece into the war. King Tino, by the way, was succeeded by his son Alexander, but shortly after the war he returned, his son having died as the result of a monkey bite. Tragedy caught up with the whole Greek people a year or so later as the result of a disastrous war with Turkey. In the peace treaties, the Greeks had been given Smyrna in Asia Minor as a reward for coming into the war. But the Turks, under their dynamic leader, Mustafa Kemal, undertook to dispossess them. The Greeks, left unsupported by the Allies, were driven out of Asia, their army was massacred, and Smyrna burned. Hundreds of thousands of Greek residents had to flee for their lives. Then, under the terms of a new peace treaty, one, over one million Turkish Greeks were repatriated to Greece. This was the first of these famous population exchanges and the most cruel. Imagine, more than one million refugees to take care of all at once for a little country like Greece. King Tino, by the way, took the rap again and in 1922 he abdicated a second time, in favor of his son George this time. George, too, was forced to abdicate after a reign of 15 months, and in 1924, on the 103rd anniversary of Greek independence, the people voted for a republic. But the republic gave way to a dictatorship, and the dictatorship to a royal restoration. So, in 1935, King George II ended his pleasant English exile to become king a second time. If Greece is pro-British today, it is partly due to George, but partly also to the old memory of Britain's championship of Greek independence over a century ago. You can still find peasants in Greece today who speak of Lordos Byron with reverent awe. Greece, it is true, is a dictatorship again today. So it is not a case of a democracy fighting against a totalitarian foe. Moreover, the Greek dictator John Metaxas was pro-German until a little while ago, just as his one-time master King Tino was in 1915. But even dictator Metaxas cannot risk appeasing Italy when Italy is challenging British supremacy in the Mediterranean Sea. So long as Britain controls the eastern Mediterranean, Greek independence is safe. If that control should pass to Italy, if the Mediterranean should once again become a Roman sea, then modern Greece would go the way of her ancestor, ancient Hellas, when it fell under the Caesar's heel. So, once again, Greek soldiers in their mountain passes face the legions of Italy to defend the independence of their country. And the British Navy is doing its part in defending her own lifeline as well as the life of Greece. British warships are protecting the Greek islands and British planes are bombing Italian centers of supply. But no British army has yet landed in Saloniki to stem the Italian eastward advance. With the present British forces available in the east, such a move might weaken the British position in Egypt, where another Italian army is driving east. That might be just what Mussolini wants, for, so we are given to understand, the drive through Egypt and the drive through Greece are parts of a great pincer's movement which is to threaten the Suez Canal and the oil fields of the Near East. If that is so, those Greek soldiers facing the Italians in Epirus are performing a function that may turn out to be historic. 2,420 years ago, the Spartan king Leonidas held the pass of Thermopylae with 7,000 7, men against an overwhelming force of Persians until he was betrayed and the Persians swept down to Athens and burned the Acropolis. But even while Leonidas was holding the pass, the Athenian fleet was preparing to give battle and eventually the Persian Persians were forced to retreat and evacuate most of Greece. Today, all Greece is a Thermopylae, stemming the tide of totalitarian advance, but the decision is pending elsewhere, on the waters of the Mediterranean and in the British sky. Good night.
You have been listening to Caesar Searchinger. Please remember that copies of these talks are available for 10 cents in stamps or coin by addressing the Columbia University Press, National Broadcasting Company, New York City. Next Friday evening, Caesar Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. This program has been presented as a public service by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC networks. The story behind the headlines. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, again presents Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer, in an informal analysis of the news. With the assistance of a research panel of eminent historians, Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. Copies of these talks are available to our radio audience at the cost of 10 cents. Send 10 cents in coin or stamps to the story behind the headlines, National Broadcasting Company, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York City. Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is the riddle of the straits. Mr. Searchinger. Good evening. The most serious news in the papers this and last week, aside from the British evacuation from Greece and the Nazi breakthrough at Tobruk, was the occupation of certain Greek islands by German troops. These islands include Samothrace and Lemnos, and they cover the western entrance to the Dardanelles. Two other islands, Lesbos and Chios, Further south and still closer to the Turkish coast are rumored to be occupied or may be taken any day unless the British fleet can prevent it. If it can't, the Germans will soon have a chain of Axis-controlled islands running all the way from the mouth of the Dardanelles to Italy's Dodecanese Islands on the southeastern Turkish coast. These islands can blockade all Turkish harbors except the remote and unimportant ones on the southern coast. Significant in this connection is the rumored passage of several merchant ships carrying German war materials from the Black Sea to the Aegean through the Turkish Straits, which could hardly have occurred without Turkish acquiescence. What these things portend is not difficult to guess, especially in view of the intense diplomatic pressure now being applied to the Turks. In any case, the conflict at the moment seems to be focusing on the historic waterway between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, consisting of the narrow Dardanelles at one end, the even narrower Bosporus at the other, and the Sea of Marmara in between, all collectively known as the Turkish Straits. The importance of that narrow channel of water in the fate of nations goes back to prehistoric times. This is indicated even in the mythology of the ancient Greeks. For Jason and his Argonauts sailed through the Hellespont, the Greek name for the Dardanelles, in search of the Golden Fleece, probably an ancient symbol for wealth. Control of the Hellespont, or Dardanelles, was the real issue of the Trojan War for the citizens of ancient Troy and of the cities that occupied the site before Troy, levied heavy tolls on the ships trading through the straits, bringing grain from the north shore of the Black Sea, now called the Ukraine, and tapping the trade routes to the Orient through the harbors along the southern shore. After the Battle of Salamis, which, as I mentioned last week, established Greek sea power in the Aegean, Athens controlled the Black Sea route, both by her fleet and by colonies, or bases, as we should say today, until the Athenian Empire was destroyed in the Peloponnesian War. To the Roman Empire, the Black Sea route was less important than to the Greeks, only because Rome traded with the East through Syria and Egypt, and the African colonies supplied it with grain. But after Rome declined and the Mohammedans cut Christian Europe off from these routes, the Straits recovered their old importance for the Western world. Meantime, Constantinople had been built at the Bosporus as the capital of the Eastern Empire, and the Greek emperors had established complete control over the Mediterranean Black Sea route. The question of the Straits has been a difficult European problem ever since. From the 11th century onwards, it chiefly concerned the sovereign trading cities of Italy, like Venice and Genoa, who competed bitterly for the privilege of navigating the straits. There was no such thing as the open door in those days. The Venetians went so far as to conquer Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade, after which they exercised an overlordship over the Black Sea. Then the Genoese helped the Greeks recapture their capital, and for some time they enjoyed a monopoly of the Black Sea trade. 
But in 1452, the Ottoman Turks took Constantinople and the control of the Straits passed into Muslim hands. The Turks had already conquered all of Asia Minor, the Balkans, and Greece. By 1457, the Black Sea had become a Turkish lake. Thanks to the construction of heavy guns, which was a novelty in the 15th century, the Turks were able to close the Straits to all other nations, and the conquest of Egypt also gave them a monopoly of the East Indian trade. The Turkish monopoly of the Black Sea was maintained until the 18th century, when the Russian Empire established itself on the southern, northern shore. The advent of Russia among the Black Sea nations changed the problem of the Straits. It was Peter the Great who realized that the future greatness of Russia depended on access to a warm water sea. But it was a woman who first forced the Sultan to give up his exclusive, exclusive control of the Black Sea, namely Catherine the Second. Catherine actually sent a fleet from the Baltic all the way around Gibraltar to blockade the Dardanelles from the west. Four years later, the Straits were opened to the merchant ships of Russia and soon to those of other countries as well, including England and France. The Turkish commercial monopoly was broken at last, and trade of all kinds has flowed between the Mediterranean and the ports of the Black Sea ever since, at least in times of peace. But, besides being the great corridor of trade, the Straits, as the link between two continents, have had great strategic importance both in ancient and modern times. Darius, the Persian king, crossed the Dardanelles in the 6th century BC to ravage European lands. His son, Xerxes, built his famous bridge of boats across them to march a mighty army into Greece. He chose a spot on the Narrows, just where the straits are only a mile wide, where Leander used to swim across to see his lady love, Hero, and where the Turks erected their toll stations for less romantic purposes later on. The Turks, by the way, first crossed into Europe near the same place in 1354, though they didn't conquer Constantinople for another 99 years. Constantinople was built at the Bosporus, which in places is only 800 yards, to hold the European and Asiatic parts of the Greek Empire together. By means of this maritime fort, the Turks were able to keep all warships from passing through the Straits. When the Russians became a Black Sea power under Peter the Great, the Turks at first denied them the right to have a fleet. In fact, they beat them in a naval battle and forced them to disarm. But a century later, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, which was a Turkish possession, the Sultan, in his fright, called on the Russian Tsar for help. Russian warships entered the Bosporus for the, and, for a time, passed freely in and out. Thereafter, Turkey might have been at the mercy of Russia, except for England. Napoleon's Egyptian adventure, you see, had, for the first time, aroused England's interest in the Near East. From then on, throughout the 19th century, England and Russia were the chief competitors for the control of those who controlled the Straits, namely the Turks. Russia's ambition was to partition European Turkey and capture Constantinople. England's interest, later on, centered on the lands near the Suez Canal. For a long time, however, she was busy restraining Russia and, incidentally, keeping the Russian fleet inside the Black Sea. In 1809, Turkey's right to exclude warships from the Straits was reasserted with England's support. Thus England, rather than Russia, became co-guardian of the Straits. Then, in 1833, Russia sent a squadron to Constantinople to protect the Sultan in his troubles with Muhammad Ali, the rebellious Khedive of Egypt. And, as a result, the Tsar wangled a treaty which seemed to give him the inside track. But England and France protested, and eventually the five great powers of Europe jointly engaged themselves to keep all warships out of both sides of the Straits. That was the famous Straits Convention of 1841, which remained in force until the World War. Meantime, it became clearer and clearer that the unwieldy old Turkish Empire was crumbling. Russia, anxious to speed the process, made war on the sick man of Europe in 1854 and again in 1877. Both times the sick man was saved by the Western powers, who were not ready for the kill. But France occupied Tunis and England occupied Egypt, former Turkish territories both, in 1911, Italy made war and seized Tripoli, Turkey's last African possession, and then the Balkan states combined and took nearly all of European Turkey. 
Finally, the World War made an end of the old Turkish Empire. What remained was the new Turkish national state, confined to Asia Minor and a small piece of European territory near the Straits. The one country, ironically enough, which did not profit from the breakup of the old Turkey was Russia, who for over a century had considered herself the sick man's principal heir. Russia's share of the world war spoils were to have included Constantinople and the Straits. But the Bolsheviks renounced these imperial ambitions and later even helped the nationalist Turks in resisting the Allies. Meantime, in November 1918, an Allied fleet passed through the Dardanelles and the Allies occupied Constantinople, considerably embarrassed as to what to do with it. After trying to persuade us, the United States, to accept a mandate over Constantinople and the Straits, they decided to internationalize them and demilitarize them under the Treaty of Sèvres. Thus, the problem of the Straits might have been solved for all time. But the new nationalistic Turkey was rising from the ashes of the decadent empire. The revolutionary government of Mustafa Kemal annihilated the Greek armies sent against him and at a new conference in 1923 obtained free and secure possession of Constantinople and the demilitarized Straits. Once again, the Straits were to be free to merchant vessels of all flags and from now on warships too might pass in a definitely limited number. The non-Black Sea powers were permitted to send enough, however, to keep Soviet Russia in check. But this too was altered in 1936 when Turkey, under the Montreux Convention, was once again made sole keeper of the Straits. In view of the international situation, with Germany rearming and Italy on the war path, Turkey was given the right to re-fortify the Straits and close them against belligerent war vessels in time of war. Moreover, Russia was given free passage into the Aegean for her warships in time of peace, while the warships of all other powers passing into the Black Sea were strictly limited so as not to exceed the Russian fleet. Thus, Soviet Russia profited from the Montreux Convention as well as Turkey herself. By making a friend of the new Turkey, Soviet Russia had come nearer to fulfilling the old imperial aspirations than the belligerent Russia of the Tsars. A new and sinister factor has now been introduced by the Nazis' push to the east. The Dardanelles are no longer an insurmountable problem to the modern military machine. Turkey, the ally of Britain and the Mutual Assistance Pact, is obviously not in a position to resist Germany without material help. Help could come only from England or Russia. Whether either or both of them would be adequate is it more than doubtful. Without such help, Turkey has only the same alternatives which Yugoslavia and Greece had to face. The question, therefore, is not so much what will Turkey do, but what will Soviet Russia permit her to do? Or perhaps what the men of Moscow and Berlin will decide she must do after the present preliminary skirmishes are over and the new diplomatic adjustments have been made. For the present, only the Nazis' purpose is clear. They will not attack Turkey, oh no, if Turkey will only agree to become the base for an offensive through Iraq, where Rashid Ali's troops have just shelled the British airfield, through Transjordan and Palestine, while the Axis African forces push forward on the other side of Suez. And what will be the fate of the Turkish Straits? Will the Soviets, after all, revive the ancient imperial claim, or will they relinquish it to Germany and hope for compensation further east? Or will Turkey, by playing ball, and careful balancing between rival forces be able to maintain a precarious guardianship until the final decision at the end of the war? That, today, is the riddle of the Straits. Good night. You have been listening to Caesar Searchinger, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the American Historical Association. Please remember that copies of these talks are available for 10 cents in stamps or coin by addressing the story behind the headlines, National Broadcasting Company, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York City. Next Friday evening, Caesar Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. The story behind the headlines. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, again presents Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer, in an informal analysis of the news. With the assistance of a research panel of eminent historians, Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. 
Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is Hitler's Crimean War. Mr. Searchinger. Good evening. On Tuesday of this week, the Nazis announced that they had broken through the Isthmus of Perikop after a fierce battle lasting ten days. The Perikop Isthmus is that mere thread of land, three to four miles wide, which connects the Crimean Peninsula with the mainland of Russia, or to be exact, the Ukraine. Today, the Nazi High Command claims the capture of Simferopol, the capital of the Crimea, a city of well over 100,000 souls. Simferopol is about 75 miles south of the Isthmus, and the speed of the German advance was favored by the flat steppe, which is almost ideal tank country. Tonight, the Nazis claim to be within 40 miles of Sevastopol, the Russian naval base near the southern tip of the peninsula, while another column is advancing eastward from Perikop towards Kerch, where the famous iron mines and metallurgical plants are situated. How soon either of these objectives will be captured depends, of course, on the kind of defense the Russians are able to put up. In the case of Sevastopol, the going is likely to be tough, for not only is it heavily fortified, but it is ringed about by mountain ranges and the sea. Its very large harbor holds a formidable fleet, which may take part in the final stages of the defense. That this defense will be bitter goes without saying, for the value of the Crimea is far out of proportion with its size. It isn't a large place, of course, with an area slightly more than the state of Maryland. Its one and a quarter million people have a racial mixture all their own. Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, Armenians, Greeks, Jews, and of course Russians. The Tatars are the main native stock, descendants of the Tatar hordes who established a Khanate in the Crimea in the 13th century, raided medieval Russia for centuries, and sacked Moscow in 1571. Today, what Mongol blood there is, is very much subdued, and the Crimeans are supposed to be loyal comrades of the Soviet. The importance of the Crimea is, first of all, economic. For the most part, it consists of fertile prairie land, a steppe, which grows excellent wheat. In fact, it was famous for its wheat even in ancient times. For almost five centuries before Christ, the Athenians got a large part of their grains and other commodities from the peninsula. It was then known as the Kingdom of Bosporus, which later became a tributary to Rome. The fame of the fertile peninsula survived all the vicissitudes of Rome. It attracted the Goths, the Huns, the Khazars, the Byzantine Greeks, the Kipchaks, and the Mongols, who all conquered it in turn. And in the Renaissance, first the Venetians established coast settlements, then the Genoese built up trading towns which flourished down to the conquest of the southern Crimea by the Ottoman Turks in 1475. A century before that, by the way, the Tatars, I mentioned, had been firmly settled on the steppes further north, and eventually their leaders became tributary princes of the Turks. Meantime, of course, Russia had been growing more and more powerful, and the Tsars weren't forever going to tolerate the Turks exploiting this rich morsel of land on their southern sea coast. After several wars with the Turks, and after defeating the Tatars in 1777, the Russians one fine day annexed the whole peninsula. That was under Catherine the Great, who was anxious to secure a warm water outlet for her empire via the Black Sea. Ever since then, the Crimea, because of its favorable climatic conditions, has been not only an early ripening granary, but more recently a source of tobacco, cotton, all kinds of fruit, wine, oils for perfumes, etc. And because of its wonderful Riviera, that southeastern coast sheltered by a steep mountain range, it also became the favorite playground of Russian princes and the pre-revolutionary Beau Monde. Along this sun-kissed shore, the white palaces of former Tsars are mirrored in the azure sea and quaint Tatar villages nestle against steep slopes, gay with mimosa, magnolias, tulip trees, and sweet-scented flowers. Today, the place is studded with sanatoria and rest homes for workers from all parts of the Soviet Union. Nearly half the health resorts of the country are concentrated on this favored strip of land. Now, much as the Nazi leaders may long to enjoy this little paradise, that is obviously not their main purpose. They say they are capturing the peninsula in order to make a shortcut to the Caucasus and its oil. If that is really their purpose, they will have to drive almost 200 miles to the eastern end of the peninsula and cross the Straits of Yenikale, or Kerch, known in ancient times as the Cimmerian Bosporus. At one point, these straits are only two and a half miles wide, 
and the water is shallow. Crossing those shallow waters may be an easy job for amphibious Nazi warriors. And anyhow, the Sea of Azov is likely to freeze pretty soon. <clears throat> if the Nazis did succeed, they would be within 150 miles of the famous petroleum area of Krasnodar, Maikop, and Neftogorsk. This region in 1938 produced and refined about 7% of Soviet Russia's oil. Last year, the total volume of Russian oil output was nearly 35 million tons. Hence, the Krasnodar area would produce at least 5 million tons. Oil wells can, of course, be destroyed or made unproductive for some time, and the Russians would no doubt do just that. To get at the bulk of Russia's oil in Baku, the Nazis would have to drive across the Caucasian Isthmus to the south side of the Caucasus Mountains for another six or 700 miles. It seems clear that this Crimean shortcut to the Caucasus would not necessarily be a shortcut to the oil. But there is the third and perhaps most important objective in taking the Crimea, and that is the naval fortress of Sevastopol. Sevastopol is Russia's main and virtually sole remaining naval base on the Black Sea. If the Nazis captured the base, the Russian fleet would have to retreat to the eastern Black Sea and find shelter in the harbors and oil ports of the Caucasian shore. What are the chances of the Germans taking Sevastopol? There is, of course, a classic precedent for the capture of this historic fortress, though under very different conditions, and that was the Crimean War of 1854. In this war, the British and French, later joined by the Italians, as defenders and allies of the Turks, fought the Russians under reactionary, under the reactionary and despotic Tsar Nicholas I. That war was a curious mixture of glory and futility, bravery and ignorance, perseverance and stupidity, but chiefly misery, disease and suffering. Its purpose was to prevent the Russians from getting dominance over the Turkish possessions in the Balkans and control of the Turkish Straits. Aside from the fact that the Russians had the third largest fleet, but a pretty bad third, and that this fleet might have made trouble in the Mediterranean, the British had little legitimate concern in the war. But it was the great day of Victorian jingoism and bombast, and Russia, the bear that walks on two legs, had to be taught a lesson. Well, he was, and so was everybody else, including the British themselves. For one thing, they learned to their surprise that the depth of the sea on either side of the Isthmus of Perikop was only two or three feet. Hence the first British attempt to cut off the peninsula from the mainland by sea, as Hitler has now done by land, was impossible. So the Allied fleet landed further south at Eupatoria, being ceremoniously received by the governor who had no proper means of defense. Now Eupatoria is less than 50 miles north of Sevastopol, and Hitler's forces from now on may be following in the footsteps of the British, more or less. However, as the British generals, according to a British military historian, were mostly duffers, the Nazis probably won't make the same mistakes. According to the French general, the French general in that war, Con Robert, they went forward as though they were in Hyde Park. Incidentally, there was no cooperation between the Allies, who fought two actions side by side. Nevertheless, they won the Battle of Alma, after which that handsome bridge in Paris is named, and marched southward around the fortress instead of attacking it from the north. The reason for the mistake being that they had no maps. They then sat down to besiege it, and sat there for 11 solid months with a British right wing at Balaclava. At the beginning of the siege occurred one of the most heroic and most absurd incidents in British history, immortalized by Tennyson in the charge of the Light Brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. The grim truth of the matter is that the famous charge was a mistake. Lord Raglan had sent orders by his aide-de-camp, Nolan, to the Light Brigade to retake some Turkish guns. But Nolan was a cavalry fanatic and launched the attack in a different direction, right into the Russian artillery, the Valley of Death. And the horror and suffering of the winter that followed, chiefly because of ignorance of conditions, had only one relieving feature, the appearance of Florence Nightingale, the angel with the lamp, who created a new era in the care of the sick and wounded in war. In the end, the taking of Sevastopol settled nothing, although the Russians did sink their own fleet in the harbor, 
and Tsar Nicholas was so disgusted that he fell ill, refused to take ordinary curative measures, and died. The Allied generals were no less disgusted with the conduct of the war. They fell out over the proposal to take Kerch, the eastern Crimean base that Hitler's men are making for now. Finally, Kerch was taken, but Lord Raglan, the British commander, disappointed, also fell ill and died. In the Peace Treaty of Paris, the Russians had to agree not to keep a fleet in the Black Sea. However, this agreement went the way of all unilateral disarmaments. In 1870, when the powers were preoccupied with the Franco-Prussian War, Russia calmly renounced this clause of the treaty and built a new navy. They've had one in the Black Sea ever since. And ever since then, the Russians have continued with the Crimea as their base to control the Black Sea and to get possession of Constantinople and the Turkish Straits. That is, until the First World War. In 1878, they defeated the Turks and would have accomplished their aims except for another intervention of the powers. But that wasn't the end. Russia's rivalry with Austria and Germany for the control of the Balkans and the Black Sea was certainly one of the causes of the First World War. And after the war, the Russians would surely have had Constantinople and the Dardanelles. It was to have been their part of the spoils except for the Russian Revolution, which caused the Russians to renounce all imperialist dreams in Russia, in Europe. Today, the old question is once again a factor in the game. For Soviet Russia had resumed the old westward march along the Black Sea by taking Bessarabia from the Romanians last fall, and they were demanding at least joint control of the Dardanelles from Turkey soon after the signing of the Nazi-Soviet Pact but it's not yet clear whether they were demanding it as a measure of security against the Allies or against their own quasi-ally, Nazi Germany, who was soon to be their enemy. In any case, the Turks refused, and Hitler took his cue. For last spring, after the conquest of Greece, he secured the islands off the Dardanelles, thus cutting the Russians off from any possible aid by sea. One thing is certain. If the British fleet could pass the Straits today, as it did in 1854, and appear off the Crimea, not as a foe of Russia, but as a friend, the Caucasian oil fields and the whole Middle East would be safer than they are today. If Hitler succeeds in taking Sevastopol, he will be in command of a large part of the Black Sea, despite the fact that he has no Black Sea fleet of his own. Even with a small craft which he is assembling or borrowing in Romanian and Bulgarian ports, he could police the western half of the sea and escort his transports from Constanza and Odessa to Taganrog and beyond to reinforce his armies now invading the Caucasus region. And this would certainly facilitate the latest grand encircling maneuver his generals seem to be planning, flanking the Russian southern armies both from the north and the south. It would also help him in placing a strong force between the Russians in the Caucasus and the British and Iran. And it might also be the prelude to still vaster projects affecting the entire Middle East, involving not only the present belligerents, but Turkey, the keeper of the straits. Whichever way you look at it, the loss of the Crimea would be a tremendous setback for Soviet Russia and for the cause of the Allies in this war. It's well to remember, however, that in 1854, Sevastopol held out 11 months, that Odessa in this war held out for nearly three, and that Leningrad, with its naval base of Kronstadt, is still in Russian hands. Good night. You have been listening to Caesar Searchinger, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the American Historical Association. Next Sunday evening, Caesar Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. The story behind the headlines. In cooperation with the American Historical Association, we again present Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer in an informal analysis of the news. Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. Tonight, Mr. Searchinger's subject is New Zealand as our partner in Pacific defense. Caesar Searchinger. Good evening. The agitation for a Pacific War Council with headquarters in Washington has reached a new stage. The question was first raised by the Australian government some time ago when Prime Minister Curtin said that Australia looked to the United States for leadership in the Pacific War. Another phase of this Pacific defense problem was Australia's demand for representation in an imperial war cabinet in London, which has now reached its sequel in the appointment of Richard G. Casey, Australian minister in Washington, to the British War Cabinet as Minister of State. Since last weekend, there have been discussions at the White House with Dr. Herbert Evatt, the Australian Minister of External Affairs, who is now on a special mission to this country, 
and with Walter Nash, the recently appointed New Zealand minister in Washington. President Roosevelt afterwards spoke of the teamwork and contact between the three countries, meaning Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. By the end of the week, it seemed that the creation of a Pacific War Council was on the verge of formation, pending, of course, the expected concurrence of the British government. Behind these recent moves is the changed condition in the Pacific area. The old ABCD command, Australian, British, Chinese, Dutch, has, as the President put it, gone out of business with the fall of the Netherlands Indies. What forces the Dutch have left are merged with those of Australia. China is collaborating closely with the British forces in Burma, and its function in the Pacific area is now confined to its internal defence. British naval and land forces are fully occupied in other theatres of war, and General Wavell's headquarters have been moved to India. The Pacific area is therefore completely in the hands of the Pacific countries, Australia, New Zealand, and the USA. The arrival of General MacArthur in Australia, and the recent activities of the Japanese in that area, have focused our attention on that continent. But New Zealand is an equally vital factor in the strategy of the United Nations, so I'm going to say a few things about that. It is no less necessary to hold New Zealand as Australia itself. For if the Japanese were to land in New Zealand, they would be able to cut our communications with Australia, and they could outflank any offensive which we might launch against Japan. In such an offensive, New Zealand may become a secondary base of operations. Even now, Auckland and Wellington are chief termini of our Trans-Pacific supply lines. And New Zealand is, of course, an essential supply base especially as regards that most vital material of war, namely food. With its extensive farming, stock raising and dairying industries, it is capable of supplying not only its own forces, but those in Australia, if the need should arise. But it is clear that an island nation with less than one and three quarter million inhabitants cannot defend itself against invasion without outside aid. New Zealand has a standing army of about 30,000 men, plus a considerable home guard. When conscription was introduced in the summer of 1940, 80,000 New Zealanders had already volunteered for service overseas, 4,000 of them Maoris, the original New Zealand natives. By November, 20,000 of them were abroad, including a Maori battalion which earned undying fame in the defence of Crete. I shall tell you more about the Maoris later on. The number of men enlisted to date Prime Minister Peter Fraser told an NBC audience last Monday is equivalent to what a force of 11 million would be in the United States. However, in a nation of 1.7 million, that is less than 150,000. So while many New Zealanders are still fighting in other theatres of war, American soldiers are being sent to reinforce the defenders of New Zealand itself. That is a good thing in more ways than one. For in this way, a number of Americans are going to become acquainted with one of the most beautiful, salubrious, and socially advanced countries in the world, and one which embodies many of the best features of our own in miniature. The size of New Zealand is somewhat less than New England plus New York State. It consists of two rather narrow islands, North Island and South Island, stretching for about a thousand miles from northeast to southwest. They are approximately as far south of the equator as our Pacific coast is north of it. So in climate, you get something like Seattle at one end and something like Los Angeles at the other. In other words, ideal. The scenery of the country is spectacular, from steep snow-covered mountain ranges of over 10,000 feet, glaciers descend to within a quarter of a mile of the sea, in some places through the dense evergreen of a subtropical forest. It's a paradise for the big game fisherman and the mountain climber. Some parts of New Zealand have reminded people of Japan, and there is even a close rival to Fujiyama, the snow-capped cone of Mount Egmont. Yet there is much of the homely atmosphere characteristic of fertile, temperate countries that appeals to the romantic European. In this, as in other respects, New Zealand is very different from its nearest neighbour, Australia, about 1,300 miles away, which is a continent the size of the United States, a place of wide open spaces and much of it arid. But the contrasts go deeper than geography. Australia has long had a vigorous nationalism of its own. New Zealand still preserves a strong sentimental attachment for England. Even third-generation New Zealanders who have never been outside the country continue to speak of England as home. 
Australia, in spite of its enormous sheep raising industry, has become considerably industrialized in the last two decades. New Zealand still remains predominantly a country of farms and pastures. It has, in fact, been described as a kind of outlying dairy farm for Great Britain. There are also important historical and political differences between Australia and New Zealand. Australia has adopted a federal constitution based in many respects on our own. Consequently, it has six state governments as well as a federal government. New Zealand, though it formerly had provincial governments, abolished them and set up a single unitary government for the whole country. In other respects, however, their political institutions are similar. Both are self-governing dominions with a prime minister and a cabinet responsible to parliament. The British king is represented by a governor general whose functions are purely formal. The story of New Zealand's settlement is practically unique. It was the result of an idealist dream. In the early years of the 19th century, one Edward Gibbon Wakefield had a vision of solving England's social economic problems by a systematic overseas colonization. His idea was to transplant a replica of English society from the country squire and the urban capitalist to the farmhand, artisan and clerk to somewhere overseas. The enterprise was to be financed from the sale of land duly acquired from the natives. Christian benevolence and social enlightenment were to do the rest. After a preliminary experiment in South Australia, Wakefield's eye lighted on New Zealand, which Cook had once tried to annex for King George III. But the British government, still remembering all the trouble with the North American colonies, wasn't any more helpful to Wakefield than it had been to Captain Cook. Until, in, in 1840, a rival French settlement company was threatening to get ahead of the British. Thereupon, Queen Victoria's ministers gave their blessing and signed a treaty with the native Maori chiefs, which transferred sovereignty to the British crown. The Maoris had already been affected by Christianity, and it was their trust in the Christian missionaries that induced them to sign. Wakefield's dream to transplant a cross-section of English society didn't altogether come true. But his careful organization of the colonists has left a permanent mark. It facilitated the orderly settlement of the uncultivated land of the country. In consequence, New Zealand has always been much more a country of small individual farmers in contrast to the vast sheep and cattle ranches of Australia, in the early days at least. And the inspiration of Wakefield, the reformer, lives on today in the outstandingly progressive social legislation in which New Zealand has been a pioneer. It, has, it may be said to have had its New Deal about 50 years ago. In the 1890s, New Zealand's government established such things as old age pensions and widows' pensions, family allowances, government loans to homeowners, government-operated insurance companies, etc. Women's suffrage was adopted in New Zealand many years before here. And recently, under the Labour government, which came into power in 1935, there have been other important measures of social welfare, including the establishment of an all-embracing system of social security, including unemployment, health and old age, and medical care. As the result of its infant welfare program, New Zealand has the lowest rate of infant mortality in the world. Wealth in New Zealand is better distributed than in most countries. Real incomes of the lower middle classes, that is, incomes in terms of purchasing power, are on the average higher than those of corresponding groups in America. New Zealand is the youngest white man's country in the world. Up to 1840, it was inhabited not by primitive aborigines like Australia, but by a relatively cultured and decidedly warlike branch of the Polynesian race, the Maori. The Maoris migrated to New Zealand from somewhere in the central Pacific from five to six hundred years ago, in canoes, mind you, an incredible feat of seamanship. For centuries, they managed to resist white settlement, except for some missionaries in the north. All of the islands had been discovered by the Dutch navigator Tasman as far back as 1642. Although the white man did not settle in New Zealand till 200 years later, his treatment of the Maori uh, was only somewhat better than his treatment of the American Indian over here. It was the same old story of thousands of acres of valuable land turned over to the white settlers for a few guns or blankets. Though eventually the New Zealand government set up a land court to protect the Maori's remaining heritage. It was largely because of disputes over land that various Maori tribes embarked on fierce wars against the settlers in the 1860s. They fought with great skill and bravery. 
In one case, when the Maoris were surrounded and called upon to surrender, they sent out an envoy with a message which has since then become the motto of a New Zealand regiment. Ake, ake, kia, ka. We will fight on forever and ever. On one occasion, having taken the Christian teachings seriously, they actually stopped fighting on Sunday. And they felt bitterly betrayed when the British troops took advantage of this to launch an attack. In the days of fighting, the Maori warrior earned the respect and admiration of the British soldier. Today, every New Zealander has a genuine fondness for the Maori citizen. To have Maori blood in your veins is a distinction. After a period of decline, the Maoris have found their feet in the new order of things. Their numbers are increasing, and they share in the possession of the land and the nation's prosperity. Maoris sit in Parliament, some have risen to cabinet rank. The Maori soldier is as famous for his valour today as his forefather was. He has served the British Empire in the last war, and he is fighting for his country's democracy today. For there is no doubt in anybody's mind that New Zealand deserves the name of democracy as much as any country on earth, and the responsibility for defending it must naturally be shared by us. It is true that we in this country haven't been very conscious of this younger sister democracy across the seas. In peacetime, international relations are apt to be based very largely on trade, on export and import trade. And while we have sold five times as much to New Zealand as she has sold to us, a country of 1.7 million can absorb only just so much. Not till two months ago did the two countries think it worthwhile to exchange diplomatic envoys. But the eminence of these two men indicates how important these relations have suddenly become. New Zealand has sent us Peter Nash, the intellectual leader of the Labour Party, and until recently the dominating figure in the Cabinet. We have sent no less a person than Patrick J. Hurley, former Secretary of War. It's clear that New Zealand's importance in the world struggle cannot be measured by her size alone. If we are to have a Pacific Council, War Council, New Zealand is as indispensable in it as Australia and the United States. And when we consider the principles involved in this war, New Zealand stands out as a shining example of all the things we are fighting for, genuine dynamic democracy and the freedom of man. Good night. You've been listening to Caesar Sechinger, whom we presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association. Next Sunday evening, Caesar Sechinger will be back with another story behind the headline. The story behind the headlines. In cooperation with the American Historical Association, we again present Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer, in an informal analysis of the news. Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is What's Happening on Guadalcanal. Mr. Good Searchinger. Good evening. It looks as though Guadalcanal were to become a historic name. Ever since the U.S. Marines landed on this jungle-clad island in the Southern Solomons Group early last August, it has been singled out for special attention by our enemies. It now promises to become the center of a major operation which may determine the course of the Pacific War. After weeks of preliminary attempts and setbacks on land, on sea, and in the air, the Japanese sent a fleet to the north of Guadalcanal which heavily bombarded our airfield and marine installations during the night from Tuesday to Wednesday this week. On Thursday, they were landing fairly large contingents of troops under the cover of their guns to the west of the territory held by our men. It now looks as though this is part of a full-scale offensive with the purpose of driving us out. During a previous attempt to land troops last Sunday night and Monday, the Japanese are said to have lost a heavy cruiser, four destroyers, and a transport. Three further cruisers and several other vessels hit tonight by U.S. Army bombers may also be lost. This brings their losses in this area up to well over 40 sh ships in the last two months, an investment which the Japs have evidently not made just for the sake of saving face. The landing of the U.S. Marines on the Solomon Islands on August 7 to 8 was the first offensive action of the United Nations in the Pacific and the first reconquest of enemy-held territory. The importance of this southern outpost of Japanese power is only beginning now to be generally understood. 
By the capture of Tulagi, parts of Guadalcanal and other islands, we have established an outpost well in advance of our defense line, running all the way from Alaska to Australia. The cost of this outpost to us in terms of naval losses was high, as the Navy disclosed early only this week, over two months after the event. For in the, pro in the operations covering our landings, we lost no less than four U.S. cruisers, besides the cruiser Canberra, pride of the Australian Navy, the loss of which was announced at the time. These ships were standing by, screening the landing operations of the U.S. Marines on Guadalcanal, Tulagi, and five other tiny islands. They were attacked by a swift-moving column of Japanese ships sweeping round Savo Island, eight miles offshore, firing as they went. But it was a hit-and-run affair. The Jap ships disappeared as quickly as they came and never really got within range of our transports and landing barges. The landing operations were completed within 48 hours, and by the fourth day, August 10th, the Marines had overcome all opposition on Tulagi and the small neighboring islands. On Guadalcanal, a much larger island, about the size of Long Island, lying some 20-odd miles further south, the problem was more complicated. The Marines took possession of a small grassy plain on the north coast, where the Japs had been building an airfield. It would be about the only possible airfield in the southern Solomons, which are steeply mountainous. Together with Tulagi Harbor, across only 22 miles of water, it would make a strong naval and air base dominating the whole region. It would have been the terminal stronghold of the Japanese conquest at its farthest south. What we did was to go in and take that stronghold before the airfield was finished. The airfield then became the key to our position in the Solomons. But our men occupied no more than a strip of coastal territory about five miles long and running back to the wooded hills. Somewhere in those hills, in the jungle-clad plains to the east, were the remnants of the Japanese occupying force, living off coconuts. And they weren't left alone for long. While Japanese surface vessels, submarines and aircraft continued to raid our positions, small parties managed to land and melt into the jungle to join their comrades at concealed bases. On August 20th, 700 Japs suddenly rushed up to the coast in speedboats. All but 30 were killed, the rest captured. All through September, the attacks continued. During the day, our bombers would range far and wide looking for Japanese ships and blasting Jap installations in the whole Solomon's area. But during the night, fast Japanese destroyers would close in, strike, land reinforcements and sneak away. The Marines were kept busy hunting down these reinforcements as well as stalking the patrols sent out from the Japanese bases at night. In the night of September 12th to 13th, the reinforced Japs though devoid of heavy equipment, attacked, while large fleets of Jap bombers and fighters bombed our positions. The Japs were defeated and driven back into the jungle. But their patrols kept coming back, and pretty soon our flyers spotted Japanese transports duly escorted in the surrounding seas. The engagement last Sunday night, when the Japs lost six ships, was the result. Despite these losses, other Jap ships came back, indicating that a large fleet concentration was supporting the action from somewhere nearby. This time, they were able to land strong reinforcements, as well as guns, within shelling distance to the west of our camp, while our Navy was evidently not there to intercept. However, no full-scale fighting has yet taken place up to the Navy's communique issued, issued last night. Our Marines, we are told, have been reinforced from army bases in New Caledonia, the New Hebrides, and the Fiji Islands, presumably by air. Their position is not easy, I mean the position of the Marines, for they are liable to attack from at least two sides, as well as from the sea, unless we have naval forces in the neighborhood strong enough to beat off the Japanese ships. In the end, the mastery of the Solomon's Islands will be decided by the relative strength of opposing naval and air forces which may even now be gathering for a clash. Seen in the perspective of the whole Pacific War, this Battle of the Solomons, like the struggle in the mountains of New Guinea and the air attacks in the fog-bound Aleutians, is a phase of what Hanson Baldwin calls the Battle of the Outposts. After the turbulent months of the great Japanese offensive 
and the long drawn out effort of building up our supply lines to New Zealand and Australia, the two opposing sides have settled down behind something like two enormous lines of defense. The Japanese line reaches from Kamchatka in the icy north to New Guinea way below the equator in the south. The American line runs from Nome, Alaska, through Dutch Harbor, Hawaii, Samoa, and New Caledonia to the Australian coast. Each side has pushed forward its steely tentacles to certain advanced points. The Japanese to Kiska, to Wake, the Marshall, Gilbert, and Solomon Islands. The Americans to the Adrianoff Islands in the Aleutians, to Midway, and to the southeastern Solomons, to Lagi and Guadalcanal. These are the points of contact whenever there is fighting, which is usually swift and fierce. The forces engaged are relatively not large, but they represent the spearheads of two opposing fronts stretching over thousands of miles through the vast Pacific space. So great are the distances, so far are the points of contact from any home base that the vast majority of ships and planes and men are employed, employed in maintaining and protecting the lines of supply. Besides, the island battlefields are so small, so difficult in terrain, and so scattered that only few soldiers are likely to get into action at any one time. But they nevertheless represent the enormous naval and military powers which make it possible to project the spearheads so far from home. To all intents and purposes, then, the tiny Solomon Plains and the New Guinea mountain trails today are the main focal points of the Great Pacific Front. The events of this week indicate that the Japanese are making this the ma a main theater of war. In New Guinea, it is true, they have been forced to retreat across the Owen Stanley Range, probably because Allied air power has destroyed their communications and their base. But this is not the first time the Japanese have been forced to give up their advance towards Port Moresby, only to reappear on another trail. The Japanese positions on New Guinea support the right flank of their action in the Solomons. They cannot afford to give up either. For if they lost New Guinea and the Solomons, they would open the way to a two-pronged offensive by the United Nations from the east and eventually from the west. On the other hand, the capture of Port Moresby and the recapture of the southern Solomons are indispensable to the Japanese if they wish to consolidate their vast conquests to the north and east. For after all, the Japanese now have an enormous new empire to defend. This conquered area, if we include Thailand, stretches from Indochina to the borders of India and from the Philippines to New Guinea. It is a continental and island area of over two million square miles, more than half the size of the United States, with a population roughly equal to that of the United States. This does not include any part of China. By the conquest of the Chinese maritime regions, Japan has linked that empire to her earlier conquests of Manchuria and Korea and to the Japanese islands. This is, after all, the so-called co-prosperity sphere for which Japan claims to have gone to war. She holds it together very largely by means of her naval supremacy in the Western Pacific, a supremacy which is bound to be challenged sooner or later by ourselves and our allies. However, this challenge is not likely to materialize for some time. Aside from this, the Japanese Empire is vulnerable from three directions, from Vladivostok and Siberian bases in the north, from the Indo-Burmese frontier in the west, and from Australia in the south. Let's see which is the most imminent of these threats. The first, from Siberia, will not become an actuality unless war breaks out between Russia and Japan. Some time ago, when Japan was moving troops from southwestern China to the north, it looked as though she might have been getting ready for the long-discussed stab in the back. But the heroic stand of the Red Army at Stalingrad and on the Volga has probably not increased the Japanese zest for the job. The second threat from India is certainly on the cards, for sooner or later the Japs will have to be expelled from Burma if China is to be freed from her semi-isolation. Allied land and air power in India are steadily growing. But the mountains between India and Burma present appalling difficulties to the British as well as to the Japs. So the threat from that direction will probably not be serious until Anglo-American naval strengths are overwhelming in the Bay of Bengal. By the process of elimination, we come to the fourth threat against the Japanese. 
from the southwest Pacific. Here the tension has been rising ever since the aforesaid invasion of the Solomon Islands by the United States. It is the most immediate threat the Japanese have to face from any direction at the present time. That is what gives the action on Guadalcanal its importance in the global war. The events in the Solomons, in New Guinea, the situation on the Indian border, and in the Siberian Far East, and the brutal struggle in the streets of Stalingrad are all part of the same pattern. Whatever may be the final outcome of that historic battle of Stalingrad, this much can already be said. Russia is not beaten to earth this year any more than she was beaten to earth last year when Hitler and his propaganda chief solemnly announced that she was. Last year, when he failed to take Moscow, Hitler was able to minimize his failure by pulling a large rabbit out of his hat, the entry of Japan into the war. This time the magician's hat is empty and the Japanese rabbit is running around on his own. Instead of the one totalitarian war of the Axis, we still have two separate and distinct wars. What the Japanese are concerned with, apparently, is not is the problem of holding what they have in the Pacific while Hitler prepares to hold what he has in the West. Both Hitler and his partner appear to be entering a war of position, whether they like it or not. That does not mean that they are on the defensive and that the offensive has passed to us. But Japan at least has lost one of the large strategic advantages she had ten months ago. She is forced to fight, not in order to advance, but in order to be able to stay where she is. She is using her forces not to conquer, but to hold. Even if she succeeds on Guadalcanal, she has lost time, men, ships, and resources to keep what she already had six months ago. And she can less afford to lose ships and resources than we. To grasp the offensive <clears throat> against incalculable odds is the job of the United Nations in 1943. Our action in the Solomons is a modest indication of what is to come. Good night. You've been listening to Caesar Searchinger, whom we've presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. In cooperation with the American Historical Association, we again present Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer, in an informal analysis of the news. Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is Russia's Winter Offensive Number 2. Mr. Searchinger. Good evening. The sensation of the week was the Russian war communique concerning the winter offensive on the Volga and the Don. Released on New Year's Eve, it came as a fillip to New Year's celebrations all over the world. Added to this summary of Russian victories was yesterday's news of the recapture of Veliki Luki, one of the famous strong points on the Central Front, and today's announcement of the retaking of Mozdok, deep in the Caucasus. All this calls for cool analysis and a warning not to let our optimism get out of hand. As the winter offensive runs into its seventh week, we see that it has already accomplished much, and that the results are far from decisive as yet. A great deal has been said about encirclement, about trapping the Nazi armies, not only before Stalingrad, but in the Caucasus. But it must be remembered that no army is decisively beaten until it surrenders, nor does it cease to be a danger until it is destroyed. No German army in the present offensive has yet surrendered, and the armies which are said to have been routed are still in the field. However, according to the Russian communique, over 300,000 men and officers have been killed or taken prisoner. This alone is an important victory in the war of attrition, which has already begun, and it is without precedent for the Russian side in the present war. The Russian communique helps us to clear up a rather confusing picture. Hitherto, it has been difficult to follow the campaign, although the outlines of the Don Volga region are pretty familiar by now. There is the long line of the lower Volga centering out Stalingrad, and further west, the wide sweep of the Don, that enormous elbow pointing eastward towards the long contested Volga city. For months, the area between the two rivers, at one point only 50 miles wide, has been the bloodiest battlefield of the war. We must bear firmly in mind the picture of this German salient, 
reaching right into Stalingrad and to the Volga Bank, the high watermark of the Nazi Eastwood Drive. Six weeks ago, the Russians launched a typical pincers movement with fresh armies striking fiercely at the roots and sides of this Stalingrad wedge. The Russian pincers, starting northwest and southwest of Stalingrad, reached the banks of the Don, pushing towards their bite and virtually encircling 22 Axis divisions or upwards of 200,000 troops. It would, however, be slightly inaccurate to say that this Axis army was trapped. To trap or contain an army so that it can be wiped out afterwards would require a surrounding army at least double the size, say 45 divisions. The Russians evidently could not concentrate such an overwhelming mass and still continue offensive operations elsewhere as they did. The Germans have moreover transfer transformed the so-called trap into one of their famous hedgehogs, fortified areas which are very difficult to reduce. This in part explains why the Nazis still managed to hang on in the blockhouses of Stalingrad itself. So much for the Stalingrad encirclement, which the Russian communique describes as the first stage of the offensive. The second stage began on December 16th, with an attack across the Middle Don on a 40-mile front, about 175 miles west of Stalingrad. This drive smashed south and southwestward into the rear of the German forces inside the Don Elbow. It advanced from 90 to 125 miles at different points, and bypassed the town of Milorovo on both sides. Milorovo is not only an important German supply depot, but the junction of two main railroad lines, from east to west and from north to south. These railroads connect key centers like Rostov and Kharkov, both of which must be major Russian objectives if the offensive is to accomplish its main purpose. But these places are still respectively 100 and 150 miles beyond the Russian spearheads, and Milorova itself is still in German hands. The third stage of the Russian offensive, simultaneous with the second, was and is a drive to the southwest of Stalingrad along the main railroad connecting Stalingrad with Rostov and the Black Sea. It was the cutting of this railroad, you'll remember, by the Nazis that started their drive into the Caucasus last July. About last Wednesday, the Russians retook Kotelnikov, an important station on this railroad about 90 miles down the line. They have now reached a point about halfway between Stalingrad and Rostov. Meanwhile, they have begun to push other spearheads straight south into the Kalmyk steppes in an effort to drive the Germans out of the northern, northern Caucasus area. They have now reached and taken the Kalmyk capital of Elista and have captured a significantly large number of trucks this is an almost roadless, desolate region inhabited till recently by nomad tribes. Altogether, the Great Winter Offensive has liberated over a thousand towns and villages, regained large stretches of territory, and netted enormous amounts of booty. More important, perhaps, is the capture of Nazi communications. Both the main railroads to Stalingrad have been cut, and so has one of the lateral lines. So far, this does not, however, sufficiently disrupt the German supply system, which depends to a large extent on trucks, many of them with caterpillar treads for cross-country work. Here is another reason why the encircled German armies are not entirely isolated as yet, and why islands of German resistance are likely to be difficult to destroy. Last year, on the Central Russian Front, the Germans successfully supplied their beleaguered forces notably at Staraya Russa, by air. This year, the beleaguered Stalingrad hedgehog is said to be relying more and more on air transport for food. This may prove far more difficult since an increasing part of the Nazis' air strength is now needed in North Africa. It is still too early to estimate the full value of the Russian offensive to date, but it already presents some interesting contrasts with the winter offensive of last year. That offensive was simply a frontal attack along the line of least resistance against a retreating enemy. The present one is a strategic movement against an enemy who means to stay put. Last year, the Russians pushed back the German armies, regaining chunks of territory all along the 2,000-mile front. 
Much of that territory, in fact, was more or less willingly abandoned by the Germans, except for that famous chain of strong points, or hedgehogs, including Veliki Luki, Staraya Russa, Rzhev, Vyazma, and Aurel. The present offensive, however, is, a sim- is not a simple push, but a well-planned, intricate strategic operation on the grand scale. It comprises a series of pincers movements and spearhead thrusts into the German flanks. It is designed to cut off large areas, envelop strong forces, and cut supply lines at critical points. In short, this time the Russians are not interested in taking back strips of land, but in reconquering whole provinces and annihilating the invading armies. The Russian tactics, too, are different this year. They've been using mobile artillery with great effect, at direct firing range, and a large number of excellent tanks. These they've been accumulating all summer and all fall, holding them back while waiting for the big push, a remarkable example of confident leadership for the retreating Red Armies were taking terrific punishment all the time. The Russians are also advancing at much greater speed this year. This is important, for much depends on their ability to take the German strong points quickly, so they can move on to the ultimate goals. Their principal goal in the southern offensive is, of course, to drive the Nazis from the Caucasus and the eastern Ukraine. The Nazi invasion of the Caucasus has been likened to a grasping arm into the store cupboard past a sliding door of heavy steel. Its success depended on whether there was someone strong enough to put a shoulder against the door and make it move. Well, the door has begun to move, but it's still far from being shut. Not only is there still a gap of a hundred miles, but those hundred miles those last hundred miles will be the hardest. The Germans will do their utmost to keep that door from sliding shut. But the Russians appear to be out for more. They are aiming to undermine the German positions all along the line from Leningrad to the Caucasus Mountains and the Black Sea. To do that means finding a way to crack those aforementioned strong points or centers of resistance that the Germans have established all along the front. These so-called hedgehogs with bristles represented by pillboxes, blockhouses, and multilateral interlocking fire points, have in most cases defied the most violent mass assaults. The Russians succeeded in reducing one of these hedgehogs, Mojaisk, last winter, after one of the fiercest artillery duels of the war. More recently, they failed at Staraya Russa, despite complete encirclement and concentric attack. Rzhev, too, has resisted periodical attacks for nearly a year. That is why the capture of Eliki Luki must rank as one of the few really conclusive victories of the Russian war, for it was one of the key hedgehog positions of the Nazi front. This may mean that the Russians have found their answer to the new form of German defensive warfare, just as General Montgomery found his answer to Rommel's version of it at El Alamein. The conditions on the two fronts are radically different, of course. In Russia, the intervening spaces are defended by mobile troops. In the shelterless desert of Egypt, deep minefields played an important role. Montgomery cracked Rommel's defense in depth by the use of direct artillery fire and infantry, opening a path for tanks, thus reversing the Blitzkrieg pattern of armored attack. We do not yet know the Russians' method, Russian methods in detail. It might be useful to learn them, for conditions in Tunisia are similar in some respects to Russia. Here, the Germans managed to construct a defensive system near Bizet and Tunis, which threw General Anderson's army back within 20 miles of its goal. We are witnessing the latest phase of that perennial contest between the merits of attack and defense, which makes up an interesting part of the history of war. The War of 1914 became a three years stalemate because the defense, thanks to trenches, machine guns, and barbed wire, had become stronger than the attack. At the outset of the present war, the Germans were able to restore the war of movement by the use of fast tanks in conjunction with dive bombers and motorized infantry, and so attack regained the upper hand. But when the Germans were unable to knock out the Russian army in a single Blitzkrieg campaign, 
they in their turn had to devise a new and stronger system of defense. This hedgehog system has proved a fairly effective antidote to armored and motorized attack. Apparently, the Allies are now beginning to master this system by tactics of their own. Summing up, the Russian achievements are certainly impressive. Between them and conclusive success stand great difficulties due to the necessity of holding a 2,000-mile front and breaking strong points of resistance all along that front. But all the while, the Russians are weakening the Axis striking power. They are keeping Hitler from arresting his reserves during the winter months. They are preventing him from undertaking any really radical countermeasures to our opening of the North African front, such as an attack through Spain, for instance. They are complicating his problem of what the experts call logistics, or bringing men and material to bear on strategic points. For, as we increase our forces in Tunisia, Hitler must increase, increase his. And so long as the Russians retain the initiative, these reinforcements cannot be taken from the Eastern Front. These Axis difficulties are bound to increase, but it would be foolish to believe that they, are, that they have reached a critical stage. For the moment, we must not look for quick, sensational results. The stakes in Russia and Tunisia are enormous, and decisions will therefore be contested with ferocious will. We must not be fooled into thinking that victory is near. The hard work has hardly begun. Good night. You have been listening to Caesar Searchinger, whom we've presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association. The story behind the headlines is a public service feature and has originated in New York. This is the National Broadcasting. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday night at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his historical analysis of outstanding news events. Here is Caesar Searchinger. Good evening. The news tonight is the most momentous since the tide of war has turned in favor of the Allies. Benito Mussolini, hitherto known as Il Duce, the man who is never wrong, has been dismissed by King Emmanuel and Marshal Pietro Bodoglio, the 71-year-old soldier dismissed by Mussolini in 1940, has been appointed premier in his place. This is the immediate and interim solution of a political crisis which has gripped Italy for the past two weeks or more. It is the immediate result of the sensational success of the Allied arms in Sicily, and it comes as the climax of a series of events which indicated that big things were in the wind the Churchill Roosevelt appealed to the Italian people to overthrow the fascist regime. The meeting of Mussolini and Hitler last Monday. Monday. The bombing of Rome. The long harangue of Carlo Scorza, the fascist party boss, which now may turn out to be the swan song of Italian fascism. And now, the sudden fall of Palermo, where the people have acclaimed our troops with joy and jubilation. As a result of this last Allied victory, mm. it is reliably reported Riots broke out all over Italy, during which the people shouted for peace. The King's proclamation, long expected and twice postponed, may have been hastened by this threat of open revolt. For Badoglio, in his own proclamation, following that of the King, has threatened that whoever should attempt to disturb the public order will be ruthlessly prepared. And this far, he, the King, has assumed the high command of the entire armed forces. <laughs> Thus, he eliminates Mussolini, who under fascist law was Marshal of Italy jointly with the King. He also says that no consideration must stand in our way and no recriminations must be made. This is an attempt to head off anti-fascist vengeance. We must stand against those who have wounded the sacred soil of Italy. We shall have to consider just what these words are intended to mean, beyond the fact that they are the obvious rhetoric of despair. Today, more than ever, says the King, I am indissolubly united to you in an unshakable faith in the immortality of our country. This, of course, is the big bid for the continuation of the House of Savoy on Italy's throne. Now, in the studio with me tonight, I have Mr. H. V. Kaltenborn and W. W. Chaplin, both of whom know Italy well and will give us their views on the big news. I might add that the three of us have worked in Italy and have all had interviews with Mussolini at different times. Then we shall also call in Robertson John in our Washington newsroom to get reactions, if any, in the national capital tonight. Now, first, uh, Mr. Cottenborn, do you think that this is the end of the fascist regime? Well, tonight, for the first time in more than 20 years, 
the fascist radio signed off without the fascist hymn. And the date of the King's proclamation was 1943 instead of in the 22nd year of fascism, which means that Italy's four million fascists find themselves tonight without their fascist leaders and deprived of their fascist jobs. Some of them will be permitted, as in conquered Sicily, to continue in service. But it will be a servant of the king. Italian fascism has failed. Italian fascism is dead. 73-year-old Victor Emmanuel does represent the continuing constitutional tradition of the United Italian Kingdom that was born in the same year as Marshal Badoglio. He is a center of loyalty and a pillar of the past. Together with Marshal Badoglio in the Italian army, he represents a force that should preserve Italy from anarchy on one condition, that the war ends without delay. Note this, there is not a phrase in the King's or in Badoglio's proclamation that suggests either the wish or the intention to continue the war. Badoglio's statement, the war continues, is incomplete. He and the King would have made the sentence read, the war continues until we find some way of ending it if Hitler's soldiers were not in Italy. For in neither proclamation is there any reference to the Axis, to Germany, to Hitler, or to the fascist party. And Dr. Goebbels, master of ingenious propaganda explanations of untoward events, can do no better tonight than to tell us that Mussolini resigned because he was sick. The king's sentence, Italy will find again the road to the future, means that Italy is looking for a road in which her destiny will again be her own and no longer subordinated to that of Nazi Germany. Already, the Italian Navy has refused to fight. The Italian Air Force has been an entity since we invaded Sicily. The Italian Army in Sicily has surrendered without a fight. If peace negotiations between the Allies and the new Italian government have not preceded today's events, they will soon follow it. For two months past, Spain has been putting out peace dealers with Italian tolerance. Mussolini appointed Count Ciano, his son-in-law, as Italian ambassador to the Vatican with the idea that he would be useful in negotiating peace. The sequence of events is clear. The quick contest conquest of Sicily shattered Italian morale to the point that Il Duce felt the end was near. He made one last vain appeal for help to Hitler on Monday when they met briefly and unhappily in northern Italy. He failed on the day Rome was bombed. He returned to Rome, resigned to his doom. The Nazis, with brutal realism, have written Italy off as an asset. Italy is now a handicap, and Hitler will waste no more German soldiers in her defense. The Germans may fight delaying actions, they may even hold northern Italy long enough to assure the destruction of the industrial areas. But peace with Italy is definitely on the way. We will soon be able to move freely across southern Italy to the Balkans, and from Sicily to Sardinia and Corsica. All occupied Europe begins to breathe more freely tonight. One dictator has gone, the other will soon follow. Well, I hope you're right, H.V. And now, Bill Chaplin, you know both Mussolini and Vidalio. Suppose you give us a personal angle on this story. Well, Mussolini cracked under the strain of Allied invasion, I think, because he just didn't have the stamina to practice what he preached. I worked as a reporter in Italy and the Italian ex-empire from 1934 to 36. Many times I listened to Mussolini addressing his people, and always he worked in the same old gag. It is better, he always told them, to live one day as a lion than a hundred years as a lamb. But when the big test came, he decided that such dangerous living might be all right for the common people. But for Mussolini, he apparently decided there was no call to live even one day as a lion. It was enough for him just to live period. Now, Badoglio was another kind of man. He joined the Royal Italian Army as soon as he was old enough to get a commission. He was a young general in the First World War, and he was Italy's military representative at the peace conference. At the age of 50, he was Marshal of Italy. Not an air marshal, such as Mussolini later made Italo Balbo, not a field marshal, such as Mussolini still later made the turncoat generals Graziani and De Bono. He was Marshal of Italy, top man in the Royal Army, Navy, and Air Force. It was as Marshal of Italy that he appealed to King Victor Emmanuel 21 years ago to give him one regiment to disperse the fascist rabble, as he called them, then marching on Rome, while Mussolini waited back in Milan to see how it turned out. 
He didn't even ask for combat troops. He asked for carabinieri, the military police traditionally used for civilian riot duty. The king said no and summoned Mussolini to Rome. But Badoglio always scorned the black shirt of fascism. I first got to know Badoglio well soon after the Italian invasion of Ethiopia was begun in 1935. I went down the Red Sea on a troop ship as a war correspondent accredited to the Italian army. And Badoglio was aboard to find out why the Italian armies with all modern equipment weren't making any headway against the Ethiopians, whose ammunition by and large didn't even fit their guns. Little goat-bearded De Bono was in charge on the northern front in Eritrea. De Bono was one of Mussolini's quadrumvirate who led the march on Rome. De Bono had been a general in the Royal Army, but he had marched against the king he served. He helped lead the rabble that Badoglio had wanted to disperse. Thanks, Blue Chaplain, and now we'll have to call in Robertson John from Washington. Come in, Robertson John. Mussolini's downfall did not take Washington as much by surprise as it did the rest of the country. Officialdom here has always considered Italy the vulnerable partner in the Axis. Long ago, plans were drawn up for what would be done if and when Italy should collapse. Tonight, in that vast War Department structure called the Pentagon Building on the edge of Washington, military men are poring over plans which they had stored in steel safes. One of these plans is for use when Italy shows signs of crumbling, as it has today, and the commanders-in-chief decide a little added pressure in a military way would finish the job. Another of these plans was drawn up for use when Italy does collapse. Both plans are being studied intently tonight. And other departments of the government are studying other phases of the situation, principally what we must do for Italy when Italy does get out of the war. Even though the Italians have been fighting against us, 50 million people can't be left to starve. We can't have chaos behind our front lines as we press on against Germany. And so tonight, here in Washington, experts are studying plans long ago drawn up for supplying Italy with coal, wheat, cotton, fertilizer, lumber, all those items Italy is now getting from Hitler. All those items she must have to keep going. Of course, some of them, like coal, will eventually be supplied by Britain. On the other hand, the experts tell me that Italy will be able to supply our army with considerable foodstuff, like fruit, vegetables, oil, cheese. I asked one of the experts tonight if it might be possible to use Italian munitions plants to turn out war material for our army after we take over Italy. He shook his head and said, not on any large scale. Hitler has been sending Italy a million tons of coal a month to keep our war plants going, and also a lot of steel, iron, copper, and rubber. It will be easier for us to continue to ship over finished products rather than ship over the raw material and have Italians turn out the weapons for us. By the way, I said Washington was not taken completely by surprise, but I'm sure that President Roosevelt himself had no idea the break was going to come so soon. I was standing in front of his desk on Friday when some other newsman asked him if there had been any reaction yet to his recent plea to the Italian people to throw out their fascist leaders. He shook his head. He half frowned as he indicated that it was much too soon to expect anything to happen. None of us has seen the president tonight, but I imagine as he sits right now in the White House reading the latest dispatches with a smile on his face. For the curtain has fallen tonight on the first act in a grim drama of war called the collapse of Italy. And right now in that beleaguered country shaped like a boot, another act may be beginning. The people I've talked to tonight in Washington are in agreement with what Vice President Wallace said earlier in the evening. It won't be long now for Italy. And now I switch you back to Caesar Searchinger in our New York newsroom. Thank you. Now, uh, H.B., uh, they say that Washington isn't very much surprised about this. Uh, did you hear that Badalio was supposed to be outside of Italy and uh, Roma even had him at one time in Washington? You think that... Yes, had him in Washington and had him in North Africa. Well, obviously, Washington likes to pretend that it's not surprised by events which do surprise it. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a hint from Washington or in Washington that this was going to happen. I don't take much stock in this business. We are not surprised. Well, they something... were surprised, all right. It came much more quickly than anyone had supposed. Well, I suppose that's right. But some people have been saying that uh, this man, Badoglio, would be the ideal man for the role of an Italian Dalai. What do you think about that, Bill? 
I think the Victorio is the best man they could possibly have chosen at the present time because, above all, he is an honest man. He's an honorable man. And if the Italians want anyone now who can take charge of their army so that when they make peace, when they ask for surrender and give us unconditional surrender, we'll know that there's no trickery in it. We can accept it. But you, you, you then think that there's any chance of the House of Savoy not continuing as uh, on the throne? No, as I indicated, I believe that the House of Savoy represents the enduring tradition of United Italy. And I see no reason why that tradition should be contrary to the democratic tradition. So I almost hope that the House of Savoy, for the time being, will remain. Well, I hope so too, but there is nevertheless a strong Republican movement in Italy, and we have to take account of that, don't you think? Yes. We can't decide it here tonight, so this is all we can give you on the subject of Italy tonight. Good night. Tonight you've heard a discussion by NBC commentators Caesar Searchinger, H.V. Colton Vaughan, W.W. Chaplin, and Robert St. John from Washington. This program came to you from Washington and New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Saturday at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his historical analysis of outstanding news events and major trends in world affairs. Today, Mr. Searchinger's subject is Cairo and Tehran. Caesar Searchinger. Good afternoon, everybody. The Roosevelt Churchill John Kaiseck Conference at Cairo was the eighth official meeting of Allied leaders since the attack on Pearl Harbor, which occurred just two years ago, lacking three days. The Roosevelt Churchill Stalin Conference, which has now definitely taken place at Tehran, is the ninth. If we include the visit of Mr. Churchill to Moscow in the fall of 1942, we have a record of ten inter-allied or United Nations conferences, which, like so many milestones, mark the progress of the war against the Axis powers. The Prime Minister will have attended nine, President Roosevelt eight, Marshal Stalin, two, and President Chiang Kai-shek, one. In these last two conferences in Egypt and Iran, we have seen the joint supreme leadership of the war, as distinct from the separate national leaderships, broaden from the big two to the big four. For although Stalin and Chiang have not yet formally taken part in one and the same conference, they have sat in on each other by proxy, and their personal meeting is postponed merely because the war is still divided into two areas, west and east. But it's clear from the decisions taken at Cairo that Stalin must have been consulted in advance. As I look at the mental picture of the big four who, as far as we can now see, will shape the post-war world, a contrasting picture of a somewhat lesser big four flashes across my mind. That is the picture of Chamberlain, Hitler, Mussolini and Daladier at Munich in 1938, blithely arranging for what we were told was peace in our time. I'm also reminded of a cartoon which appeared at the time in the London press. It was by that astute and sometimes prophetic artist, David Lowe. It pictured the four men, two dictators and two prime ministers, sitting round the table, settling the fate of the world. And in the background stood the peasant-like figure of Joseph Stalin in top boots, stroking his moustache with a sardonic smile and saying, What? No chair for me? I've kept that cartoon all these five years, just to see how it would look at some such date as today. For today, Joe Stalin is not only one of the bigger big four, but in some respects, the key man. The very idea of any of us five years ago, looking upon those four puny Europeans as the big four of the world, strikes us as ludicrous today. How could anyone think that their decisions could have any lasting validity, decisions taken without consulting two of the most powerful nations in the world? Well... In that particular respect, the world has learned its lesson. Today, at any rate, we include not only Russia and the United States, but China. For China, with its almost 500 million people, is potentially one of the really great powers of the world. Anyone with a flair for history may conjure up another comparison. For there was an even earlier Big Four that held the fate of the world in its hands at the end of the First World War. It consisted of President Wilson and Premiers Lloyd George, Orlando, and Clemenceau. That big four constituted itself the Supreme Council at the Conference of Versailles and proceeded to make all the important decisions regarding the peace terms to be imposed on the Central Powers. 
But pretty soon, one of the four, the Italian Premier Orlando, left the conference in a huff because Woodrow Wilson had appealed to the Italian people over his head. And thereafter, the decisions were taken not by the big four, but the big three. Clemenceau, nicknamed the Tiger because of his ferocious fighting qualities in debate, Lloyd George, the nimble-minded realist and compromiser, and Wilson, the evangelist of world unity and peace. The diversity of their characters and interests made it certain that the Treaty of Versailles would be a hodgepodge of idealism, vindictiveness, and political expediency, something that would satisfy nobody and settle nothing for long. Marshal Foch, commenting on the situation, said this, Let the armies stand at ease. The war is postponed for 20 years. That was in 1919. War broke out again in 1939. 20 years. Now, some say the peace didn't last because it was too soft. Some say it was too harsh. Whether it was too soft or too harsh, it failed. Why? Because it did not correspond to reality, to the inexorable laws of gravity and force. Russia was excluded in advance. Then the United States withdrew into its isolationist shell. The big three became the big two, Britain and France, and they eventually ceased to agree, setting out in search of new partners or friends. In any case, they did not represent the peoples of the world any better than those ridiculous Big Four that were to meet at Munich in 1938. The Big Four of today certainly do represent the great powers, the mightiest physical forces in the world, actual and potential, now and after the war. Whether they represent truly and fully the great moral forces of the world, the aspirations of the great and little nations, the hopes and dreams of the little men all over the world, only the future can reveal. When we first read the Atlantic Charter in August 1941, the idealists among us were thrilled. It had some of the old Wilsonian ring. It stirred anew the hopes of a better world. It promised not merely retribution, but justice, justice for all in this erring world. Today, much of that crusading spirit has given way to a new short-range realism. Wrongs are still to be righted, but they are chiefly the wrongs of our enemies, back to a carefully chosen date. If, for instance, we read the Cairo Declaration carefully, we find that Japan is to be punished for her aggressions and stripped of all the territories she occupied since 1895. That includes the formerly independent Kingdom of Korea, annexed by Japan in 1910. It includes the Kwandung Peninsula, seized in 1898. It includes Manchuria, with its almost 40 million people, subjugated by Japan since 1931. And, of course, it includes the hundreds of Pacific islands entrusted to Japan by the League of Nations as mandated territories after the First World War. Above all, it includes all the Chinese territories occupied during the First World War and overrun during the present war. But nothing is said about the former Chinese territories seized by other countries back to 1842, such as Indochina and Hong Kong. Nothing is said, moreover, about the vast territories of the Netherlands Indies, some of whose populations are as ripe for self-government as are the Philippines. And nothing is said about the South Pacific Islands that were German before 1918. Finally, nothing is said about Japan herself, except that she is to be returned to her old isolation, deprived of the means of developing as a modern industrial power. There is no hint of any compensating arrangements whereby Japan might become a peaceful factor in an economically integrated world. The paramount fact emerging from the Cairo Declaration is a vast and radical reshuffling of power in the Far East. It means a revolutionary change in the policy of the Western powers, who for the past half centuries have looked to Japan as the stabilizing factor in the Pacific world. It was Japan who became the first great modern power in the East, having defeated both Imperial China and the Russia of the Tsars. It was Japan who became the great ally of Britain by the Treaty of 1902. It was Japan who was permitted to get a strong foothold on the continent of Asia by an in Korea and Guangdong. It was Japan who succeeded to the German territorial holdings in China and who was given the mandates over the strategic islands of the Central Pacific after the First World War. In the Washington Treaties of 1922, Britain and the United States pledged themselves not to fortify their island bases east of Singapore and west of Hawaii. Yet they did not prevent Japan from illegally fortifying hers. This made Japan indubitably the dominant power in the East. 
It also foredoomed China either to eventual partition or to subjugation by Japan. China all this time remained the pariah among the great nations to be exploited economically and completely defenseless to aggression from any side. China continued to be subjected to the unequal treaties which gave the Westerner in China extraterritorial rights, immune to the power of Chinese law. These treaties were not abrogated until this year. Chinese customs were collected by foreign officials, her rivers patrolled by foreign gunboats, her great ports turned into colonies for the management of Chinese industry, labor, and trade. Well, today, the Cairo Declaration proposes to reverse the course of a century's history and substitute victimized China for aggressive Japan as the dominant power in the East. Today, China is accepted as the leading Far Eastern power on a basis of equality with the great powers of the West. On paper, it's a triumph hardly equaled in its suddenness in the history of the modern world. Morally, it's a vindication of the virtues and qualities of the most populous and one of the oldest among the nations, a nation with one of the greatest civilizations in the world, a country whose 400-odd million peasants, vigorous, hard-working, and capable of incredible sacrifice, are fired with the idea of freedom. A strong and democratic China would be a tremendous stabilizing force in the eastern half of the world. As guardian of peace and security in the East, it would have to assume a grave responsibility and trust. But the responsibility will have to be shared. It will be a long time before China as a power can stand alone. She will require the close friendship of Russia, whose Asiatic interests are great. She will need our help in keeping the Pacific at peace, and before that, in achieving internal unity, which is still far from complete. And that will mean a revolutionary change in our attitude towards the problems of the East. It is we who will have to police the Pacific for a long time to come. It is we who will have to maintain the bases to be wrested from Japan and to defend them with a navy and air force of superior strength. We and China, at either end of the Pacific, with the friendly cooperation of Russia and Great Britain, will have the job of bringing and guaranteeing self-government and prosperity to the millions of Asiatic and Pacific peoples whose long domination by the white races has paved the way to the easy aggressions of Japan. That, and nothing less, is the implication of the uh, Cairo decisions. We are still waiting for details about the conference at Tehran between Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt. All we know is the bare announcement from Moscow that the three men have met. At the time of the Moscow conference, near the end of October, I said this. When the top men actually meet, we shall know that the conference has been a success. That moment is now. We do know that basic agreements reached at Moscow came up to expectations and maybe more. But on the basis of this understanding, much else will have to be settled. There is the question of Russia's relations with Poland, quite apart from the territorial question, which has been postponed by consent. In other words, it will be allowed to settle itself. There is the question of Turkey, or, to be precise, the Turkish Straits which have been a bone of Russian contention since Catherine the Great. During the last war, Russia was promised Constantinople and the Straits. She lost her chance, as she lost much else, by going communist and falling out with the Allies. Turkey, then, was on the German side. Today, when she seems about ready to climb off the fence on our side, does it not seem imperative that some sort of understanding is reached? Here, at any rate, is one of the thorny problems of the war. Finally, of course, there is the question of Russia's plans in the Far East, which in part may have been answered at Cairo. In any case, if it did come up at Tehran, we shall not be told for a very good reason. What we shall be told will not be merely for our ears, but chiefly for the big ears of the watchful waiters in Tokyo and Berlin. The best hope of the future as of this date lies not so much in these international declarations, but in the persons of the leaders themselves, and in the fact that that they have achieved such unity of purpose as they have done. There is one thing these four men have in common. They all came to power in a world that was big with change. Three of them are the inheritors of social revolutions which they must guide into an ordered course. They are strong men. They have weathered terrific political storms. They are men of destiny, true leaders of this turbulent time. We hope it will not be possible five or fifty years hence to make them appear ridiculous like the so-called Big Four of Munich or futile like the Big Four at Versailles. Good night. Mm -hmm.
You have been listening to Caesar Searchinger, whom we have presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association. Next Saturday, Caesar Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. The story behind the headlines is a public service feature and has originated in New York. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. The great Allied offensive on the Western Front, now in its fifth day, may be General Eisenhower's bid to bring about Germany's collapse this winter. Perhaps we shall know more about its objectives this time next week. Meantime, the fate of Germany and of Europe is being settled in stages in a series of diplomatic moves of which the invitation of General de Gaulle to Moscow is the latest, and another conference of the Big Three may be the next. The Roosevelt-Churchill Conference at Quebec, preceded by Mr. Churchill's lengthy visit to Rome, the Churchill-Stalin Conference at Moscow, and Mr. Churchill's dramatic Armistice Day visit to Paris, all these were steps in the shaping of the Europe that is to emerge from this war. At Moscow, Though obliged to bypass the stubborn Polish problem, the two dominant European powers virtually settled the future of Eastern Europe. At Paris on Armistice Day, a long step was taken toward a settlement in the West. For France was formally accepted into the higher councils which deals with European problems, namely the European Advisory Commission. Hitherto, all the decisions had been made by the big three Great Britain, Russia, and the United States, all powers with major interests outside of Europe. The addition of France gives greater representation to the continent itself, though France, too, owns one of the greatest non-European empires in the world. With one exception, <coughs> exception, these are the same powers which tried to settle the fate of Europe after World War I. The one exception was Soviet Russia, whose temporary departure from Europe left a vacuum which sooner or later had to be filled. The attempt to fill it with Italy was not exactly a success. Italy was a latecomer in the war and took an early departure when our aspirations were not fulfilled. Today we are back to the original combination which came together in the days before the First World War. It started with the Entente Cordiale in the days of Edward VII, and this became the Triple Entente when Tsarist Russia was finally accepted by the liberal British statesman of 1907. Fear of Germany had driven England first to the side of France, then to the side of Russia as well. Had Germany been defeated by these three powers, the new map of Europe would have been drawn by Russia, Britain and France alone. But Russia dropped out of the fight in 1917, and the United States filled the gap. When America refused to guarantee the new Europe which she had helped to build, she left a gap which later became a gaping void. Is history repeating itself in reverse? Is Churchill rebuilding the Entente Cordiale to be followed by the Triple Entente when de Gaulle travels to Moscow to see Stalin? Some drastic changes have taken place in Europe since the days of the First Entente. Today, Russia, having driven the invader from her soil, emerges as the greatest military power that Europe has ever seen. Russia has conquered all of Germany's former satellites and harnessed them to her chariot, all but one, and that one, Hungary, is also on the verge of collapse. The shape of Eastern Europe is being determined very largely by the armistice terms with these former Axis satellite states. The terms are not punitive, but rational on the whole. They are unusual in that they provide for territorial changes, reparations, and other matters usually reserved for treaties of peace. The territorial changes give Russia certain strategic advantages, and otherwise they revert to the pre-war boundaries of the nations concerned. Thus the agreement with Bulgaria obliges that country to return to Greece the maritime province of Thrace. Had it remained Bulgarian, it would have given Bulgaria her former access to the Aegean Sea, and that, in the long run, would have redounded to Russia's benefit, 
for Bulgaria is expected to be very friendly to Russia, to say the least. Thus, Russia is apparently no nearer to her historic aspiration for an outlet to the Mediterranean than she was before the war, unless some kind of agreement was reached between Stalin and Churchill with regard to the future of the Turkish Straits. We may not be far wrong in guessing that this was one of the subjects discussed in the recent Moscow talks. We do know that the future of two Mediterranean countries was pretty well settled for the immediate future, namely Yugoslavia and Greece. Both Russia and Britain are recognized as having an interest in Yugoslavia, while Greece is to remain in the British sphere as it was before the war. What we do not know is what effect this will have on the internal political structure of these countries after the war. Will they remain monarchies as Britain hopes? or will they turn red Republican, as seems to be indicated from our correspondence on the spot? It is perfectly true, of course, that Russia has pledged herself not to interfere with the social structure of the countries she invades, and appears determined to keep the pledge. Nevertheless, we see political shifts in the governments of Finland, Romania, and Bulgaria already, generally speaking, towards the left, with communist participation though only in minor roles. Considering the trend of political thought in these countries before the rise of fascism, it's an easy guess which way they will turn, with or without encouragement from Moscow. The same, incidentally, is true of Greece, which is said to be completely dominated by the leftist EAM, or National Liberation Front, and Yugoslavia, where Marshal Tito's partisans command a similarly powerful influence. In Czechoslovakia, the first friendly neighbor to enter a military alliance with Soviet Russia, the democratic forces are known to be strong and predominantly left-wing. In Poland, the struggle between the left-wing parties supporting the Lublin Committee of Liberation and the conservative and mildly liberal groups following the London cabinet is still being fought out. The latest visit of Premier Mikulajic has brought a compromise no nearer despite the intervention of Mr. Churchill and Marshal Stalin. But few would dare to predict any solution which would not permit the closest political collaboration with Soviet Russia after the war. The political complexion of Eastern Europe, east of a line from somewhere on the Baltic to the head of the Adriatic, seems destined to be from red to pink. Not necessarily because Moscow wants it to be, but because that is the natural long-term trend and Soviet Russia could not disavow its own revolution, even if it wished to. The countries which after the last war were to form a cordon sanitaire against Bolshevism, today must look to Russia for protection and leadership. Now, what about Western Europe? In Western Europe, there are constitutional monarchies like Belgium and Holland, Denmark, Norway and Sweden, with governments all the way from conservative to socialist. There is Italy, which on the rebound from fascism seems to lean to a socialist, communist, popular front. There are fascist Spain and Portugal, still favored by some statesmen as an anchor of stability in the West. And there's France, which is politically still uncommitted, and whose leadership might determine the future course in all of Western Europe. General de Gaulle, now the acknowledged leader, is a man without a party, but he has already had to make concessions to the left. The resistance movement contains elements of all parties, but it is already split into left and right. The old political alignments are reappearing, and the communists are taking a strong opposition line. The youngsters of the FFI, the resistance movements, the Maquis and partisan groups, speak of a second revolution. Minister Bidot, Georges Bidot, who was, uh, and still is, the head of the Resistance Council, speaks of a revolution by law. At this critical moment, the Allies have recognized General de Gaulle's provisional government and have assured to France her place as one of the big four. It might have come sooner if the necessity of a stable and unrevolutionary France in Western Europe had been recognized by certain parties. On Armistice Day, Prime Minister Churchill stressed in Paris, that a strong French army, as soon as possible, was absolutely necessary to balance and sanity in Europe. 
France has promised her share of the triumph over Germany and her place in the Supreme Councils of Europe just at the moment when the revolution threatened to get out of hand. Patriotism and national pride have often proved antidotes to revolutionary unrest and have been deliberately used for that purpose. A good deal has been said during the recent months about the possibility of a Western European bloc. Field Marshal Smuts was the first to speak of it publicly, then General de Gaulle. Foreign Secretary Eden has mentioned negotiations looking to that end with several nations. The Churchill visit to Paris, besides revitalizing the old Entente, has been regarded as a step towards the Western bloc. The most striking political tendency, said the French Foreign Minister, Georges Bidot, is toward an alliance of the Western powers. Yet now we hear that Soviet Russia has frowned upon this idea, just as she frowned upon the proposed Polish-Czechoslovak pact some time ago. Whenever an alliance of European nations is mooted, the Russians feel that it might someday be turned against them. That is the legacy of the bad old days of the Munich pact. Yet today, Russia herself is creating a zone of friendly states in Eastern Europe. Her alliance with Czechoslovakia is open for neighboring states to join. These are indications of something like a unification of Europe from the East. What then would be the objection of a combination to a combination of federation in the West? Such a combination would be based on a close alliance between Britain and France. It would include the Low Countries, Belgium and Holland and most likely the Scandinavian countries too. But what about Switzerland, regarded by Russia as an unfriendly nation? What about Italy, whose ideological al allegiance is still uncertain? And what about the fascist countries on Europe's western fringe? What about, of all, about Germany, which for years may be occupied in separate regions by the Big Four? There are quite obviously many points to be settled before the outlines of a stable Europe can become clear. Since time immemorial, Europe has struggled to find an equilibrium that would give her nations peace. For centuries, the best she has been able to evolve is a system of balance of power between wars. Empires have risen on the continent, each successively trying to impose its hegemony or to unify the continent by conquest. And for the past three centuries, England has frustrated every attempt at domination by throwing her strength on the side of the lesser powers. Today, the greatest power on the continent is Soviet Russia, and Great Britain is allied to the strongest power. She has therefore abandoned her historic role as balancer. Will these two great world powers, as leaders of the two great world regions, be able to stabilize the continent by peaceful agreement, now that the last of the troublemakers of the past two, two or three centuries is bound to be eliminated? It doesn't seem likely that they can do it alone. It doesn't appear that all the problems can be solved in conference between Stalin and Churchill alone. Many matters could not be settled, said Churchill after the recent Moscow conference, in the absence of the president. This is but a recognition of a condition that already existed at the end of World War I, namely the incapability of Europe to find her equilibrium alone. Today, the world has become so interdependent that there are no international problems that can be solved on a regional basis. The elimination of Germany as a military power will not be enough. Any permanent solution of Europe's problems involves the rational disposal and employment of Europe's resources and industrial power. It also involves the fruitful cooperation of two radically different schools of economy, and it involves a world political structure in which democracy and communism can live peacefully side by side. In the solution of these world problems, the help of the United States is obviously indispensable. That is why the Moscow Conference was only a stopgap and must be followed by an early conference of the Big Three or even the Big Four, which now seems to include France. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searchinger. Next Sunday at this time, Mr. Searchinger will be, be, will be back with another story behind the headlines. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. 
In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these programs by eminent historians. And now, here's Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. Three American offensive actions have highlighted the news of the week. First, the landing of the Marines on Iwo Island, only 750 miles south of Tokyo. Second, the completion of the recapture of Manila, including Intramuros, the walled city. And finally, the opening of the 9th and 1st Army offensive on the plains in front of Cologne. This, of course, is part of an all-out all out Allied campaign designed, in General Eisenhower's words, to destroy the German forces west of the Rhine. In this new offensive in the west, the Allies have returned to the task they had to break off in December when Field Marshal von Rundstedt launched his Battle of the Bulge. Today, we have not only recovered the lost ground, but we are far better off in manpower and supplies. Better off in manpower and supplies. The Germans say we have 600,000 men in the field. On Friday morning, Eisenhower struck with terrific force across the Ruhr River after an artillery and air bombardment beating anything yet seen on this front. The action has been compared with a landing on the Normandy beaches because it began with an amphibious operation across the swollen and angry roar carried out in thousands of small plywood boats. Closely following these masses of floating infantry were American engineers bridging the river under fire. A deep bridgehead was quickly established east of the river on a front of over 20 miles. The Ruhr River, really pronounced Ruhr, but not to be confused with the Ruhr, which is east of the Rhine. Well, the Ruhr was an essential part of the Siegfried defenses. The Nazis had deliberately flooded its banks by blowing up some of the regulating dams. Our recent capture of those dams made the present offensive possible. Equally necessary, however, was the action of the Canadian First Army, which secured the Allies' northern flank. Crossing the flooded plain between the Maas and Rhine rivers near their northern bends, they captured the towns of Cleves and Gorch, punching a hole in the Siegfried Line. Moving southward, they are now threatening the German right flank in front of the Rhine and the Westphalian plain. At the same time, the Germans' left flank is being menaced by the American Third Army on the River Saar. And in the center, our troops are now fanning out on the plain of Cologne with the great city itself only from 15 to 20 miles away. The towns of Duren, Jülich, and Linnich are in our hands, including the walled and moated citadel and castle of Jülich. This medieval stronghold had withstood long air and artillery bombardment and had to be taken by direct assault. For five centuries, it was the seat of the dukes of Jülich and Cleves the house which furnished Henry VIII with his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Duren, whose capture we completed today, is an important manufacturing town of 40,000 or more. Now, although Cologne is only 19 miles beyond Duren, it will not be easy to take, for the intervening area abounds in natural and man-made obstacles, forests, hills, towns, and fortifications, especially along the little river Eft. Behind the Eft, are the Ville Hills, shielding Cologne and the Rhine. The valley of the Erft, by the way, which we are now approaching, is the place where the rich Cologne patricians and business tycoons have their country estates. It's a lovely and balmy spot, and no doubt there were patrician villas there even when Cologne was an outpost of ancient Rome. We hope, of course, to destroy the German armies on this side of the Rhine. But General Eisenhower's statement does not rule out the necessity of having to force a crossing of the Rhine and meeting the Russian armies in the center of the Reich. This, in fact, must have been contemplated at the Yalta Conference, which promised new and even more powerful blows into the heart of Germany from east, west, north, and south, all timed and coordinated by the general staff. Just ten days after the Yalta Declaration, the coordinated blows have begun. The landing on Iwo proved to be one of the toughest jobs we've ever undertaken. It was the toughest job in the history of the U.S. Marine Corps, now 168 years old. It was worse than Guadalcanal, Tarawa, or Kwajalein. The casualties in the first three days exceeded those of the whole expedition on Tarawa, namely 5,372. By that time, we had taken only one-third of the island. 
which is only five miles long and two and a half miles wide at the widest point. It is safe to say that never in this war was so great a sacrifice made for so small an area. <clears throat> Yet that tiny area is essential to us, for on Iwo are situated two airfields from which the Japs attacked our great B-29 base on Saipan. What is even more important, it gave them an advance lookout from which to warn Tokyo of the approach of American airplanes to the industrial regions of Japan. You have heard and read many first-hand accounts of this bloody exploit throughout the week. I needn't dwell on the horrors of it, nor on the wonderful heroism of our men. Here are just a few essential facts to remember. Iwo may prove to be the best fortified small island in the world. Nature and human ingenuity combine to make it so. It consists entirely of volcanic sand and stone, honeycombed with crevices and ridges which provide natural protection to the defenders. Also numerous caves from which guns emerge only to fire and disappear. Iwo's only landing beaches are dominated by cliffs and rearing craters. It is between the crater of 500-foot Sorobachi and the serrated northern plateau that the Marines had to go ashore against a deadly, accurate barrage from hidden batteries. For there was no surprise on Iwo. The Japs knew we were coming, knew exactly where we would land. There was no choice. The difficulties in some ways were far greater than at Salerno or on the beaches of Normandy. For one thing, the island is so small that it is virtually impossible to maneuver ground forces. Therefore, strongly fortified positions had to be taken by frontal assault. There is no kind of natural harbor on Iwo. The beaches rise steeply off the water, and the shoreline is covered with deep, slippery volcanic sand. Wheeled and even track vehicles were almost useless in the initial stages. In fact, the wreckage of this material and of our boats piled up on the beaches impeded the advance of the troops. The landing, all by hand, of supplies of water and ammunition sufficient to maintain combat was a major problem. Sometimes it was just touch and go. However, today the Marines have the first airfield and two-thirds of the second. They also hold Mount Surabachi and are digging the Japs out of its caves. Yet no landing we have made has had more thorough preparation. Iwo had been bombed without let up for 72 days. It had been shelled by the Navy for several days on end. It was drenched with 7,000 tons of shells, including the 16 inches from the battleship guns. But its concealed batteries were unreachable by high trajectory shells. There was, in fact, no really effective softening up. The estimated 20,000 Japs on Iwo were ready for us. They are fanatical fighters defending what they consider their home soil. Over 2,000 of them are already dead. We landed two divisions, a force not much superior to the garrison, from 800 ships of all sizes. On the third day, we committed a third division. Geographically, Iwo and the other two little volcano islands belong to the same land formation as the Bonin Islands, which are 125 miles further northeast, and the next stepping stone on the ladder up to Japan. All the Bonins are Japanese today. They were once under British and American administration, though neither Britain nor the United States claimed them officially. They had been discovered in the 16th century, both by the Spaniards and the Japanese, but not occupied. In fact, the Japanese called the islands Muninto, which means empty of men, and their present name, Bonins, may be a corruption of that. From time to time, however, American whalers used to put in there for water and fresh fruit, for there was a good natural harbor on one of the islands, Shishi, which we have already bombed. And in 1827, a British captain hoisted the British flag, and an American named Nathaniel Savory brought in a little band from Hawaii, including two Englishmen, a Dane, and several Hawaiians. Savory was the boss of the settlement, and he may have been there still, when Commodore Perry landed in 1853, a year before he opened up Japan to Western trade. I'll tell you more about this when we get to the Bonins, probably our next stop. When Iwo Jima is in our hands, it will be to the Japs as if a German-held Bermuda had been close to us. Their fighters can no longer attack our super fortresses on their way from the Marianas to Japan. 
Even though Iwo is too small for our heavy bombers, it may become an excellent base for our fighters, which will provide cover for our heavies. Iwo lies 650 miles north of Saipan. However, it would be too much to say that with the capture of Iwo, we have moved that much closer to Japan. The invasion of Japan will require a tremendous accumulation of land forces and equipment for which a large land base is required. The first concentration of our forces will probably take place on Luzon, which is now being liberated by General MacArthur's men. When that concentration is completed, our next great attack may be on Formosa, which is only 250 miles to the north, or on the China coast. Both may require the preliminary reduction of the Ryukyu Islands, which connect Formosa with the home islands of Japan. The raising of a new Chinese army of 500,000 men to cooperate with American landings was recently announced. Now all that will take time. In the interim, we shall constantly tighten the blockade of Japan. Now that Manila is liberated and Bataan and Corregidor are free, the American Navy will have a new base from which to control the shipping in the South China Sea. And at the same time, thanks to the capture of Iwo, the battering of Japanese industries from the Marianas will become more and more effective. Nor is this all. The first carrier plane attack on Tokyo, which took place on February 16th, is likely to be the forerunner of many more. It was repeated yesterday and today. Standing 300 miles offshore for two days, the American Navy destroyed or damaged a total of over 600 Jap planes at a cost of only 49 to us. The fact that the Japanese fleet was unable to interpose itself between us and the homeland is a fair indication of its present condition. Various estimates have been made as to the remaining strength of that navy. None are wholly reliable. However, the opinion of our commanders that the whole Jap fleet today is hardly equal in strength to one of our five fleets is probably correct. That does not mean that the Japanese war is anywhere near its end. It means only that the Japanese navy has been defeated and the Japanese army must be next. In connection with this, it's important to record that on the so-called forgotten front in Burma, the British have achieved an important success, the crossing of the Irrawaddy River and the extension of their bridgehead south of Mandalay. They have achieved their success by dint of close cooperation with air forces. Hurricane fighters armed with bombs, machine guns, rockets and cannon have been doing a regular taxi service at the call of the ground commanders. The original crossing of the river was made by some of the toughest fighters and swimmers in the 39th British Army Corps. I mention the swimmers because the first crossing of the wide and turbulent river had to be made by a party of swimmers who slipped into the Ar Irrawaddy during a noisy diversion down the river that put the Japs off their guard. The capture of Mandalay may not be far off. When it happens, the whole Burma campaign will have entered a new stage. In view of the British commitment in Burma alone, it was hardly necessary for Mr. Churchill to repeat for the third time this week the pledge that Britain would fight Japan with all she has and to the end. Now, just a word about Manila. The three weeks' fight for the city ended yesterday. The Japanese trapped in the old wall city were killed. In fact, the remainder of the entire garrison was destroyed. 12,000 dead had been counted till yesterday. The disproportionate Japanese losses in the whole Luzon campaign, according to MacArthur, means that the whole archipelago will soon be clear of the enemy. We shall then be ready for the next chapter, the build-up of land forces against Japan. Good night. NBC has presented another story behind the headlines with Caesar Searchinger, heard over, uh, er, over most of these stations every Sunday evening in cooperation with the American Historical Association. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. The false UP flash that Japan had accepted our surrender terms was a malicious hoax perpetrated by an unidentified person. The report has been officially denied by the White House and the U.P. The President has made no statement and has gone to bed. If anything happens up to midnight, he will be notified at once. But, even if nothing happens in Washington, the Tokyo radio might sound off at any time. Well, in any case, we have lived through a week that will be remembered to the end of time. 
The war, to all intents and purposes, is as good as over. The discussion about the emperor is a matter of formulae and face-saving devices for the Japanese oligarchy, which we hope is on the way out. It merely delays the official consummation of what is now an irrefutable fact. The war for the Japanese people is practically over after three years, eight months, and two days threatening from Pearl Harbor. Threatening from the beginning of the China incident, the skirmish at the Marco Polo Bridge in Peiping, the war for Japan has lasted eight years and a month. But in reality, the Japanese people have lived in the shadow of war, military violence, and terrorism at home ever since that day in 1931 when her Quantum army seized the... Uh, country of Manchuria, thus opened up one of the blackest chapters in the history of the civilized world, with an impotent League of Nations going through futile motions of preserving peace, a league kept powerless by those in the seats of the mighty who preferred profits to peace. Indeed, when future generations of historians review this war, they will probably consider that the first shot was fired in Manchuria. For Manchuria was the signal for a whole series of aggressions, each a milestone on the road to global war. Italy's seizure of Abyssinia, the Axis intervention in Spain, both 1936, Hitler's annexation of Austria in 1938, his overrunning of Czechoslovakia in 39, and Mussolini's grab of Albania in the same year. The era of appeasement, which was the background for all these acts, came to an end with Hitler's invasion of Poland, on September 1st, 1939, and that, for most people, meant the real beginning of World War No. 2. At first, the European end of the war involved only Poland and Germany, then England and France, then all the smaller nations overrun by Germany. Italy joined in 1940. Russia was attacked in the summer of 1941. We were in all the way by December. Other nations followed, one by one. Altogether, 56 were involved, the war started with two and ended with 49 countries arrayed against one, Japan. The first and the last shot, Russia was the last to join the war against Japan. Last Wednesday, 70 hours after the dropping of the first atomic bomb, Soviet armies crossed into Manchuria and Korea. It may be said almost literally that the Soviets were precipitated into the Far Eastern War by the bomb that fell on Hiroshima and wiped out 60% of a great city of over 300,000 souls. Russia, according to the Associated Press, was positively scheduled to declare war on August 15th. But so terrific was the impact of the bomb on the world, and especially Japan, that Russia's declaration just managed to get in under the wire. It will be for future historians to figure out the reasons behind this sequence of events, President Truman confirmed the fact that Stalin had agreed to come in before we told him about the atomic bomb. In fact, he was committed to this course since the Big Three meeting at Tehran. Nevertheless, we were assured that the implementation of that promise was Mr. Truman's great objective at Potsdam. Now, at the time of Tehran, we did not have the bomb. At the time of post, uh, Potsdam, we did. But since we do not share all military secrets with Soviet Russia, Stalin was only given a rather vague idea of a new bomb. We knew about the devastating effects of the bomb and its terrible implications for the future. He did not. That is enough to explain the precipitate action of Russia in declaring war on Japan. But why, if we knew the effect of the bomb, was it so necessary to have Russia join us before the shooting was over? Surely, either Russia's help or the bomb would have been enough to finish up Japan. Why were both employed, considering the terrible effect of the first and the complications which may arise from the second? Once again, it will be for future historians to figure it out. The Soviets expressly stated in their declaration of war that they associate themselves with the Allied ultimatum to Japan of July 26. This meant that Japan would have to surrender unconditionally to Russia as well as to us. She promptly offered to do just that. Does this also mean that Russia accepts the Cairo Declaration, which is mentioned in the ultimatum? If so, Russia agrees that Manchuria must be given back to China, and that Korea is to be an independent state. Is that in any way surprising? Well, it is, when you examine the history of Manchuria over the past 80 years. For one thing, the Soviet maritime province, with Vladivostok, 
was part of Manchuria before 1861. Later on, Manchuria became Russia's main sphere of influence in the Far East. She spent many millions of rubles and many long years building the 3,000 miles Transsibirian Siberian Railroad to Vladivostok and Manchuria, also the Chinese Eastern in Manchuria itself. And she spent many more millions in developing the country so that millions of Chinese came to settle there. Finally, she got a lease of the Liartung Peninsula in South Manchuria with its warm water ports of Port Arthur and Dairen. Warm water outlets have been an old, age-old aspiration of the Russians and are so today. Well, all that. Manchurian investments and settlements, warm water ports and railroads were lost to Japan when Japan overran Manchuria after 1937. Russia, 1931 rather. Russia was humiliated and had to sell the railroad at a fire sale price. But Tsarist Russia had once lost a disastrous war against Japan in 1905. And Soviet Russia was not yet prepared to strike back. Today she is, and she has struck deep into Manchuria, also into Korea, where Russia and Japan once fair, shared spheres of influence in an uneasy partnership. Japan closed her partner out. Russia has also struck on the island of Sakhalin, now shared half and half between Russia and Japan. Here too, says the Cairo Declaration, Japan must disgorge. And there is no doubt that Russia will get the whole island with its oil and its coal. And what about Manchuria and Korea? T.V. Sung, the Chinese Premier, and his Foreign Minister are now in Moscow, sweating out a new understanding with Russia concerning all these questions and some more. For the new Russo-Japanese War, which revives a 50 year struggle for power in the East, means the return of Russia to the Pacific and the continent of Asia. She has never been quite absent, and Siberia, after all, is also in Asia. But the whole of Siberia and Soviet Central Asia has fewer inhabitants than Manchuria alone. Today, Russia returns as the strongest Asiatic power, a power which could inherit Japan's domination in East Asia, subject only to her obligations under the United Nations Charter and her membership in the Big Five. She will obviously have to share Asiatic dominance with China, which is a potential great power, but still in a state of disorganization. Between the borders of the Soviet Union and China, there are vast regions like Xinjiang and Mongolia, whose allegiance is still vague and subject to dispute. There is also that famous border region where the Chinese communists are in military and political control. The China of Chiang Kai-shek is as bitterly opposed to that regime as ever. Will the new relationship between Russia and China alter that attitude? Will Russia or China determine the political complexion of North China? Or will they reach a compromise? One thing seems clear. The eruption of Soviet Russia into Asia poses much the same problem as her eruption into Central Europe. The 20th century social revolution, which prepared the conflict in Europe, is still a live issue in Asia as the war comes to an end. Overshadowing all the events of the week, even the end of the war, is the thing that ended it, the atomic bomb. Its immediate effects are patent to anyone. It makes us, for this moment of history, the most powerful nation in the world, but only for the moment. No nation in history has ever been able to keep a secret weapon secret, from the Whitehead torpedo to Hitler's V-2. The atomic bomb has stopped the war. Will it stop all war? Did the invention of dynamite stop war? Alfred Noble thought it might, but it only provided the money for the Nobel Prize. Did TNT stop it, or poison gas? Did total bombardment from the air, as practiced by the fascists in Spain, stop it? No instrument of destruction ever invented has kept men from using it and improving it. And nothing has been more limitless than the capacity of people to face terror or their willingness to die, even for anything so nebulous as the honor of the Emperor of Japan. But even if the atomic bomb will not stop war, it has already changed our concept of war-making power. The war-making power in the past 
has been compounded of manpower, territory, raw materials, industrial capacity, strategy, and skill. Today, a small country with atomic bombs might be more powerful than a huge one without it. In the light of that change, will we not have to change our ideas about an international police force as a guarantee of peace? It is almost certain that the bomb will render obsolete most of the weapons we now have and which nations have spent billions to develop. What use, then, would it be to disarm a country and deprive it of industries already useless for future war? The atomic bomb, if it does not stop war, will take the last shred of idealism out of war. Heroism in a war with atomic bombs is no longer possible, for it would be a war not against soldiers, but a slaughter of civilians, innocent and wicked alike. The destruction of civilization has been a fanciful phrase rather than a realistic concept to most of us until now. Today, for the first time, the words utter destruction, as used by our statesmen, mean just what they say. In other words, for the first time in history, in the history of our planet, mankind has discovered the means to destroy itself. But to scientists, the explosion of the first atomic bomb meant something besides destruction. It meant the beginning of a new age, the age of atomic energy, an age which will unfold the possibilities on dreamed of benefits as well as Im unimaginable horrors. We are faced with something comparable to the discovery of fire, which in mythology Prometheus brought to man to set him free and make him the equal of the gods. Atomic energy may produce power and wealth in such abundance so as to re revolutionize our physical life and remove the inequalities of nature, like the maldistribution of raw materials, which are among the causes of human strife. So the peaceful action of atomic energy might someday really bring the end of war. The world, as someone has said, may be turned into a garden or a graveyard. But will we be able to control the madmen who might choose the graveyard? In other words, will statesmanship rise to the height of science? Thus, the end of the war leaves us with one of the greatest enigmas ever confronted, that ever confronted the human race. The greatest achievement of organized science and history leaves the greatest problem unsolved, the problem of the relation of man to man. The real war is reaching a new crisis, the war against the enemy within ourselves. If ever there was a compelling reason for real world unity, greater than a council divided into five separate and uncontrolled sovereignties, that reason is the atomic bomb. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searchinger. Next Sunday at the same time, Mr. Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. Returns of last Sunday's French elections, the first national elections to be held since 1936, are now complete. They indicate a revolutionary change in French political opinion and a radical change in the French political mechanism as well. Political opinion has shifted to the left by an even more massive landslide than it did in Britain. The change in political mechanism is just as important. It shows that the familiar kaleidoscope of numerous parties and party blocks has given way to something approaching the more stable party systems of Britain and the United States. French opinion in the course of the struggle for liberation and against fascism has solidified into four main groups, three of them on the left. The combined right and center is not only weaker than any one of the three left-wing parties, but it is split into tiny and partly irreconcilable groups. Any one of these groups with 19 seats in the assembly, one of these groups with 19 seats in the assembly is all that remains of the once great radical socialist party, the classic moderate party of Briand, Herriot, and Daladier. The three leading parties today are the Communists and their affiliates with 152 seats, the Socialists and their affiliates with 151 seats, and the new Popular Republican Movement with 140. 
The last named, growing out of the resistance movement, is Catholic, but nevertheless definitely left of center. The socialists, with the greatest popular vote of the three, emerges as the leading party of France. Some 24 million French men and women voted at this election. They voted not only for the lists of candidates to the assembly, but they also decided some very fundamental questions. A vast majority voted against the communists that the assembly should be not merely a lower house of parliament under the old constitution, but a constituent assembly charged with writing a new one. The new assembly will also take the place of the present consultative assembly with full legislative powers, but its main task is to draft the constitution of what will be the fourth French Republic. This it must do within seven months, after which the Constitution will be submitted to popular vote. If it fails of approval, a newly elected assembly must try again. In any case, the old Constitution of 1875 is buried, and with it the unstable system of shifting coalitions, which gave the Third Republic over 100 different cabinets in 70 years. For the people have gone on record in favor of a strong executive based on popular support, as in this country or Great Britain. In this respect, the election was a clear victory for General de Gaulle, who will remain as head of the interim government. Now, what will that government stand for? Its personnel and policy will, of course, be determined by the membership of the Assembly. It will, in the main, be a loose coalition of the three largest parties. All three of these parties are committed to a program of sweeping economic reforms on socialist lines. They may disagree on details, but the strength of the labor groups in each will determine the general policy. The powerful General Federation of Labor has already demanded legislative action to nationalize the banks and insurance companies, certain heavy industries, transportation, public utilities, and the merchant marine. The Council of National Resistance is also on record in favor of broad nationalization of the essential means of production. The coal mines of northern France have already been nationalized by the provisional government. General de Gaulle has hitherto resisted a more general nationalization, pending a clear mandate from the people. That mandate has now been given. Thus, France, like Great Britain, is embarked on a realization of socialism. Its course will have a profound influence on all Europe. France, the protagonist of the democratic revolution, is once again in the van. It is a little more than nine years since Leon Blum, France's first socialist premier, was swept into office as the leader of the Popular Front and set about giving France a modest New Deal. This included reorganization of the Bank of France, a tentative nationalization of the arms industry, collective bargaining, and the 40-hour week. After ten months, Blum was forced out by a reactionary Senate. He returned for a short spell, only to be ousted again, and succeeded by Édouard Daladier, the man of Munich. It was the socialists' refusal to endorse the Munich appeasement that led Daladier and his party to torpedo the Popular Front. Blum personally was so hated by the so-called best people of France that they used to say they would prefer Hitler in Paris to another term of Blum. Well, they got what they asked for. Today, Blum at 78 for years a prisoner of the Nazis, is triumphantly elected to the Assembly. Daladier, an unsuccessful candidate, has been bombarded with rotten fruit. On Tuesday, the first meeting of the Far Eastern Advisory Commission will meet in Washington. It will comprise nine nations directly interested in the post-war control of Japan. Whether Russia will join the, com uh, the Commission is still uncertain. Russia has been holding out, you know, for a four-power council with full joint control. We still hope to get her to accept a compromise, and the prospect, since Ambassador Harriman's visit to Stalin yesterday, is fair. In the meantime, the demobilization of Japan has been completed in record time, and General MacArthur has started what he calls a revolution or the evolution which will restore the dignity and freedom of the common man. Not that the Japanese common man has ever had any freedom, but anyhow, MacArthur has ordered the abolition of all laws which limit political, civil, and religious liberties. And that order has been enough 
to bring about the fall of Prince Higashi Kuni and his government. His place, Higashi Kuni's place, was taken by Baron Kijuro Shidehara. Baron Shidehara was Japanese ambassador in Washington after the First World War and during the time of the famous Washington Treaties, uh, establishing, rather, the balance of power in the Pacific. He has the reputation of being a liberal, largely because, as foreign minister in 1930-31, to he advocated a policy of expansion without actively going to war. He is now 74 and has been dragged out of his retirement to carry out the needed reforms which are to usher in the MacArthur Revolution in Japan. He was told that he must abolish the aforesaid laws which limit civil liberties and the repressive police system which exercises thought control. He was also ordered to establish woman suffrage, liberalize education, encourage labor unions, and break up uh, the great industrial monop monopolies of the Zaibatsu. Baron Shidehara organized his government and went to work. The government lowered the voting age to 20 years and decreed woman suffrage. Within a week, the emperor approved an amnesty which is said to affect nearly a million people. Hundreds of thousands of them were apparently in jail for their political opinions or for so-called political offenses. Laws limiting the activities of Christian churches were abolished too. All these things produced a series of headlines in our newspapers but got only perfunctory mention in the Japanese press and radio. Most important, on orders from MacArthur, the cabinet also got busy revising the Constitution, which has not been changed in 57 years. It was modeled on the reactionary Prussian Constitution of Bismarck, Germany, in the first place, in 1889, and made the emperor the source of all power. But it seems that Shidehara's cabinet isn't the only body tinkering with the Constitution. Prince Fumimaro Konoye, who is close to the emperor, also has a large finger in the pie following a talk with Mac Arthur. Now, Prince Kanoya is another liberal, according to Japanese estimation. But Prince Kanoya was Japanese premier when Japan invaded China in 1937, and this evidently did no damage to his liberal conscience, for he stayed on the job another year and a half. He also made the fifth column deal with the Chinese puppet premier, Wang Jingwei. Prince Kanoya came back as premier in July 1940, was forced out, but came back again in July 1941, making way for General Tojo only six weeks before Pearl Harbor. Like Shidehara, he resigned just in time to save his reputation as a liberal. It remains to be seen how liberal a constitution these men can produce. In any case, the mere promulgation of a new constitution does not make a country democratic. What we are trying to do in Japan, apparently, is to produce democracy by command. But the Japanese people have never had a chance to learn what democracy is. They've been brought up for generations in certain political religious beliefs, of which emperor worship is the main idea. They have hardly outgrown feudalism, abolished by decree just 75 years ago. All but a few have only a state-controlled primary school education on completely militaristic lines. Very few have ever learned about the institutions of the outside world, and they lack all means of comparison. Above all, they have never had freedom of speech or press. Now that they are supposed to have it, they are unable or afraid to use it. At any rate, they see at the top essentially the same men who have kept them in their cage and they are reluctant to try their wings. Last week, General MacArthur had to threaten Japan's editors that they must fulfill their obligations or make way for those who would. Another difficulty is the abject poverty of most Japanese. The Japanese worker toils long hours for wretched pay. He has little chance for recreation or information. He is a farmer. He rarely owns his land and pays over half his crop in rent and taxes. Proportionately, the poor pay higher taxes than the rich. Industry is almost completely monopolized by the Zaibatsu. Among these, four great families controlled most of the nation's industries and trade even before the war. The docility of the masses has made it easy for our army to secure obedience and apparent acceptance of our commands. But we do not know how far they are approved or even understood. 
We have heard about the first stirrings of a spirit of revolt in Japan. Fifteen students of a Tokyo high school asked for the removal of the principal because the militaristic curriculum was not changed. Three weeks ago, there was a demonstration by a few hundred leftists who shouted, down with the emperor, or words to that effect. More recently, there was a hunger march in which the marchers demanded not only food, but death to the militarists. But the attacks on the militarists seem to be encouraged by other powerful groups anxious to deflect the lightning from themselves. Militarists make up the major part of our list of war criminals, of whom some 600 have been rounded up so far. But what is to happen to the Zaibatsu, the industrial and financial feudalists? Mr. Yoshida, the foreign minister, gave an interview recently in which he praised the Zaibatsu as having brought prosperity to Japan in pre-war days. Whether the breakup of these houses will redound to the benefit of the people, I don't know, he said. I'm inclined to be doubtful, especially since I do not know how the Americans propose to accomplish their dissolution. End of quotes. What seems to be happening is an attempt of the tycoons to get out from under through a reshuffling process which will not hurt their private purse. An NBC correspondent reported a few days ago that the cabinet had voted to reimburse some of the biggest corporations for bomb damage and cancellation of war contracts. This is to strengthen Jap Japanese industry, no doubt for the benefit of the people. Here, in dealing with Japan's incredibly top-heavy economy, is where we face a really difficult problem. But without solving it, the chances of genuine democracy are slim. At best, it will be a very long job and it calls for more than the low-powered and short occupation that some people have favored. Our occupation, by the way, will shortly be shared by British and Empire troops, and possibly later on by the Russians, if they should, after all, accept our invitation to join the Far Eastern Advisory Council. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, have presented... Caesar Searchinger. Mr. Searchinger's analysis of current events is brought to you as a public service. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Attention, naval officers and men detached or discharged. You may resume your status or you may re-enlist in the training program of the Naval Reserve by calling at the Armory, 1st Avenue at 52nd Street, any night between 8 and 10 during the month of April. Now, story behind the headlines brought to you over WEAF, NBC in New York. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In these analyses, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. At the end of this first peacetime Easter, it seems that the conscience of the American people has been thoroughly aroused, thanks to the stirring appeals of President Truman, Mr. Hoover, Mr. LaGuardia, and others. This means new hope for the starving millions of Europe and Asia. The danger of mass starvation is by no means past, and there is no certainty that it will be averted, unless every one of us does his part. That, as Mr. LaGuardia says, will give this Easter a new significance. The contribution of Congress to the Easter festivities is the emasculation of price control. On Wednesday, the House voted 5, 355 to 42 for the continuation of the OPA for nine months only, not as an effective body, but as a mere ghost. If this bill were approved by the Senate, the OPA, according to Paul Porter, its chief, would become completely ineffective and impossible to administer. The Gossett Decontrol Amendment, he said, would force the OPA to remove ceilings on at least half of the articles which make up our cost of living. The Wilkert Cost Plus Reasonable Profit Amendment would blow sky high the prices on that new car, refrigerator, or radio you've been waiting to buy, as well as on most of the household appliances that nearly every housewife has been dreaming of for years. Above all, the mangling of the OPA bill will add billions of dollars to Uncle Sam's food bill and seriously jeopardize the entire stabilization program. The ordinary citizen has a right to be bewildered. 
How can the representatives he has elected deliberately set out to remove controls which have, when all is said and done, kept prices within a reasonable limit and have, therefore, made living possible for the man with a fixed moderate income? The obvious answer, of course, is that Congress does not represent only the man with a fixed moderate income who wants to buy. It represents also a huge number of people who have something to sell. It represents the farmer who wants to get the highest possible price for his crop. It represents the hundreds of thousands of small dealers and businessmen who want to make as big a, as big a percentage on the things they sell in the wholesale and retail trade. And it also represents big industrial and financial interests which hope to make a killing at a time when billions of accumulated savings are waiting to be spent. The stock market has been going up and up in anticipation of the fabulous profits that industry expects to make and in which a large number of people hope to share. In short, Congress has a boom mentality to deal with as well as the business interests with their great lobbies and their pressure advertising financed by millions of accumulated profits. So, in the last analysis, it is not Congress alone that is to blame. It is the vast number of people who take a short-term view of the future, who think that if business is good, things can't be bad for them. It has also to deal with the well-known impatience of the typical American who wants what he wants when he wants it, and with those people who have been persuaded that the OPA is responsible for shortages in black markets. You might as well believe that umbrellas are responsible for rain. Now, everybody likes the idea of getting more money for the goods or the services he has to sell. But here is the catch. Money is worth only as much as it buys. And as prices rise, your money actually decreases in value. The buying power of the dollar you have today is certainly somewhat less than the dollar you had in 1941. That is due to such rise in prices as there has been. Imagine how little your dollar would be worth if prices were permitted to rise to whatever the traffic will bear. That is what inflation consists of, high prices. We had inflation after the last war, not only in Europe, but right here. This is what happened in 1919, there being no retail price control. There was plenty of money in the hands of business just as today, and lots of money in the hands of prospective buyers just as today. While speculation seized both stock and commodity markets, manufacturing and trade. Businessmen bought everything they could lay hands on, expecting to profit by the rise in prices, and this made prices rise still more. During the first year after the war, business inventories increased by $6 billion, more than four times the average post-war rise. One-third of that rise was due to soaring prices. The cost of living, already 50% above pre-war level, rose to 77% above, and in 1920, it more than doubled again. In other words, in 1920, we paid over two and a half times as much for the necessities of life as we paid in 1914. I heard it said by a commentator that price control never really worked. Well, with all the force of our particular machinery, if it hadn't worked during these past three years, we would obviously now be where we were in 1919 and 20, or worse. In 1920, the stock market continued to boom right through to November, when President Harding, the apostle of normalcy, was elected by an overwhelming majority. Then came the crash. Average wholesale prices fell from 227.9 in 1920 to 150.6 in 1921. In the end, 450,000 farmers lost their farms. There were over 100,000 business bankruptcies in the United States. What happened to the average employee, the white-collar worker, the man with a fixed salary who couldn't even strike for higher wages, too many of us remember only too well. Curiously enough, however, the large corporations suffered little by comparison with the general decline. And that may be one reason why big business today is rooting for a little inflation, for putting money to work, and for stopping price control. But the labor unions lost over a million members within two years, largely because they couldn't afford to pay the dues. Today, labor unions have four times as many members, and they are far more powerful. It is not likely that labor would suffer prices to rise without demanding a corresponding rise in wages. 
and the inflationary spiral would start its dizzy spin. I have seen that familiar phenomenon at close range in Europe after the last war. Hardly a single country escaped it, and everywhere it meant devaluation of the currency. In England, I bought the $5 pound for $3.50. In France, the franc was marked down to one-fifth its value. In Germany, the mark practically disappeared, and people dealt only in valueless paper millions and billions. The middle class, the most stable in the country, was financially ruined. In desperation, these people joined the Nazi ranks. Inflation, more than any other single factor, was responsible for Hitler's success. Here in America, we managed to climb out of our post-war slump after two terrible years, through a belated building boom, through the development of new industries and the financing of prodigious war export trade, supported by an enormous world demand for our goods. But prosperity didn't last, and by the end of the 20s, the export trade collapsed. Foreign countries, having gone through the inflation ringer and stopped by high American tariff walls, could no longer afford to buy our goods, nor did they have the dollars with which to repay our loans, or even the interest on our loans. So we had the catastrophic depression of the 30s, accompanied by the rumors and alarms of war. That is the story of the chain of events which began with the inflation following World War I. This time, it is true, we have had some more or less effective controls. But the pressure of unused buying power against the available goods is many times greater than last time. And when the dam bursts, we can expect nothing short of a ruinous flood. This time, moreover, the area of foreign buying power is tremendously reduced because of the vastly greater devastation of this war. This time, unless we finance our foreign trade with government loans, since private loans to our old allies are impossible under the Johnson Act, there may be no foreign trade to speak of. People back in 1920 did not generally understand the terrible economic forces which threatened our security and our very homes and the liberties of the peoples of the world. But in 1944, they knew that President Roosevelt was right when he said that people who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. Besides, Large numbers of people today are economically informed. Many of them remember the effects of non-control after the First World War. People are as conscious as ever of their sectional and occupational interests, but they are also conscious of their interests as consumers. The returning veteran who has been fighting to save the American way of life is going to look twice at legislation that raises its cost. Today, the housewife knows what the OPA means to her budget, and she knows how to exercise her vote. It is no wonder, therefore, that according to public opinion polls, from 73 to 83% of the people are for continuing the OPA. Then what, you may ask, is Congress doing? This, after all, is the election year. Well, perhaps congressmen feel that this is not a party matter, since people on either side of the House were for and against. In any case, it's all part of the conservative revolt against the more progressive policies of the Truman administration. The opposition, frankly, does not like President Truman's continuation of Roosevelt policies, which many people hope to see buried with the outbreak of war, with the end of war. In his annual message to Congress in 1944, President Roosevelt projected what he called an economic bill of rights. In this, he included the right to work the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right to a decent home for every family, to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment. All of these rights, he said, spell security. And, he said, unless there is security at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. President Truman, in his first peacetime message to Congress, carried forward the Roosevelt program and asked for definite legislation from the present Congress. This included, one, a full employment bill, two, a fair employment practices bill, three, a bill to provide additional unemployment benefit for discharged veterans and war workers, four, a federal housing bill ensuring low-cost housing, five, a minimum wage bill raising the floor under wages gradually to 75 cents an hour, and six, the extension of OPA. Let's see what's happened to date. 
the full employment bill was whittled down to an almost meaningless planning program. The unemployment compensation bill was passed by the Senate, but shelved in a House committee. The Fair Employment Practices Bill was talked to death in the Senate in a 22-day filibuster. The Patman Housing Bill was passed in emasculated form by both houses, with no price ceilings on houses already built. The Minimum Wage Bill was passed in the Senate after being whittled down to 60 cents an hour, with no future increases assured. Also, a rider was attached, permitting a rise in farm parity prices, which would force the president to veto the bill. As for the OPA, you already know what the House did. The Senate may yet take pity on the poor consumer, provided sufficient outcry is raised. It would be wrong to say that it's all Congress's fault. No doubt the administration has made mistakes. Perhaps the fatal error, from the point of view of Congress, was the wage price policy, permitting rises in wages and corresponding rises in prices before production had got into its stride to meet the post-war demand. The rise in wages was difficult to refuse, however, with strikes threatening to tie up all industry. The rise in the price of steel opened the way for price rises all round, and the OPA was already in difficulties as a result. But if the administration program was not acceptable, it was up to Congress to find a substitute. Congress did nothing. 1946, said President Truman, is the year of decision. This year, he said, we lay the foundation of our economic stature, which will have to last for generations. There is mighty little time left for Congress to act. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations have presented the story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. Almost exactly a year ago, the British Labour government was swept into power. The war in Europe was over. The end of the Far Eastern War was in sight. The British turned out their coalition war government and elected their first Labour majority to usher in the peace. Today, a year later, bread is being rationed in England for the first time. Practically everything but bread was rationed during the war, and still is. The belated imposition of bread rationing is a sharp reminder that Britain is still facing privations a year after the fighting ceased. When the war stopped, post-war austerity began. The war, the people, took it, as they had taken it during the war. They will take bread rationing, too, though there has been something like a revolt among the bakers, at least. Bread rationing is only one of the many hardships that Britons have to put up with after a year of so-called peace. In contrast to our own hustle to take the lid off after VJ Day, the British realized that war conditions would have to continue for an indefinite time. There was remarkable little grumbling. Maybe people were too relieved after the four-year nightmare of bombing, too happy to have some of their men home again to care much about comforts and food. They knew that victory was expensive. They knew that Britain had not only spent her substance but mortgaged her future, liquidating her foreign assets and borrowing huge sums abroad to carry on her military operations. They know now that they must pay. They remember the light-hearted return to normalcy after the last war, and they remember what it led to, a short boom in a long depression, unemployment, the dole. They remember the collapse of their foreign trade, lifeblood of their economy, and the default on their foreign debt. Britons do not want to go through all that again. That is why they voted very soberly for the Labour Party leaders who painted no rainbows for them. They were told that prosperity could be recaptured only through increased production, and an expanded foreign trade in a world in which many old markets were destroyed by war. They were told that all this meant hard work and more tightening of belts. This became even more obvious with our sudden stopping of Lend-Lease and the lingering uncertainty over the dollar loan. Now that the loan has become effective, the government's problem has been somewhat eased, but the people feel no sort of relief. For the loan is a two-way transaction with a quid pro quo. 
It is only part of a long-term agreement of two great trading countries to cooperate in reviving world trade. It will not mean much in the way of relaxation or loosening of belts. And it means less today in terms of buying power than it would have meant six months ago under effective price control. Britons today are frankly worried about our economy. They see us heading for inflation and maybe worse. The British have done a remarkable job in reconversion after an almost total conversion of their industries to war. Their factories are producing again at high level, everything from cloth to motor cars, not for Britons, however, but for better-heeled customers abroad. They themselves continue to do without. But the dire consequences that Churchill predicted for socialism have not materialized, and the people are as solidly behind their government as they were during the war. Yet the Labour government has not been shy about its far-reaching scheme of nationalization, a program which Prime Minister Attlee calls a planned economy designed to promote full employment, economic prosperity, and justice for all. In the first year of the Attlee government, the Bank of England and the coal mines have been nationalized. Bills to nationalize the steel industry, civil aviation, public utilities, telecommunications, and transport are in the process of passage. Bills creating a national health service and a national insurance system are in preparation. Since the government commands a large majority, and since there is genuine two-party government in Britain, these bills are sure of passage. Even the Conservative House of Lords can only delay legislation. It can no longer stop it except at the risk of its own life. This was demonstrated once again a little while ago when their lordships ventured to amend the government's Investment Control Act a measure to fit private investment into the country's planned economy. The amendment was rejected by the government, and the Lords promptly backed down. Thirty-six years ago, the Lords rejected the Liberal budget, the first British budget which deliberately set out to tax the rich to aid the poor. The consequence of that was the Parliament Act of 1911, which deprived the Lords of all say in financial matters and their veto power in others. So, with the acquiescence of a supine upper house, Britain today is headed for socialism, or social democracy, rather, the phrase preferred by the Labourites. At this stage, Labour's difficulty is not to persuade the opposition, but to satisfy its own followers. How long will they pull in their belts to build up a future prosperity based on foreign trade? This is where even the faith of the optimists may falter, for Britain, still dependent on overseas trade, can prosper only in a peaceful world. Therefore, Britain's future, aside from its safety, is bound up with a task of making peace. Her foreign policy begins at home. The Labour Party's foreign policy has come in for widespread criticism at home and abroad. Bloss Ernest Bevan has been accused by his own party of continuing the Tories' foreign policy, and that criticism has been loudly echoed here. There have been bitter words about Britain's policy in Greece and her gentle treatment of Franco Spain. But criticizing an ally's foreign policy is rather like sitting in a glass house and throwing stones. The Greek policy, inherited from Churchill days, has had our official sanction for the simple reason that neither we nor the British were prepared to see Greece go communist, like its neighbors to the north. And we, along with the British, have gone back to the non-intervention policy in Spain for more dubious political reasons. Both Greece and Spain are traditionally linked with Britain's command of the Mediterranean, a highway of empire. Empire and foreign trade are as essential to a Labour government as to a Conservative one. Yet the present government has gone further than any of its predecessors in loosening the bonds of empire. It has lost no time in making good its promise to start India on the road to real independence. It has pledged the withdrawal of British troops from Egypt within five years. It has given quasi-independence to Transjordan. It has promised to convert its mandates into trusteeships under the United Nations. If Churchill did not become the king's first minister in order to liquidate the British Empire, his successor would hardly care to repeat that boast. But the severest censure on the Labour government has been on account of Palestine. Palestine, like Egypt, lies close to the Suez Canal. Its importance as a military base would certainly be enhanced by the withdrawal of troops from Egypt. Some people have jumped to the conclusion that this is at the bottom of British policy towards the Palestine Jews. 
It has been alleged that for purely imperialistic reasons, the British are favoring the Arabs in Palestine rather than the Jews. The Arab League say these people is a mere creature of Britain who wishes to consolidate her position in the Middle East. Whatever its origin, the Arab League today is a rising force. It comprises seven countries in the Middle East, and it claims to speak for 34 million people spread over a million square miles. It is the instrument of an awakening nationalism which must be reckoned with. As a hostile force, it would certainly be a potential threat to Britain. That is why the Arabs were wooed by the fascists and the Nazis in the past, and they are now being wooed with honeyed words from the Moscow radio. Yet it does not seem reasonable that a British government would deliberately alienate the Jews, whom it has favored as hardly another country has favored them in modern times, simply for the sake of coddling the Arabs in Palestine. Unless there were a compelling necessity, the British would not wish to risk the sympathy of millions of Americans, for they know that the Jews are a potent political force over here. As it is, Britain all but lost that all-important American loan. Paid advertisements headed, Kill That Loan, have appeared all over this country, signed by pro-Zionist groups. Today, Palestine is as ticklish a subject to talk about as Spain. Moreover, it is sub since an Anglo-American conference sitting in London is discussing the famous Palestine report, even now. That report of the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, as you will remember, recommended the admission to Palestine of 100,000 refugees as rapidly as conditions will permit. That's quoted. The British government has so far refused to implement that recommendation, at least not without the help of American military forces. President Truman has promised technical and financial aid, but the British feel that we should share the responsibility in the use of force considering recent bloodshed and threat of further violence in Palestine. While this attitude is being violently attacked by the interested parties, the committee itself will discuss not only this recommendation, but the other nine contained in the report. It is pertinent, therefore, to recall what some of these recommendations are. In the first place, the report makes clear that Palestine cannot meet all the immigration needs of the Jewish victims of Nazi persecution. It recommends that the British, American, and other governments endeavor immediately to find new homes for all such displaced persons. The report further recommends a continuation of the British mandate pending the setting up of the United Nations trusteeship. It says that the Jewish agency, the responsible Jewish authority for Palestine, should at once resume active cooperation in the suppression of terrorism. The report specifically rejects the idea that every Jew may enter Palestine as of right. It says that it is for the government of Palestine to decide, having regard to the well-being of all the people in Palestine, the number of immigrants to be admitted within a given period. It rejects the view that there should be no further Jewish immigration without the acquiescence of the Arabs. But it also rejects the Zionist demand to speed up immigration so as to produce a Jewish majority and eventually a Jewish state. In fact, the report accepts the historical claims of both the Jews, based on Bible evidence, and the Arabs, based on 13 centuries of continuous residence. It emphatically declares that Palestine, quote, is a holy land, sacred to Christians as well as to Jews and Arabs, and therefore can never become a land which any race or religion can justly claim as its very own. And it adds, any attempt to establish an independent Palestine state or states would result in civil strife such as might threaten the peace of the world. Such is the tenor of the report that the American and British representatives are discussing now. Neither the Arabs nor the Jews are prepared to accept it, though the Zionists continue to clamor for the implementation of the single recommendation they like admitting 100,000 refugees at once. This recommendation, which would increase the Jewish population by 16%, in the face of Arab hostility, the British feel they cannot risk at this time. Aside from its economic worries, the policy of Soviet Russia, and the policy of Soviet Russia, Palestine is the British government's biggest headache today. And like most of its other troubles, it is inherited from Britain's Tory past. 
Now, the root of this particular trouble goes back to the original and rather ambiguous commitment made during World War by the British, the Balfour Declaration, promising the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine at a time when the Jewish population of Palestine was only 11%. It was the British army that had conquered Palestine from the Turks. Yet without the Arab revolt and Arab cooperation, that conquest would not have been possible. Whatever Britain's motives at the time, dictated no doubt by her own imperial interests, she cannot now ignore either party to the deal, neither the Arabs nor the Jews. Nor can she fly in the face of this country, whose interests are so closely identified with her own. But let us not forget that this country has done virtually nothing to solve the problem except giving advice. We have not opened our doors to the refugees, and no revision of our immigration quotas is in sight. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searchinger. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at the same time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. President Truman's trial balloon about opening this country to a sizable number of Jewish refugees has not met with the applause it deserves, especially from members of Congress who hold the key. If it were favorably received, say dispatches from London, the British may admit at least a token quota in addition to the 200,000 still said to be in the United Kingdom from the war. This might be a new approach to the Jewish refugee problem, but it will hardly ease the Palestine crisis at this stage, the crisis which has held the front pages all week. Earlier in the week, the President sent a communication to the British government, but its contents are still unrevealed. This communication was the first official act of the President in this matter since he recalled our members of the British American Cabinet Committee for consultation. The consultation has been hush-hush, too. The Cabinet Committee's job, as you know, was to try and implement the report of an earlier Anglo-American Committee which recommended the early admission of 100,000 displaced persons into Palestine. Instead, the Committee has come up with a plan of its own. The plan was to federalize Palestine, dividing it into Jewish, Arab, and British zones under a central British government. The Jewish zone was to consist of the central coastal area and the plain of Estrelon in the north, altogether about 1,500 square miles. This plan was promptly denounced by the Jew Jewish agency, and our own government was quick to wash its hands of the plan. The Jewish agency, however, produced an alternative plan, and this, it was reported, was sent to London by the President in his mysterious letter. This alleged Zionist plan goes much further than the committee plan. Instead of a federation, there would be autonomous Jewish and Arab states. The Jewish state would include, besides the coastal strip, all of Galilee, the whole of the Jordan Valley, and Negev, the defensive region which the British had reserved for themselves. If this plan has been sent to London, it is almost certain of rejection in its present form, for it means the reduction of British authority at a moment when the British are frantically defending their hold on the Middle East against what they consider is a serious threat. It would also mean flying in the face of the Arab nations, whose goodwill is felt to be more necessary than ever. The British reaction is probably known in Washington by now, but the White House is strictly non-committal. All that is admitted is that the President has sent to the British certain suggestions which might be thought helpful. So it looks as though we are once again letting George do it, or rather John Bull. How is he doing? Well, there are talks going on in Paris between Mr. Bevin and the Jewish agency leaders. And there are suggestions of a compromise which may satisfy the moderate Zionists at least. All this is preparatory to a proposed roundtable conference for which some of the Arab states have already accepted invitations. In the meantime, violence in Palestine itself has reached a new peak since the King David Hotel was bombed by extremists four weeks ago. 
the King David Hotel housed the headquarters of the British Army and the Secretariat of the Palestine Government. While responsible Jewish and Zionist bodies denounced this deed as a dastardly crime, the British military rounded up resistance leaders and suspects in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. 20,000 troops moved into Tel Aviv, imposed a curfew and conducted a house-to-house -house search. There were over 700 arrests. Next, the port of Haifa was isolated and reinforced. Some ships crowded the, with illegal immigrants were being held in the harbor, and it was announced that they would be shipped to the island of Cyprus to be detained pending further developments. When this became known, a crowd surged toward the harbor, was fired on, and three people were killed. It was the British attempt to stop the wave of illegal immigrants plus the delay in admitting the 100,000 displaced persons from Germany that gave a new impetus to extremist agitation and encouraged the recent violence. This immigration wave has been increasing ever since last November and has recently risen to a flood. These immigrants do not come from German DP camps. They have nothing to do with the 100,000 whose plight has been the chief argument for opening the gates of Palestine. These illegal immigrants come mainly from the Eastern European countries, chiefly Poland, where a savage anti-Semitism marked by pogroms has made conditions unbearable for Jews. Thousands of harassed people are traveling westward in a steady stream, many of them into the American zone of Germany, which means that they must pass either through the Russian zone or Czechoslovakia. Thousands more are smuggled southward from country to country by means of forged passports and visas with the help of a widely ramified organization known as the Underground Railroad. Thus they find their way to southern European seaports where ships, sometimes called coffin ships because of the crowding and horrible conditions on board, await them. These ships either evade the port authorities or get clearance in mysterious clandestine ways. Until recently, these unscheduled immigrants have been allowed to land in Palestine by means of a legalistic device. The British authorities simply deducted the number of those who landed illegally from the total balance of the quota established under the White Paper Regulations of 1939. Now, in an effort to stop the rising flood, the British have closed Haifa, the principal immigrant port. Naval ships have been sent to patrol Palestine waters in order to head off further unscheduled immigrant ships and send them to Cyprus. Palestine, therefore, is under a virtual blockade. The British government has explained all this in a new white paper, which calls on a number of European and American governments to cooperate by stopping the issuing of visas for Palestine. All this, of course, has further inflamed Zionist feeling, and more violence in Palestine is the result. Three days ago, the extremist organization Irgun Zvai Leumi called for a general Jewish revolt in Palestine. Henceforth, it says, the Jews will wage not a war of retribution, but a constant war. It seems clear that the Palestine question and the whole Jewish refugee problem have reached the ultimate boiling point. Something has to be done. Both the British and American governments are concerned, directly and indirectly. For one thing, we are as loath to receive Jewish refugees in our occupation zone of Germany as the British are to lift all restrictions in Palestine nor are we willing to raise our immigration quota for Eastern European countries here at home. Historically, the United States is concerned in this matter ever since the League of Nations awarded the Palestine Mandate to Great Britain in 1923. We could have had the mandate, but we declined. Had we become a member of the League, which we promoted, we would have been one of the official sponsors of the mandate. But, although we didn't, we took official cognizance of it and Congress officially endorsed the idea of the Balfour Declaration, which is embodied in the mandate. We therefore took a definite interest in establishing a Jewish home in Palestine, a country in which the Jewish population was at that time only 10%. We are the country with the greatest number of Jewish citizens in the world. This country, in one way or another, produced most of the capital and financial support for the Zionist cause, and we have a considerable stake in its success. But we are also materially interested in the future of the Middle East. Today, 
Far more than in 1923, our commercial and strategic interests in the Middle East are tied up with those of Great Britain. First, there is a perennial thirst for oil. Our oil fields and the Arabian concessions have been enlarged during the war. Our interest in the Arabian countries has grown in consequence. President Roosevelt's elaborately staged meeting with King Ibn Saud and the King of Egypt was not arranged for its picturesque effect alone. Today, more than ever, the Middle East is a great trading region in which we shall have equal chances with the British. That is one result of the new commercial and loan agreement approved by Congress. But militarily up to now, the British have held the bag. During the war, their positions were gravely threatened and they barely held Egypt and the Suez Canal with the help of Lend-Lease material. Today, the British and American interests in the Middle East are threatened by the rise of a new power, Soviet Russia. The Soviet-Iranian dispute last year had a direct bearing on the British and American interests near the Persian Gulf. The Soviet troops finally withdrew under Anglo-American pressure, exerted very largely by Secretary Burns and the Security Council of the UN. But the trouble broke out again in recent weeks in another form, in strikes against the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, fomented by the same two-day party which pushed the Azerbaijan revolt last year. The strikes were suppressed after the Anglo-Persian Oil Company raised wages, by order of Mr. Bevan, by the way, but not until the British had moved troops into Basra near the Iranian frontier to which the Russians objected. The Russians may be within their rights, but the fact remains that they are aiding separatist movements in Iran, tribal unrest in Iraq and eastern Turkey, and left-wing nationalism among the Arabs of Egypt and other countries in the Palestine area. British embarrassment in Palestine is obviously grist to their propaganda mill. The latest Soviet move in the Middle East is an even more serious cause of worry to the British and in a less agree to us. The Soviets have officially demanded a change in the Dardanelles regime. They want a sole partnership with the Turks in defending the Straits, which would shut out the Western powers for the first time in a century and a half. All these things add up to a challenge to British security in a region in which not only our sympathies, but our material interests are engaged. Whatever our official attitude regarding Palestine, this country is not in favor of dislodging the British from the Middle East when the only alternative is Russia. The British, on the other hand, increasingly look to us for cooperation in controlling and developing these regions, now that Britain is both weaker and poorer than the United States. The accent here is on the word developing. The basic difficulty in the Middle East is social and economic. The Arab populations are still very backward and very poor. They are ruled by a decadent class of feudal landowners or pashas. These, in turn, are supported by an absentee industrialism that has cared very little for the people's welfare. As a result, you have a large class of badly exploited workers and a considerable number of discontented intellectuals trained in the West. The war, hard times, and nationalist agitation have aggravated conditions and sharpened every conflict, such as the conflict between the Arabs and the Jews, who are helped by foreign capital and are therefore better off. One of the most important sections in the report of the Anglo-American Committee on Palestine is the one which points out the great divergence in living standards as between Arabs and Jews. Any attempt to temper the racial antagonism in Palestine would have to include a far-reaching improvement in the Arabs' economic opportunities. That is why the recent suggestions of American cooperation in the Palestine problem included the offer of a large loan. This would be used for the development of great projects like the TVA, comprising everything from irrigation and power to education and social uplift. This does not mean that the British themselves are not willing to help. The Labour Party's policy for the empire includes a long-range investment for social betterment and the raising of living standards. But up to now, the British themselves have been on short rations and will be, and will be, until they recover their export trade and make good the ravages of war. The idea of increasing world prosperity by raising living standards in backward regions 
was, in fact, one of the basic peace aims of the democracies. Nothing could better cement Anglo-American relations than a partnership in this noble work. Nothing could more surely advance the prospect of a better post-war world. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company has presented Caesar Searchinger. Next week at the same time, Mr. Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. The so-called Peace Conference of Paris has almost finished its work. During the last few days, it has approved the draft treaties for Italy, Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, leaving only Finland to be settled. And Finland is the least controversial of the five. In any case, the conference is bound to adjourn on Tuesday so that the statesmen can arrive in New York in time for the opening of the United Nations Assembly on October 23rd. It is in New York that the Council of Foreign Ministers may be able to finish their work on the treaties, for it is they, the big four, who have the final say, unless, of course, one of them prevents agreement by using the veto power. Now, that is why the Paris Conference can rank as a peace conference even less than Versailles, which concluded World War I. Even though Versailles, too, was dominated by a big four, the final decisions were recorded in plenary sessions of all the victor nations. This time, the final decisions, if any, will be taken in the Council of Foreign Ministers charged at Potsdam with the task of drawing up the terms of peace with the minor and satellite enemies. The terms for Germany and Austria, you'll remember, were left for the still indeterminate future. The Paris Conference under the Potsdam Agreement has only advisory powers, and its advice can be taken or not. However, there are, by definition, two classes of advice. There are recommendations adopted by a simple majority and recommendations adopted by two-thirds or better. This was an ingenious compromise thought up by the British, who fondly hoped that the two-thirds decisions would have a more binding force. However, it was clear throughout the conference that all the voting on controversial points, points on which the Big Four couldn't agree, was on a cut-and-dried West versus East basis, usually 15 to 6 in our favour. On that basis, a great many so-called agreements were reached, which may or may not stand up in the Council. The idea was that the moral force of a two-thirds majority would so impress the Russians as to push them over the line. However, Mr. Molotov has indicated that they are not impressed by majority votes, certainly not by a kind of automatic division in which all the Western democracies vote with us, and what Molotov calls the developing Slavic democracies, vote with the Soviet Union. If that is the case, the conference is very much where it was when it began its work 11 weeks ago. Nevertheless, a tremendous amount of work has been accomplished, and real agreement reached on the majority of the treaty provisions. As Mr. Molotov remarked, whenever the Big Four had agreed in advance, the smaller countries readily approved. Whenever the Big Four did not agree, there was a terrific tussle, ending in the usual East-West split. Thus, he argued, we should strive for more Big Four unanimity in order to build a more democratic peace. But it might also be argued that Big Four agreement, having behind it the power of the great victors, is something the small nations found it unwise or futile to argue with. What you get that way may be a realistic peace, but not necessarily a democratic one. The Italian treaty draft was the first to be completed, and it was voted on article by article till the small hours of the morning. The main controversial points are, of course, the future of the former Italian colonies and the boundary with Yugoslavia. The question of the colonies has been postponed by agreement of the Big Four for a year. As the boundary with Yugoslavia, the conference recommended 15 to 6, the so-called French line dividing Istria and Venezia Giulia. This compromise line pleases nobody, but it is the only one on which the majority, except the Yugoslavs, will agree.
By the same majority, the conference approved the decision to internationalize Trieste. But there was a terrific battle over the statute by which the city is to be governed. The statute places supreme authority in the UN Security Council, which must appoint a governor. This governor will have the power, in case of trouble, to declare martial law and call in outside forces. This, we say, is the minimum requirement to ensure the independence of Trieste. The Slavs say it does not assure democratic government, but domination by the Anglo-American powers. However, they did insist on proportional representation in the elections for the local legislature, which presumably would have some powers. The Yugoslavs are livid with rage because they expected to annex Trieste, and probably still hope to. They threatened that they wouldn't sign the treaty. But our nimble senators countered that one in a typically Washingtonian manner. They added a provision that nations which fail to sign will be excluded from all the benefits of the treaty. Mr. Molotov, as a final warning, served notice that he could not accept the statute as it stands and might insist on reconsidering the boundary, too. There are fewer points of disagreement in the Romanian Treaty, insofar as it concerns Romanian territory, boundaries, and reparations. But the two great sticking points, Danube navigation and commercial rights, are points which apply to all the southeastern satellite states. We, that is, the Western nations, insisted on inserting a clause restoring freedom of navigation on the Danube to all the interested nations, including the United States and Britain for Russian military might has closed the Danube to all outside trade. The Russians maintain that Danube regulation is exclusively the business of the countries which it waters and should be settled on national lines. They profess to consider our incursion, incursion into this business economic imperialism. However, we are only asking for the continuation of old established privileges. Today, the business of international waterways has become a cardinal point in British and American policy. And President Truman emphasized this in an important pronouncement over a year ago. Now, last May, after it became clear that the Russians would not reopen the Danube to international navigation, the United States forces in Germany seized all the Danube shipping within our reach, 372 craft of various kinds. We are still holding them, and have been roundly denounced for thus taking the law into our hands. Now, the Danube is easily the most important river in Europe. It flows along or through eight countries and is navigable in all the eight. If and when the German-built Rhine-Main-Danube Canal is completed, it will, Russia willing, be possible to send boats and barges all the way across Europe from the Atlantic to the Black Sea. Before the war, the Danube was subject, subject to an international statute set up under the Treaty of Versailles. An international commission controlling navigation above Braila in Romania and a much older European commission controlled the Danube Delta. Senator Vandenberg, in his final speech extolling the freedom of navigation, pointed out that this European commission dates back to 1856 and the Paris conference of that day. Mr. Molotov didn't exactly appreciate being reminded of this bit of history. No wonder. For that Paris Treaty of 1856 sealed Russia's most ignominious modern defeat in the Crimean War. <coughs> the great powers, France and Britain, at that time made her give up control of the Danube Delta and to cede southern Bessarabia to Turkey. What is more, Russia had to pledge herself to keep no fleet in the Black Sea and build no fortifications on its shores. As I said, an ignominious defeat. Out of that came the European Commission, which controlled the Danube Delta. Since its primary purpose was to keep Russian military power out of the Balkans, this precedent was hardly the most tactful for the senator to bring up. The upper reaches of the Danube in those days were controlled chiefly by Austria-Hungary. Not till after the World War, the First World War, was the Danube really internationalized under a commission possessing diplomatic rights and flying its own flag. All the riparian states, plus Britain, France, and Italy, were represented. Not so Russia, for Russia had again lost Bessarabia, this time to Romania, and was therefore not a Danubian power. Today she is, and all the other Danubian states are either wholly or partly controlled by her. Remembering past history, 
Is it likely that Russia will now share her control of the river with her Western allies, including a powerful newcomer in this region, namely the United States? The Slav delegates made it clear on Friday that they would not yield on this point, despite the two-thirds recommendation of the conference. Prospects for multilateral trade in the Balkans are dim. The other point in the Balkan treaties is equal trading, trading rights. We believe in equality of opportunity for foreign interests in these countries. And therefore, we have written into the treaties a proviso for most favored nation treatment for a period of 18 months, enough to get our foot back in the door. The Russians are determined that we shan't. Molotov says that to impose equality of opportunity on these weak little nations would lead to economic imperialism. For what could they do against that American colossus whose national income has almost doubled in the war and whose movies are the mainstay of European theaters? Not, says Mr. Molotov, because they're good, but because of so many and because they are backed by great economic forces. And what we should do in Europe, says Mr. Molotov, is not only to eradicate fascism, but to establish democratic regimes and guarantee them against possibility of exploitation by power and wealth. So here we are, right back again to the rival definitions of democracy on which the big four split way back in London over a year ago. It's not territorial questions or reparations or even military questions that will hold up the signatures of the Balkan treaties. It's the more fundamental quarrel over the exercise of economic power backed by power politics on both sides that lies at the bottom of the quarrel of West versus East. For that, in turn, will determine whether Europe is to function as one unit or two. If that fundamental question could be decided between the great powers first, we could begin to see the outlines of the structure of peace, and all the little pieces perfected at Paris might fall into place. So Paris ends with a great big if. It is a very different Paris conference from the conference that ended World War I, and Paris itself plays a very different role no longer the capital of a dominant power, but of a mediator between the powers. But France herself votes with the Western powers, although the Communists are the most powerful party in France. Today, the French people also voted for the second time on a constitution for the Third Republic, for the Fourth Republic, excuse me. And this time, it seems they voted yes by a small but decisive majority, though not all the returns are in. The new draft has been accepted had been accepted by all three of the leading political parties in the Constituent Assembly, but was again opposed by General de Gaulle. Last time, the popular Republicans had voted against it, and their most powerful mouthpiece was General de Gaulle. This time, General de Gaulle has parted with the popular Republicans, or they with him. Today's vote shows that France is against personal government by him or anyone else. The new constitution is a compromise between the communist demand for an all-dominating assembly and the idea of a separation of powers. It does provide for a two-chamber parliament, but with only advisory and delaying powers for the second chamber. It does give some real powers to the president, who presides at cabinet meetings and appoints the premier, subject to the assembly's will. He, the president, can advise the cabinet and even dissolve to, dis to dissolve Parliament, that is, after 18 months and after two ministerial crises. The Constitution does, in short, provide for a somewhat more stable government than the old one, but it is still in the revolutionary tradition of 1789. That democratic tradition, in which individual fr freedom and the rights of the individual count above everything else, is still the tradition of Western Europe. That ever more patent fact provides the psychological split between East and West at the Paris Conference and in the United Nations. The French have just shown that even communism changes its habits as it moves West. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searching Her. Next week at this time, Mr. Searchinger will be back again with another of his presentations, The Story Behind the Headlines. This program came to you from Radio City, New York. Bill Davies speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Story Behind the Headlines.
Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. This week, the Security Council of the United Nations tackled the most important and critical job of its career. I mean, of course, the discussion of the closely allied problems of disarmament and atomic control. Disarmament is an old subject in international relations with a stormy and not very cheerful history. The atomic bomb, ever since it was dropped over Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, has been the all-overshadowing factor in great power relationships. It has, moreover, given the question of disarmament a new urgency, an urgency that must be met by a corresponding energy and genius in statecraft. For nothing less than the survival of the civilized nations of this world is involved. <clears throat> the urgency of atomic control became apparent to the statesmen of the great powers during the first meetings of the Council of Foreign Ministers in London in the fall of 1945. Discussions in the Council were unexpectedly acrimonious, dealing as they did with conflicting Russian and Western ideas regarding the peace settlements with the Axis satellites. A deadlock was reached, and the deadlock was not broken until the so-called atomic powers, the United States, Britain, and Canada, had met in Washington and decided to remove the hidden irritant of our relations with Russia, namely our monopoly of the atomic bomb. The result was Mr. Burns' urgent flight to Moscow in Christmas week, 1945. <clears throat> the most important result of this emergency conference in Moscow was an agreement between the big three to recommend to the United Nations the creation of an Atomic Energy Commission, which was to prepare proposals for the international control of the use of atomic bombs. The commission was duly authorized when the United Nations met in London for the first time. On January 24th, a little over a year ago, the General Assembly as accepted unanimously the recommendations to the Commission. It's important to remember what they were. First, the exchange of basic scientific information regarding atomic energy for peaceful industry. Then, the control of atomic energy so as to ensure its use for peaceful purposes only. Then, the elimination of atomic weapons and other major weapons of mass destruction from national armaments. And finally, the protection of complying states against the hazards of violation through inspection and other methods. Those were the terms of reference of the Atomic Energy Commission. The commission consisted of the representatives of the 11 nations on the Council plus Canada and was to report to the Security Council, in which, as you know, the five great powers have the veto. Mr. Bernard M. Baruch was appointed our representative on the commission which first met at Hunter College in New York last June. The American representative presented a fully developed plan for atomic control based on the famous atchison Lilienthal report, which was prepared for the State Department. Professor Harold C. Urey, one of the leading scientists associated with the atomic research, called this report the most elaborate, thoughtful, and far-sighted proposal that had been brought to public attention by any group public or private, since the atomic bomb burst over Hiroshima. This atchison Lilienthal report, as I said, became the basis of the so-called Baruch Plan, which the United States presented to the Commission. Roughly, the plan provides for an international atomic development authority, which is to control not only the production of all atomic energy in significant quantities, but the mining of the raw materials with which it is produced, uranium and thorium is to have power to forbid the use of atomic energy for any but peaceful purposes. It is to have the unrestricted right of inspection in all countries to make sure that its regulations are being observed. But the Baruch Plan adds something else, and this has become the great bone of contention between us and the Soviet Union. It adds the imposition of what Mr. Baruch calls condign punishments of nations which violate or evade the regulations. And it states that the veto power exercised by the great powers in the Security Council shall not apply to the system of inspection and punishments. The Russians, who submitted a plan of their own, strongly objected to this, saying 
that any abrogation of the veto violates the Charter of the United Nations. They do not, in principle, object to inspection, as Mr. Molotov indicated in the course of the discussions on disarmament. But they think that the veto is completely irrelevant in connection with inspection. Now, some people jump to the conclusion that the Russians are, in fact, stalling on the inspection deal. But against that, it must be said that they have consistently refused in all discussions to compromise their veto power, which is their only defense against an inevitable pro-Western majority vote. We, incidentally, hold just as tightly to the veto on every subject but atomic energy. But in that subject, of course, we still have the bomb. As you know, despite the Russian's bitter opposition, through about 60 commission and committee meetings spread over six months, the United States delegation finally won. That is, the Commission voted for the Baruch Plan, ten to nothing, with the Russians and Poles abstaining. But it was soon realized that this was a rather empty victory, since the final decision rests with the Security Council, in which there must be unanimity of the Big Five. Moreover, the Russians discovered a way of renewing their opposition on another plane, namely on the broader plane of general disarmament. The Atomic Commission did duly report to the Council in favor of the Baruch Plan, but the Council also had before it an earlier resolution passed unanimously by the General Assembly, which calls on the Security Council to take practical measures for the regulation and reduction of all armaments, to prohibit the use of atomic and other major weapons of destruction, to expedite the discussion of the Atomic Commission's reports, and to give prompt consideration to practicable and effective safeguards in connection with both disarmament and atomic control. Everything you notice is to be expedited. Nothing is given priority. Well, Mr. Vromiko took the line that the whole is greater than any of its parts, and therefore general disarmament should come first. Our delegation, however, wanted to take first things first and considered the atom problem number one. So here was a first-class procedural debate that might delay progress indefinitely. The issue is between the United States and Russia, but the lesser powers have been trying to find an acceptable compromise. The compromise is that the Council will consider both general disarmament and the atomic control resolution alongside each other. But here is another snag. We want to make sure that the first will not overlap or interfere with the second. In other words, we don't want to take a chance of a disarmament agreement coming into force, inspection and all, before we have secured completely watertight safeguards against any possible future use of atomic weapons by anybody. Obviously, any general inspection system at this stage could reveal vital secrets here, and not much anywhere else. So. We want to have it in writing that any disarmament commission that may be set up will be forbidden to concern itself with atomic energy control. That was the subject of the special committee which reached a complete deadlock on Friday. But what is really behind this terrific struggle over mere procedure? It's only natural that we, having the atomic bomb, want to settle the question of control on our terms while we still have it alone and therefore have the whip hand. The Baruch plan provides for the liquidation of our monopoly by degrees. We will permit no inspection, give up no technical information, turn over no plants to the international authority, destroy no stockpiles until our proposed machinery of inspection and punishment is actually functioning, unimpeded by the veto power. It is equally clear that the Russians will not give up their precious veto so long as they can always be outvoted, and so long as we exercise overwhelming influence by the very fact of having atomic energy at our command. We are today the most powerful nation in the world, and all but a small group of countries living in the shadow of Soviet Russia look to us for protection in a world where collective security is still only a dream. But it is we, the torchbearers of peace and democracy, to whom the world at large looks for leadership in disarmament. So once again, as in the case of the peace treaties, we are the nation that is in a hurry to get results, while the Russians, in all probability, are most likely to benefit by delay. 
There is no doubt that atomic research is going on in Russia as well as elsewhere. And the scientists tell us there is in fact no such thing as an atomic secret. Within anywhere from three to ten years, the Russians might be in possession of atomic bombs or something equally terrible. General Leslie R. Groves, who headed up the Manhattan Project, said the other day that if he were to make a guess, he would say five years. Once those hypothetical five years are up, the Russians might argue, they can settle the issue on equal terms with us. In the meantime, the real difficulty is lack of trust. They don't altogether trust us, and we don't trust them. At least, many of our less responsible public men have said so on many occasions. The Russians point to the history of Allied intervention in Bolshevik times, and to the long record of non-recognition and open Western hostility leading up to Munich and the Nazi-Soviet pact. We, for our part, continue to harp on ideological and physical Soviet penetration since VE Day. There have been plenty of journalistic attacks on both sides, and that hasn't improved the atmosphere. But no single factor has poisoned the atmosphere more directly than our monopoly of the atomic bomb, the fact that we have actually demonstrated its monstrous destructive power, that we have continued to experiment with it, and are accumulating stockpiles of bombs, while the whole world is agreed that the bomb must be outlawed if civilization is to survive. So, however difficult the task, we are morally bound to arrive at a compromise that will take us out of the present impasse. The abortive attempt at disarmament in the 20s and 30s was followed by an armament race, followed by a devastating war. A similar failure in controlling atomic weapons would almost certainly result in an atomic armaments race. But there is one tremendous difference in the previous armaments races and an atomic one. In previous wars, the industrially stronger powers won out in the long run. In the atomic war, according to the scientists, there would be no long run. The race would be not necessary to the strongest, but only to the swiftest in making the initial attack. For atomic power aims at the sources of all power, the industrial and population centers. And in this respect, the highly urbanized and industrialized nation is the most vulnerable. The race, in fact, would begin not merely with the production and stockpiling of bombs and the perfecting of fast methods of delivery. It would also begin with the dispersal of industries. In this, the Soviet Union would have the advantage, since it is still in the early stages of development and still has vast open spaces. In fact, Russian industry is being dispersed as it grows. This is what Professor Yuri said in a recent foreign policy report. The existing situation with respect to the atomic bomb must of necessity change in a comparatively short time. The proposals that must be made to avoid destruction by the atomic bomb involve important changes in the organization of human society. And those changes must be brought about in a few years if World War No. 3 is to be avoided and if atomic bombs are not to be used in another conflict. There is no adequate defense against atomic bombs made in large numbers and delivered by the variety of methods now available. The day after the Hiroshima bomb, President Truman declared that the bomb was the most revolutionary weapon ever known to man and steps should be taken to protect mankind from its further use. Those steps are presumably being taken. But today, 18 months later, we are still far from positive results. Yet, says Mr. Austin, our chief delegate, we are nearer to real security and disarmament than we have ever been before. Hope he's right. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searchinger with the story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the American Historical Association presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. Tomorrow, while the Big Four meet in Moscow, the Washington spotlight will be on Greece. <clears throat> At a special gathering of congressional leaders, President Truman 
will outline our government's program for bolstering that country's economy. To point up the emergency character of this program, the President has cancelled his Caribbean trip and his attendance at the Navy's maneuvers. The emergency arose as the result of a warning by the British that they could no longer carry alone the burden of propping up the Greek and Turkish governments and guarding the security of the Eastern Mediterranean. The initial amount required is said to be $250 million. Naturally, this comes at a very inopportune time for the Congressional majority, which is trying to trim the budget and bring down taxes with an eye to next year's elections, especially after the $350 million already demanded for European relief. The President may have to send a special message to Congress or even appeal to the country direct. The appeal would be on compassionate grounds. But what it involves for us is a power political venture, possibly historic, in a new sphere, the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Hitherto, that region has been considered a British imperial concern. Now it appears we are likely to become partners with Britain, which still provides the actual manpower on the spot. <clears throat> Some congressmen have balked at the idea. Why, asked one of them angrily, and I quote, should we pull Britain's fat out of the fire? But this was an oversimplification, to say the least. The Greek situation is our baby as much as Britain's. As Mr. Cyrus L. Salisbury writes in the New York Times, our obligation to Greece goes back to the Casablanca Conference in January 1943. <clears throat> At that conference, the control over the conduct of Allied and political strategy in the Eastern Mediterranean was assigned to the British, but obviously as part of the grand strategy of the Allied war against the Axis. Greece, from the very first, had been regarded as a vital outpost of the Allies, and the British, you will remember, had sent a force into Greece in the spring of 1941, which tried to stem the Nazi tide at Thermopylae. By so doing, they had jeopardized their position in North Africa, and in consequence, had had to retreat into Egypt before Rommel's Africa Corps. The loss of the British foothold in Greece was a terrible blow to the Allies. It meant Nazi control of the Aegean Sea and the virtual blockade of the Dardanelles. And that made it impossible later on to send supplies to the Russian armies in the Ukraine. Well, times have changed, and our concern over Greece has taken a different slant. In the spring of 1944, the Soviet armies overran most of the Balkans. All Balkan countries but Greece came under Soviet influence. What Churchill had feared when he proposed that the Allies invade the continent via the Balkans had come to pass. That proposal, incidentally, was opposed by us. But in May 1944, Churchill and Stalin agreed on a separation of occupation, occupation spheres. Romania and Bulgaria were left to the Russians. Greece was assigned to the British. Yugoslavia was to be 50-50, but that didn't work out. Well, the British have been in Greece ever since, much to the chagrin, by the way, of American liberals. The liberal line was that the British were in Greece in order to support the discredited monarchy and in order to preserve their domination over, of the eastern Mediterranean, a key to British power in the Middle East. Unfortunately, the more recent course of events in Greece seemed to bear out this theory. The British were committed to George II, the exiled king. They were against the rising leftist movement, which derived its moral prestige from its heroic underground resistance and its part in the liberation. This movement, the EAM, was by no means all communist. At one time, it comprised the vast majority of all patriotic Greeks. But the issue was more sharply joined after the British troops moved in and supported the government, which the left wing regarded as reactionary. <clears throat> there was a short, sharp civil war beginning with the so-called Athens Massacre in December 1944. This led to a truce and to an agreement that the king should not return until the people had voted for him in a plebiscite. As you know, the king has since won the plebiscite and has returned from exile as he did once before. The rest is recent history, but too confused to be easily remembered. The upshot of it is that civil strife has not ceased and that armed bands of the people's army, the Elas, have continued their guerrilla warfare in various parts of Greece, especially in the north. 
Today, those armed bands in the north are getting support and training from the Yugoslav, Albanian, and Bulgarian partisans across the border. At the same time, these three Balkan countries, now satellites of Russia, have advanced border claims against Greece. Behind these claims is the power of Soviet Russia, which desires an outlet for her satellites on the Aegean Sea, the very sea which the Nazis dominated during the war. It is obvious that Greece has become an object of power politics. But it's important for us to realize that we are as much concerned in this as the British. We are therefore not merely pulling Britain's fat or chestnuts out of the fire. Just as in the case of Palestine, we are not willing to have the British move out because of what is involved. Strategically, Greece and the Greek islands control the eastern entrance, the entrance to the Dardanelles, which Russia wants to protect, and the sea approaches to the Middle East, with its vast resources in oil. <clears throat> so important has Greece become to us that as early as 1942, according to Mr. Salzburg, our ambassador to Greece, Lincoln McVeigh, <clears throat> wanted an American commander to head an Anglo-American force for the liberation of Greece. It was Mr. McVeigh, too, who thought up the idea of sending our Pacific fleet through the Mediterranean on its way home. We did, in fact, send a flotilla including the battleship Missouri and the aircraft carrier Franklin D. Roosevelt to make courtesy calls all the way from the Red Sea to Istanbul and Athens. By so doing, says Mr. Salzberger, we served notice on Russia that, quote, we were setting up a great power frontier along the northern borders of Iran, Turkey, and Greece. United States diplomacy supported these countries' governments and the Russian-sponsored Azerbaijan regime in northern Iran collapsed under the weight of this counterbalance, end of quote. But actually, Britain was still holding the bag in the whole area. lend lease to Turkey was cleared through the British, they trained the Turkish Air Force, and the British troops remained in Greece. Well, today, the British themselves are financially unable to bear that burden alone. But what about Greece? For the Greeks, the war lasted almost as long as for the British. And Greece is a poor country with no mineral resources and only 15% of its land arable. Now, the Greeks have probably suffered more than any single nation from the war, its devastation, and starvation. And war was followed by internal violence, excesses on the left, and persecution from the right. Even a freely accepted and efficient government could not have restored order and solvency without massive outside help. The successive Greek governments have been inept inefficient and even corrupt. The civil service has been purged of all leftist sympathizers and thousands have been arrested and deported to the islands as political prisoners. This is one reason why tax collections are slow and few people subscribe to the government loans. Inflation is rife and black markets rampant. <coughs> Rationing has failed because there is no confidence in the government or in its currency. So, to the British, it must have seemed as though they were pouring money into a bottomless trough. Our own government a year ago lent $25 million to Greece with a warning that the Greeks must put their financial house in order if they want more. Since then, the border guerrillas have increased their activities in the north. Last fall, Premier Tsaldaris arrived in this country to appeal to the United Nations to stop this state of undeclared war and to help Greece in her tragic situation. A United Nations Commission was sent to Greece and is now extracting an endless string of testimony. <clears throat> At the same time, we have sent an economic mission headed by Paul Porter, who has succeeded thus far in getting the number of Greek ministries reduced from 43 to 15. Greek government since the king's return have been 100% royalist, extreme rightist, and ineffectual. Half-hearted attempts to bring in the opposition have finally resulted in the coalition government headed by a non-party royalist, Demetrius Maximus, whom time characterizes as a frail, ailing ex-banker. The new government has promised to review the case of the untried political prisoners and has actually begun by re releasing the women and children. The Greeks whose ancestors laid the foundations of democracy have certainly not been giving a fair example of it in recent months. Nor have the British, who insisted on the restoration of the monarchy, any reason for pride. The Greek government has now appealed directly to the United States.
for material aid, the means of self-support in the future, and the means of restoring tranquility. Will we succeed together where the British alone have failed? In considering that failure, we should not forget that it was Britain above all other countries that helped modern Greece to independence over a century ago. Britain and the other European powers established Greece as nearly as possible in their own image, as a constitutional monarchy with an alien dynasty. Today, that form of semi-democracy is played out in Europe. Today, the European countries, ruined by war, are struggling to restore an economy on modern lines to achieve economic security with personal freedom if possible, but security first of all. The challenge to the United States, says the New York Tribune, is the task of making free enterprise democracy possible in Greece by giving the country a viable basis on which to stand and from which to supply the human needs of its people. But, the paper continues, this is not a question of either 19th century romantic imperialism nor of a mere altruistic rescue expedition. Greece is one of the decisive points at which the future shape of the world will be determined. Whether or not we can find the confidence and energy to export our freedoms, our skills, our productive power, as Britain once did, will largely determine the next phase in world history and will certainly determine the fate of our own system. The Greek crisis is admittedly only a beginning, but if we lack the courage and the foresight even to make the beginning, then the end for ourselves will be easily predictable. Strength is given in this world to be used, hoarded, it evaporates. Now, I'm quoting this not as my own opinion, but to show the direction of conservative opinion in American today. America, <clears throat> at least the part of conservative opinion that is anti-isolationist. Some might consider it an invitation to imperialism, but to others it would be just plain political realism. It is now certain that the British are no longer able or willing to carry the burden of empire and world order that they have carried in the past. Americans are now realizing that we, too, have been beneficiaries of her imperialism and that wherever Britain relaxes her hold, this burden will be either shifted to our shoulders or the slack will be taken up somewhere else. This is a decisive moment in world history. The decision must eventually be made by the American people, and the decision inevitably will be made on ideological grounds. For today, there are two economic systems contending for worldwide acceptance. Meantime, we are learning, like the British before us, that power cannot be exercised without responsibility, nor can it be exercised without sacrifice. That's something to remember when you fill out your income tax returns this week. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, have presented Caesar Searchinger. Next week at this time, Mr. Searchinger will be back with another story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the national broadcasting company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchingham. Good evening, everybody. For the past two weeks, the people of this country have been entertained, thrilled, and sometimes disturbed by an all-star performance in the nation's capital. A parade of movie stars, movie writers, and directors of worldwide reputation have appeared in the role of humble witnesses before the Congressional Committee on Un-American Activities, headed by Representative J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey, worthy successor to Martin L. Dye. For one whole week, the so-called committee witnesses have spread rumor and hearsay accusations against Hollywood colleagues under cover of complete congressional immunity. They damaged their reputations, tarnished the good names, impugned the morals of people who depend on these social assets for their living, to an extent not to be measured in dollars. For another week, so-called hostile witnesses have been grilled by examiners, and examiners to discover their political complexions, party memberships, and personal associations, presumably in an attempt to uncover a sinister conspiracy to overthrow our form of government by subtle propaganda in our films. 
nothing was actually proved. But several screenwriters, accused of membership in the Communist Party, firmly refused to answer to the crime of being communists, and are therefore to be cited for contempt of Congress, a measure which may involve imprisonment in a federal jail. Now, no one has denied the right of Congress to investigate anything and everything, and even the right of certain congressmen to bathe in the reflected glamour and popularity of movie stars. But many eminent persons have questioned the motives behind these investigations and denounced the method of conducting them. Is it really within the power of Congress to assume judicial functions without providing the citizen with the judicial safeguards guaranteed him under due process of law? Is it within the power of a committee to compel or coerce a citizen publicly to reveal his political beliefs under a constitution which guarantees everyone freedom of conscience, opinion, and speech? The answer, it seems to me, has been given a few days ago in a most timely and important document entitled To Secure These Rights, a phrase from the Declaration of Independence, which says, among other things, that a state of near hysteria now threatens to inhibit the freedom of genuine Democrats. This document is the report of the President's Committee on Civil Rights, a body of 15 prominent citizens, headed by Charles E. Wilson, President of the General Electric Company. It has worked on this question of civil rights for nearly a year to see what should be done about enlarging and securing them at this time. The answer is plenty. For while admitting the genuine advances that have been made in protecting civil rights, the committee shows how far short we have fallen in securing the safety of the person, the right to citizenship and its privileges, and the right of equality of opportunity. In this report, for one dollar paid to the government printing office, you may read how many, how many people are disfranchised, how many people are lynched, and otherwise maltreated, how people are discriminated against on account of race, creed, and national origin, in education, in health services, in opportunities for jobs, etc. Facts and figures that will surprise you and shock you if you really care about our democracy. The committee makes some very interesting recommendations, both for legislation and for administrative reform. First, to strengthen our machinery for the protection of civil rights, both in the nation and the several states. We now rely almost entirely on an overworked FBI for the enforcement of our personal rights. Second, to strengthen the right to safety and security of the person, for instance, laws against police brutality, and to prevent such cruelties as our wartime evacuation of Japanese Americans from the coast. Third, to strengthen our citizenship rights, the right of all people to vote, irrespective of race, color, or national origin, including Negroes in the South, Indians in New Mexico and Arizona, and uh, the unfortunate people, white or colored, who have to live in the District of Columbia. Fourth, to strengthen the right to freedom of conscience and expression. Now, for this, the committee has two specific remedies. One, it wants Congress to force all groups that aim to influence public opinion to come out into the open by registering who they are, what they profess to do, and where their money comes from. And two, it wants Congress and the government to clarify the loyalty obligations of federal employees, to establish standards and procedures that preserve the civil rights of these workers, in other words, to use a fair method or due process of determining a person's loyalty. This means the observation of proper rules of evidence, the right to representation by counsel, to subpoena witnesses and documents and time and opportunity to appeal. These rules, mind you, are not observed either in the current congressional investigations of alleged un-Americanism or in the loyalty checks carried out by the government in which an employee can be deprived of his livelihood without even knowing the nature of the charge or being given an opportunity to clear himself. And finally, the committee recommends measures to strengthen the right to equality of opportunity in our democracy, namely by the abolition of all segregation based on race, color, or creed, by prohibiting all forms of discrimination in private employment, in education, in housing covenants, in health services, and in public services generally, especially in the District of Columbia, where Congress controls all civic affairs. Now, this is a large order and a very important one. 
It requires, first of all, the cooperation of Congress, a cooperation for which recent history does not hold out much hope. For instance, the committee calls for the enactment of an anti-lynching law. Four such laws have been passed by the House, and three were killed in the Senate. A similar fate is likely to overtake the fourth. The committee also calls for the passage of a permanent Fair Employment Practices Act. Well, just such an act, sponsored by the administration, failed of passage in either house. Further, the committee wants Congress to tighten up laws directed against police brutality and related crimes, to enact new criminal statutes, <clears throat> to prevent involuntary servitude, forced labor. It wants Congress to protect people, this means colored people, in their right to vote at all federal primaries and elections. It wants Congress to end all discrimination and segregation in the armed services, in all interstate transportation, in other words, federally outlaw Jim Crow, and in all publicly owned or supported institutions and places where the government has jurisdiction, as in the District of Columbia. <coughs> More than that, the committee wants Congress to set up a joint standing committee on civil rights and cooperate in creating a civil rights division in the Department of Justice with regional offices in eight cities and a civil rights division in the FBI. And finally, it recommends civil rights legislation on the part of the several states in matters where the federal government has no jurisdiction. Now, all this sounds pretty formidable, and there is little doubt that such a program will run into difficulties, not only with Congress, but with certain states. The whole complex of questions like states' rights, local autonomy, white supremacy, etc., is sure to be raised. In fact, not much is likely to be accomplished unless the people as a whole, you and me, get behind this historic effort for more human rights, for a greater realization of our heritage of democracy, for another great step on the road to freedom. That is why the committee concludes its remarkable report with a plea for a long-term campaign to educate the American people to a full knowledge of their civil rights and to enlist their full support. Of course, many people are very hazy in their minds about these liberties of ours. Most of them are satisfied to accept the notion that we have a free country and let it do that. And a free country, to many, is a place where you can do as you like. That concept of America is a relic of pioneer days, an idea that inspired millions of immigrants to seek the freedom and opportunity they lacked in the land of their birth. Actually, however, democracy in this country, as elsewhere, is a thing of slow and sometimes painful growth. Independence from England did not automatically give us these personal rights that Jefferson declared to be natural and inalienable. They were fought for in the course of a revolution that took the double form of a war against England and a struggle against political and social inequalities within the colonies, even after they became states. The United States Constitution, as adopted by the Founding Fathers in 1787, said very little about personal rights. It was the states, or rather the people of the states, that forced the passage of the first ten amendments known as the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights specifically forbids the abridgment of certain rights by Congress and the federal government, of which the original 13 states were rather afraid. But the guardianship of these personal rights and liberties was left to the individual states. It was not until the Civil War that curbs were placed on state governments with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which gave the Negro his freedom, his citizenship, and his right to vote. That was the culmination of the second period of struggle for the extension of our democracy, a kind of second revolution, with the Jacksonian Democrats and then the abolitionists carrying the torch. But even the 15th Amendment left the manner of voting and the question of eligibility largely to the states. As a result, many Negroes and poor whites have long been unable to vote and still are today. And there is as yet no adequate method to prevent other forms of discrimination, economic and social. There still is a wide gap between our democratic ideals and our performance. We learned that even an equitable franchise is not enough to secure the rights for all. 
For as the report says, a democratic majority left unrestrained can be as ruthless and tyrannical as the absolute monarchs of old. So today we have reached yet another moment in our history when our civil rights need to be reviewed. <clears throat> Why particularly now? For one thing, our concept of liberty has broadened. It is no longer enough to have freedom of speech and opinion in the abstract. In a modern state, the problem is how they are to be used and made available to all. The right to freedom of conscience has received a new significance in this ideologically divided world where men's political beliefs are often supposed to impair their loyalty to the state. Today, too, economic security has come to be as important as security of the person. In fact, it is more often in jeopardy. If discrimination goes unchecked, the livelihood of millions is placed in doubt. And here is another reason why we must act now. Now, as in every world crisis, the rights of individuals are invaded by the state. We had the Alien and Sedition Laws at the end of the 18th century, the Espionage Act during the First World War. We had what Jefferson called a Federalist Reign of Terror against Democrats and Jacobins during the French Revolution. And we had the incredible Red Scare in the early years of the Russian Revolution, with its Palmer raids and its alien deportations. And today, we have an anti-communist hysteria that takes the form of witch hunts in government offices, labor unions, and even in Hollywood. But today, there is a new circumstance. In World War II, as never before, our own democracy was menaced. At any rate, Americans were aroused to the danger of fascism and Nazism and told how it could happen here. Today, our own democracy is, as it were, internationally on trial for the first time. It is threatened by an ideology claiming to be better more democratic than ours, while ours is called a tyranny of the many by the wealthy few. But, whatever the merits of that argument, the basic principle of our kind of democracy is individual freedom, while Russian communism exhausts the virtue of the state. The rights and the dignity of the individual citizen have always been sacred with us, and they must be re-emphasized and vindicated today. They must be made secure from attack both from without and from within. The President's Committee has done a splendid service in reminding us of our danger and our opportunity. Good night. You have just heard Caesar Sertinger with the story behind the headlines. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.